Hi, my name is Suzanne Long, and I'm Chief Sustainability and Transformation Officer at Albertsons Companies. As one of the nation's largest food and drug retailers, we focus every day on bringing people together around the joys of food. But for millions of Americans who suffer from food and nutrition insecurity, just having access to that food brings joy. And that's why we've made hunger a key part of our recipe for change. Whether we're providing millions of meals through our store's food rescue program, or ensuring everyone has a seat at the table through our Foundation's Nourishing Neighbors program, or we're providing SPARK grants to local nonprofits to help break the cycle of hunger, we work hard to support those in need and the communities we serve. We committed to the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, not only to expand and amplify the work we're doing, but to ensure we're a part of the national strategy to make significant change. We are so honored to be a part of it. Hi, I'm Trooper Sanders, CEO of Benefits Data Trust. Every day, millions of college students across the country are focused on their next meal instead of their next exam. As part of the White House strategy, BDT created a toolkit helping college campuses use the data they already have to identify hungry students and help them connect to food assistance. When students can get the help that they are eligible for to eat, they can focus on their studies and getting ahead in life. Children's Health Watch aims to achieve health equity for young children and their families by advancing research to transform policy. We committed to conducting three new studies now underway focused on alleviating food insecurity. They include examining national policy implications of an unconditional cash transfer multi-center randomized controlled trial, a food justice and systems alignment initiative with healthcare, community organization, and parent partners, and an employer-based food security and economic mobility pilot. We're proud to do our part toward the Biden and Harris administration's goal of ending hunger by 2030. Learn more at childrenshealthwatch.org. American College of Lifestyle Medicine clinician members prescribe food as medicine because we know that the leading cause of disease is what people are and are not eating. This is why ACLM made a more than $24 million commitment in support of the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, with part of this being 100,000 complimentary registrations for our 5.5-hour CME-accredited Lifestyle Medicine and Food as Medicine Essentials online course. Clinicians can learn more at lifestylemedicine.org forward slash WH conference. Hi, I'm Kim Norton, Mayor of the City of Rochester, Minnesota, America's City for Health. We participate in partnerships that keep our residents active and staying healthy, such as supporting our Channel One food shelf. Activity challenges called Move with the Mayor in partnership with the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention. Working with the Lotus Foundation, we spread the word about the importance of eating a healthy, plant-based diet. We are proud as a city to promote a healthy community as part of the White House National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Hi, I'm David Waters, CEO of Community Servings in Boston, where we provide over a million medically tailored meals annually for people across Massachusetts and Rhode Island. For over 30 years, we've provided nutritionally appropriate meals for people with severe diet-related critical and chronic illnesses. It's humbling to see the MTM intervention we helped pioneer included in the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, and embraced by the healthcare community. That's why we're pledging to provide at least 10 million medically tailored meals to people in our community by 2030. I hope you enjoy the conference. We so appreciate your help. Thank you. As a purpose-led company, Dolt Packaged Foods is on a mission to increase access to sustainable nutrition for 1 billion people. To achieve this goal, we provide hands-on education and Dolt products through the Sunshine for All Cities program to underserved communities in collaboration with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. At our Dole Kids Cooking Camps, we teach children about healthy eating, grocery shopping, and meal prep in collaboration with local chefs. We also partner with the WIC and SNAP programs to ensure that our fruit products reach those who need them most. We're honored to be a part of the White House Conference on Hunger, Health, and Nutrition, partnering with like-minded organizations to tackle food insecurity. 
Thank you to our nation's leaders for striving towards a better future and sunshine for all. I love the concept of Project Dash and what it's doing for the community. Project Dash to me is helping people, it's helping families who are struggling. DoorDash has really allowed the emergency food system to expand in ways that it has never been able to do before. People have said that had it not been for this program, they would have lost their housing or they wouldn't have been able to feed their children. Being able to connect to a program through DoorDash where I could meet the needs of those who need it, why not go out there and do it? The nonprofit Gables Institute is thrilled to champion the White House goal of eradicating diet-related disease. We commit to partner with 100 medical schools with an emphasis on those in underserved areas to deliver the Gaples Institute's award-winning nutrition education course. We look forward to working with the White House on this transformative nutrition education commitment. It will allow clinicians to fully deliver on the promise and the power of food as medicine. Hello there, I'm Emily Ma from Google. I'm so honored to be here today with you for this important summit on empowering eaters in support of the White House National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. We believe that Google has a critical role to play in building more sustainable food systems with information and technology. Alongside Kroger, Feeding America, TechSoup, The Farmling Project, and so many others, we've thoroughly explored what holds us back from recovering billions of pounds of surplus we have in the United States every year and have recently released our open data and communication standards to help everyone communicate more easily about surplus food, to see the food and share it. Through Feeding America Data Commons, we're also enabling anyone interested in combining public data sets to explore patterns in food insecurity with just a few clicks. Finally, Google.org stepped up to support dozens of food banks serving thousands of pantries with a $10 million grant to Feeding America to address technical infrastructure needs. Turns out Wi-Fi is pretty useful for a food pantry. While there's still so much more work to be done, we're so proud of all that we've accomplished along the way and look forward to continuing on this journey with you. Thank you. Hunger Free Oklahoma's Double Up Oklahoma program, or DUO, matches SNAP dollars for fresh produce in low-income, low-access community grocery stores and farmers markets. More than 82,000 SNAP households in Oklahoma have benefited from the program since 2020. With state, federal, and private support, DUO will expand to nearly half of Oklahoma's 77 counties in the next year. DUO is impacting food insecurity and transforming access to healthy food in rural and urban communities across Oklahoma. Hello, my name is Nicolene Hengen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Hunger to Health Collaboratory. To support President Biden's national imperative to end hunger by 2030, the Collaboratory has launched a national prize-making program to highlight innovative work that significantly advances food, nutrition, and health equity. The Collaboratory has committed $1 million over the next five years to this new effort. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this national work to end hunger and improve our collective health. We know that financial security is a determinant of health. Some might even say it's a super determinant. As an organization that truly believes in health, we have to be addressing economic opportunity as an integral part of how we look at health overall. So I firmly believe that um, our health is where our wealth is at, right? If, if we make one wrong decision in our finances, we're looking at years of financial hardship. There's a lot of fear around financial instability. I aged out of foster care at 17, and so I was never taught how to manage my credit, what a credit score meant, none of that. The differences I see in Blake now after financial coaching is she looks happier. So I'm able to manage my CPTSD a whole lot better. Uh, I sleep better. Um, I eat better. I'm able to take care of myself. So it, it, it means everything. We at the Foundation are thrilled to be part of the White House strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. 
Our Community Health Protest Program mobilizes grassroots stakeholders to bring them in a room to address the key social determinants of health in their communities. Paramount to this is food insecurity. The program helps bring together resources that are addressed to meet the needs of the communities that we serve. Thank you. Charlotta Carter here, founder and CEO of Lena AI, a personalized health management system in the fight against hunger and diet-related diseases. With over 40 million type 2 diabetics and over 80 million pre-diabetics and a cost of over 427 billion in healthcare costs, providing access to personalized health options are needed now more than ever. That is what we deliver. We have a proven track record in this space and committed to extending our support to the key initiatives of the Biden-Harris White House National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Together with the White House, we can empower the most vulnerable and ensure no one is left behind in the journey towards better health. Thank you and looking forward to working with all of you. I'm Steve Anderson of the National Association of Chain Drugstores. We're pharmacies, the face of neighborhood health care. On August 14th, we will launch a public education campaign with the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, and the Tufts University Food is Medicine Institute. The goal? Preventing diet-related disease, especially among those with food insecurity and health disparities. We are deeply committed to this vital work. NAN's mission is centered on the community and providing essential health promotion, education, and leadership development to current and future nursing leaders. We are committed to working with the White House and stakeholders to address hunger, nutrition, and health within our communities in order to advance health equity and improve Latino health outcomes across Hello. the country. I'm John Robicher, Chief Executive Officer for the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, or NACDD. I can think of no more important role for public health today than supporting the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. And I'm happy to say that we are focused on all five pillars. We look forward to supporting our nation via a continued commitment to the White House's strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. And to learn more about our work, please visit www.chronicdisease.org. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Nyack from Nyack Farms, and I'm excited to give our update for the National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Nyack Farms is committed to tackling hunger by donating our nutritious sweet corn and green beans to the food banks and pantries throughout Illinois and the Midwest. Last year, we fed over 100,000 people, and this 2023 harvest season, we plan to feed 250,000 people. We hope that our model will motivate small farmers to do the same. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rose Harvey, the Executive Director of New City Parks. We work with small cities to revitalize parks in underserved communities. We join the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health because we believe that parks full of recreation, urban farms, community gardens will provide greater health, greater happiness, more social cohesion, my role here at the farm is to make sure that the farm maintains its GAP certification. The main goal that I have is to get more produce from local farmers to be procured by OU Culinary Services. My name is Nicole Nicoletti, and I am the Vice President of Policy and Food Systems for the Plant-Based Food Association and Institute. As part of the White House's National Strategy on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, we've teamed up with the Environmental Working Group, James Beard Foundation, and other coalition partners to encourage chefs, restaurant owners, and operators to include at least one plant-based option on their dinner menus. We are also working with Green America Soil and Climate Alliance farmers and food companies to promote regional food systems that foster diversity, regenerative practices, and healthy soil. 
We committed to the national strategy because we believe that plant-based foods and diets are an important part of ensuring a healthier, resilient, and inclusive future of food. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Bogosowski, Program Manager for Project Healthy Schools at the University of Michigan. As an organization, we have committed to the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health because we understand the positive impact that healthy nutrition and physical activity has on student health and academic outcomes, which can lead to healthier and more successful futures for students all across the country. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm the founder and CEO of Rethink Food. At the White House conference, we committed to making over 10 million meals over the next five years, around 2 million meals a year. This year so far, we've already hit 2.2 million meals with the support and partnership of New York City. Thank you so much. See you soon. My name is Erin McAleer, and I'm the president and CEO of Project Red, the statewide anti-hunger organization in Massachusetts. Our organization is proud to be implementing many of the recommendations included in the White House strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. From piloting innovative programs to integrate food and nutrition supports into healthcare, to leading on the campaign to make free school meals for all permanent in Massachusetts. Project Red brings together experts with lived experience of food insecurity, partners, and policymakers to drive the high impact solutions recommended in the national strategy. Together, we can permanently solve hunger in Massachusetts. A crisp sweet apple, fresh spinach, roasted green chili, and August. Every New Mexican living in frontier to urban communities and within 23 indigenous nations deserve these delicious foods. They enrich health, empower cultural identities, and feed the soul. Roadrunner Food Bank's commitment through our Healthy Foods Express provides nutrition to friends and neighbors with little access. Let us uplift hearts for all to enjoy foods we love. Joan McLaughlin, Sodexo Stop Hunger Foundation. In support of last year's conference, the Sodexo Stop Hunger Foundation committed to awarding $10 million by 2030 to nonprofit community organizations that are helping to end hunger. The foundation is on track for meeting this goal. Last year, we awarded over 2 million in grants to partners, improving food access and affordability, utilizing transformative and sustainable solutions. Also, as part of our commitment, the foundation is co-sponsoring a healthy foods kiosk pilot in Jackson, Mississippi, with Dole, the Partnership for a Healthier America, and the Boys and Girls Club. This program is already expanding to other states with plans to implement these kiosks and the 5,000 plus boys and girls clubs nationwide. As a global leader in food service distribution, Cisco is committed to fighting hunger and nourishing our communities. To do this, we have a global good goal to generate 500 million worth of good in our communities by 2025. This will be achieved through product donations colleague volunteerism and cash contribution to hunger relief organizations. For example, we recently donated $1 million to Feeding America. This commitment aligns with our purpose to connect the world to share food and care for one another and with the White House's strategy on hunger, nutrition and health, which we at Cisco are proud to support. Hi, my name is David Eisenberg. I'm the executive director of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative the Collaborative has been so eager to partner with the White House because, like the White House, we believe that food as medicine can and must be positioned to impact the next generation of educators, researchers, clinicians, and policy experts. Collectively, we can teach everyone to eat, cook, move, and think more healthfully for human health and the health of our planet. On behalf of FMI, the Food Industry Association, I'm pleased to share our industry's commitments for 2023 announced at the White House conference. Our members commit to donating 2 billion meals to food banks and other organizations and investing in initiatives to improve food availability in areas of low food access. And our members commit to reaching 100 million consumers with evidence-based messaging to empower healthy choices along with nutrition incentive programs 
and food as medicine initiatives available in the grocery store. We are steadfast in our progress toward reaching these goals because we want to provide Americans with access to safe, nutritious food. in me and I'm a ma. I'm a tribal elder of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. I'm very thankful for the Wave Foundation and all their efforts. Their words aren't empty with me and my people. They are fulfilling what they say they're gonna do for us and are carrying it out by bringing us traditional foods. We are working to create an equitable, healthy, and resilient food system. Today, the dominant food systems are failing people and the planet, suffering from a heavy environmental footprint along with lack of affordability and accessibility for rural and low-income communities. USDA and food bank programs often subsidize products that have limited nutritional value, are hard to access in remote areas, and bypass the very underserved farmers, ranchers, and fishers that produce food within these communities. Historically, these programs are not tailored to the actual needs of the communities they are intended to serve. During the pandemic, the Wave Foundation developed an innovative food and nutrition relief program in collaboration with rural, tribal, BIPOC government and community-based leaders. Since June of 2020, we have delivered over 7 million meals to rural and tribal communities while resourcing more than 4 million pounds of healthy, sustainable, and culturally relevant foods from historically disadvantaged producers. We desire to sustain and scale this program. As we do, additional communities benefit, underserved food producers advance towards economic prosperity, and we develop more equitable and resilient regional food systems. Food insecurity is a major, major challenge, unfortunately, across the United States. We have a large number of students who are experiencing hunger in order to persist in higher education. We have 44% of our undergrads and 26% of our graduate students. That's 120,000 students across 10 campuses. And we're looking to reduce food insecurity by 50% by 2030. Poverty and hunger have no place in the human experience, and we need to do everything possible to move in that direction. Hello, my name is Christine Blake. I'm an associate professor in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. We at Carolina work to alleviate the burdens of poverty, obesity, and hunger. But much work remains. Sustainable solutions to the health crises plaguing our communities requires equitable access to safe, healthy, and affordable foods. This is one of our top priorities. As such, we at the University of South Carolina are committed to the White House's strategy for hunger, nutrition, and health. Hi, I'm Rob Bisegli with Action for Healthy Kids. We committed to the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health because nothing is more important than ensuring that our kids grow up healthy and ready to succeed in life. Through our work on USDA's Healthy Meals Incentives Initiative, for example, Action for Healthy Kids is issuing $30 million in school subgrants to help them overcome challenges in providing nutritious foods for their students. You can learn more about this critical work at healthymealsincentives.org. Hi, I'm Jeff Clark with the National Restaurant Association. In September, we were proud to participate in the White House Conference by committing to growing our children's program, Kids Live Well, which helps parents and children enjoy better for you meal options when dining out. Restaurants that participate in the voluntary program offer two dietitian approved meals and two dietitian approved sides that meet strict nutrition criteria and offer only water, milk, and juice across their entire kids menu lineup. We look forward to sharing our progress soon. Learn more and join us by visiting kidsofwell.com. Hi, this is Molly Van Lu from the International Fresh Produce Association. We represent the full global fresh produce supply chain and we are honored to be executing three White House industry commitments, one related to research, a uh, second around nutrition education and resources, and a third around working with cities to double their consumption of fruits and vegetables by 2030. It's been a fabulous experience in bringing the industry together around this goal to address diet-related disease and end hunger by 2030, and we hope you'll join us. Hi, I'm Lisa Ratliff, CEO of Kaboom. When Kaboom began working with the Biden-Harris administration to help end hunger and encourage kids to get outside and play, I never imagined the support this effort would receive from the private, nonprofit, and public sector partners that stand with the administration today. Having access to that network of organizations has been one of the many benefits we've received from committing to this work. 
Thank you so much, President Biden, for creating a coalition that will end hunger and increase equitable access to play by 2030. I can the same restaurants who fought tooth and nail for their own survival during the peak of the pandemic stand ready to join you as a driving force behind the policies that support local farmers and suppliers. We know that a strong food supply chain is not only vital to the success of our restaurants, but is also key to securing a better future for generations to come. We are committed to educating diners and consumers gracefully to ensure that they too understand the importance of prioritizing a diet filled with local produce and proteins and sharing with them the knowledge needed to not only find those products, but to cook with them. Our coalition members have an unyielding love for our communities and a fierce determination to create lasting change. We are eager to work with the Biden administration, members of Food Tank, and our broader community to continue advocating for policy change while simultaneously working from the ground up to strengthen the American food supply chain, eradicate hunger, and build a brighter, more sustainable future for communities from coast to coast. According to the CDC, Chronic disease is the leading cause of death and disability and the leading driver of the nation's 4.1 trillion in annual health care costs. Improving patients' health in South Carolina and beyond requires care providers who are skilled in counseling patients about preventing costly and debilitating chronic diseases. The White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition and Health has recognized the urgent need for an increased focus on nutrition and physical activity and medical education. This commitment to lifestyle medicine as a solution to our nation's chronic disease disparity has helped move the needle in the fight to bring awareness on this topic. USC School of Medicine Greenville's Lifestyle Medicine Program actively participated in the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition and Health held last September. The School of Medicine made a 4.8 million in-kind donation to help implement all of its lifestyle medicine programs, including free access to our lifestyle medicine curriculum and Exercises Medicine Greenville Toolkit. Our medical school is the first U.S. medical school to fully incorporate education in nutrition, physical activity, behavior change, and self-care in all four years of the medical school curriculum. Lifestyle medicine, or LMED as it's widely known, weaves fundamental principles focusing on nutrition, exercise, and other health behaviors into the core curriculum of medical education, focusing on preventing chronic but often preventable conditions. Through our partnership with Prisma Health, we introduce students to innovative, evidence-based total health approach to patient care, designed to improve patient clinical outcomes while maximizing their function and well-being. Starting in their first year of medical school, our students are trained to care for themselves as they pass along firsthand knowledge to future patients to strengthen individual, family, and overall community health. We're grateful and excited for our partnership with the White House as we look forward to improving the health of our state and our nation. Thank you. I'm Mark Oshima, co-founder of Aero Farms, and we're committed to supporting the White House's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health because it aligns perfectly with our mission to grow the best plants possible for the betterment of humanity. Aero Farms is a certified bee corporation helping elevate agriculture overall and nourish our communities. From day one, we've been thinking about all the stakeholders from society to the environment to increase access to healthy and delicious food, and we're excited about what we can do collectively to make a big impact. joining us in person and online for this event focused on empowering eaters by improving access and affordability and expanding healthy foods for all. My name is Danny Nierenberg. I am co-founder with Bernie Pollock of Food Tank. 
We are a research and advocacy organization really devoted to storytelling that highlights how food and agriculture can be the solution to some of our most pressing environmental and social challenges. We hope to inspire, motivate, and ultimately activate positive transformation in how we produce and consume food. I am so thrilled to be back in Chicago, like I'm giddy with how great it is to be here. And um, the, this is a city that holds a very special place in my heart and in Food Tank's heart. It's our 10th anniversary this year, and, <laughs> and we, thank you, and we, <laughs> it does deserve a round of applause, it's giving me chills too. Um, we started Food Tank here in Ravenswood, and it, it's really exciting for me to have such a strong connection to the city. This is the city where my parents were born and raised and lived until they were in their 30s. For some reason, they moved south to Missouri and had me. But this is a place that I and Food Tank will always consider home. So thank you all so much for being here. I am I'm so uh, grateful to all of you and a little bit emotional to see all of these great people in the room. And I also want to shout out that, you know, this is a place, Chicago is truly America's food city. So I hope we can give that a round of applause too. Uh, Bernie and I are so excited to be back in Chicago because this is a really important event for us. We are coming together in support of the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. Before I took the stage, you had a, an a, amazing opportunity to see the videos from organizations and individuals all across the country who are working to support the national strategy. And they're doing such great work right now, and I can't wait to see what's ahead for all of those great groups. The White House's leadership to end hunger, improve America's well-being, and reduce health disparities has been truly inspiring and makes me feel very patriotic, and I know Bernie does too. And I want to thank Catherine O'Carr, Kellyanne Blazik, Mo McEntee, and Emma Potter for all of their hard work to advance the White House's mission. They are extraordinary individuals, and I, I hope you get a chance, all of you, to meet them later today because it has been an honor to see them do their work. I also want to thank Farmers Fridge and especially Luke Saunders, Natalie Oxman, and Rachel Rochelle for being incredible partners on today's event. They are hosting us and providing an incredible lunch for everyone here in person today. Please give them a round of applause. They're awesome. And a homegrown Chicago company, it just makes me so happy. I also want to thank our partners at the United Nations Global Compact Local Network Initiative on Sustainable Food and Agriculture Systems, including Food Tank's good, good friend, Mark Kaplan, and New Moostu for their generous support. This initiative, which is led by the UNGC Network Norway in collaboration with the UNGC Network USA and over 30 other country offices around the world, is really extraordinary, and they are particularly focused on supply chain resilience and food security in alignment with the priorities of the U.S. mission to the United Nations and the White House Initiative on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And finally, I just want to thank all of you again for being here. I'm really si excited to see so many familiar uh, faces and people I have admired uh, my whole career, people like Jim Slama, who has been helpful since the beginning of Food Tank, my Shiro, Earthen cousin, who inspires us all, the great urban farming advocate, er, uh, Erica Allen. Uh, food, <laughs> exactly. Erica Allen, please. <laughs> uh, food Tank board members, Carrie McClyman and uh, Regina Anderson, and so many of you have been supporting us for so long. So thank you for that. I need to give you a round of applause. Today, you get to hear from 40 speakers, including policymakers, chefs, business leaders, nonprofit advocates, farmers, food justice warriors, and other stakeholders who are working to improve access to nutritious, affordable, culturally relevant, and delicious food. Before we start, let me just give you a quick rundown of the day. Our conversations will be very, very fast paced and dynamic. If I have to cut panels short, which I'm kind of famous for doing, please forgive me. Uh, it's only meant so that we can have more networking and that everyone gets a chance to speak. 
And if you're in Chicago with us, there'll be plenty of time to continue the conversations uh, over a beverage or delicious food during our breakout sessions. There will also be an office hour with our guests from the White House, and we will share more details about that in a few minutes. And we'll end with a really cool reception. I know Lollapalooza is in Chicago this week. I've been. Our reception is going to be better. So do not leave before you, you get to go to that. And if you have questions during the event or you don't get to meet someone, please email me at danielle at foodtank.com. I'll be checking my, my phone all day, and I'll make sure that you get to be connected to the people you want to talk to most. I also want to make sure that you grab snacks whenever you're hungry, and please step out for bio breaks as you need them, get fresh air, but please come back as quickly as possible because I really don't want you to miss anything. Before um, we uh, get to introduce our first speaker, I want you to also share your favorite moments or something that you know disturbs you or you want to criticize uh, uh, using the hashtag food tank on all of our social media platforms. We will share questions and comments and respond in real time throughout the day. So now we get to get started, and I'm really excited uh, to welcome our first speaker for the day, Kat Okar, the Special Assistant to the President for Community Public Health and Disparities in the White House. Give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> How are you? It's so nice Good. to see you. Good to see you. This is always fun when Kat and I get to share the stage. So. Um, <laughs> I, I want to start with the question that I think you get asked all the time. Why did the White House decide to have this strategy? And why is it particularly important at this moment in time? Sure. Well, just hello, everyone. Uh, it's so good to be here. And thank you to Farmers Bridge. This space is amazing. I was talking to one of their staff uh, team members, and they said they, this is the first time they've had a big event like this. And I think they're crushing it already. They're crushing it. <laughs> so uh, hopefully more events to come. So thank you so much. And thank you to the amazing Food Tank team. You guys are amazing. I, I think everyone in this ro room knows how amazing they are, but they are seriously unparalleled in how amazing they are to work with and how easily they put on events or seemingly put on events because there's so much work in the background. Um, so uh, super excited to be here with you all today. So just for a little bit of context, the last time you know, the White House had a conference and, and kind of a strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health was in 1969, 50 years ago during the Nixon administration. And the reason they had that was because hunger was really a huge problem in the country. It wasn't going away. It was very much on the president's radar. And so now, not only are we still tackling hunger, but we also are tackling diet-related disease. And so if you think about the statistics, one in 10 households are food insecure. Those with children face even higher rates. 40 million Americans don't live near a grocery store, don't have one nearby. But then we also see one in 10 Americans have diabetes. Two thirds are overweight or obese. And we're also seeing those numbers climb in children. So it's not just about adults, it's about kids too. And we're continuing to see those rates of hypertension, obesity, diabetes tick up as well. And so really we were facing these kind of two intersecting and hugely impactful issues at the same time. And so the president was super eager to make sure we were doing something about it, to make sure that these trends don't continue, but that we can actually take action and reverse the trends and make a difference. And so that's really why we put out, why we did the conference last September, why we put out the strategy as well, and why we work to galvanize $8 billion in external commitments and why we are working to galvanize that second batch as well. I think, Kat, what is impressive to me is that it just didn't end with that conference. I think many people sort of expected, okay, we've had this conference, people will do what they will, but you and your colleagues have really continued this commitment. That's got to be very, very hard work. It is, but it's so worth it, and it's, that's why we do the jobs that we're in. And I should, before I kind of talk about some of the progress that we've made, I'm joined by my amazing colleagues, my partners in health, Will McEntee and Kellyanne Blazik. They're floating around here as well, and they're awesome. And we are, we'll all be here to get today, so uh, would love to speak to as many of you as possible. Um, but they are, we are really the ones that are, are leading this work in addition to our federal partners. And so, you know, we can't just have a conference and expect hunger and diet-related disease to be solved. We have to keep our foot on the gas pedal, um, not only from the federal side, but from 
the external side, from the private sector side, the philanthropic side, state, local, territorial governments also have to keep moving because these issues are so complex. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and so that's why we're really trying to keep the momentum going and that's why we love participating in events like this because we can't stop. And we have such, a, such an opportunity here to really make change. I think we often see, and, and I feel like I continually say this, but often when we're talking you know, um, to folks who are somewhat like-minded, so, who are interested in food policy and public health policy, we all get it, but I think it's finally starting to trickle out into the masses and people are starting to understand the impact that hunger has on people's day-to-day -day lives, the impact diet-related disease has on people's day-to-day -day lives, and what that means for us as a country, as a society. And so, again, that's one of the reasons why we can't stop and why we keep pushing from the White House side and hope you all will do the same. Absolutely, and I feel like that's the only bright spot that we're getting from COVID, that we now, there's so much attention uh, placed on diet-related diseases and really figuring out ways to solve them. I'm wondering if you can talk a, a little bit about the pillars in the national sure. strategy. Sure, so we put out, for those of you who have not read it cover to cover, you can, uh, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, um, we were really focused on grounding ourselves in five core pillars in the strategy. So the first was all about improving food access and affordability, which is one of the pillars we're talking about today. As I mentioned, the, the stats on food insecurity, those with, without access, easy access to a grocery store, if people don't have access to food, if people can't afford it, how can we expect them to live healthy and productive lives? How can we expect children to learn in school when they're not getting enough to eat? And so that's kind of the, the focus of pillar one, is how do we improve food access and affordability? The second is really all about integrating nutrition and health. So thinking about our healthcare system, how can we do a better job of integrating nutrition into what happens in our doctor's offices, mm -hmm. um, into what health insurance companies are covering and our, 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 our benefits? And so thinking about how we really make those um, two sectors, almost one, and get them to align and merge in ways that we haven't seen. We're starting to see it little by little as we start seeing food as medicine take off and, and Medicaid programs start to cover nutrition services, but we need so much more. And again, the opportunity is so rich there. The third pillar is all about empowering Americans, empowering adults and children to make the healthy choice. And we often talk about making the healthy choice the easy choice. So how can we set Americans up to be able to make healthier choices? So often, I always think of my dad, who's a type two di diabetic, and he'll go to pick up his diabetes medication, and he'll go into the store, and he'll be surrounded by not great food while he's going to get his diabetes medicine. And it feels like he's almost set up to fail because he's so tempted by all of these foods that will not help his diabetes right. while he's walking to get his diabetes medication. And so how do we think about what retailers, what food companies um, uh, can do to make the healthier choice the easier choice? And then pillar four is all about supporting physical activity. Of course, food plays such a huge role here. But physical activity plays such a huge role here too, and we know the vast majority of Americans don't get enough exercise. Kids don't get enough exercise, and so how can we really make it easier for Americans to get physical activity um, and to be as active as they, they possibly can be um, and want to be? And then the last is all about research. And so we know a lot about nutrition and food, but we don't know everything, and I think we continue to see that, um, that, that research emerge in terms of dietary recommendations, uh, in terms of what, what drives people to eat the way they do. And we know that, again, this isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, that, that depending on where you're from or who you know, you'll have different preferences. And so how can we build that into the research that not only informs federal policy, but how we work to improve Americans' lives as well? It's really exciting to me that you know, all of these different pillows, pillars come together to build momentum for all of us, to empower all of us, whether we're businesses or nonprofit advocates or policymakers. Mm -hmm. And I know you're seeing so much momentum. We showed all of these videos yeah. earlier. And it's, it's really inspiring to me to see all of these different businesses who maybe didn't care about these issues 5, 10, 15 yeah. years ago, who now care about them and are working. I, I, I think very conscientiously, many of them, to do this. Yeah. Are you surprised by that? 
I'm not. I mean, I think um, I'm pleasantly surprised in some ways, but I do think you're right in that COVID shed a light on this mm -hmm. in a way that we weren't expecting. In a way, COVID was terrible in so many ways, but in this context, it was almost a blessing in disguise. I'm not sure if you all were like glued to the TV as much as my family was during COVID, but I remember in the early days how the headlines would be if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, you are at higher risk for severe COVID. And for many of my friends and, and family members, it was like a light bulb right. of, oh my gosh, how do I get better and get better right now? And so I think that shed a light on, on the fact that we were moving in the wrong direction. And so it's been awesome to see so many different players come to the table yeah. and recognize that, you know, and I think from the White House perspective, we're not expecting this to just be doing it for the betterment of the country. But this can be good for business, too. Mm -hmm. I think we know that Americans want healthier choices. They want to make healthier choices in their day-to-day -day lives. And so I think um, it's, been, it's been tremendous to see how many different actors have come in. And we've seen everyone from places like Walgreens to um, S2G Ventures, which is based here in Chicago, and um, uh, Food Systems for the Future, which is sure. Earthrend's uh, entity, um, uh, all the way to you know philanthropy and nonprofits and major retailers um, come in and say they're committing to do um, to doing some of this work and, and making um, the healthier choice the easier choice and, and really focusing on how we can reach our goals of ending hunger and reducing diet-related disease. Yeah, I think Kat, what what convinces me that this can work, that this national strategy can really work, is that businesses, the private sector, are really learning from nonprofits and people who've been on the ground, food justice advocates, they're finally listening. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, and, and so many of you in this room have been doing this work for years, and hopefully you're starting to see some of that pay off. And hopefully you saw some of that work come through in the strategy. I think many of you in this room submitted comments uh, when we were working to, to develop the strategy, so thank you for that. And know that we've literally read every single one of them, um, sometimes twice or three times. And so uh, I think, you know, you are the experts here. I think we have the benefit of learning from you all who are doing the work day in and day out and see how things change in communities. And so we're looking to you all to, to help us, to be part of this journey, um, and, and to show us what more we need to do as well. And you and Will and Kellyanne have been meeting with so many different leaders, especially over the last few days here yeah. in Chicago. How are you connecting them to one another? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So just to, to give you a little bit of background, so we've been working and meeting with folks for the last six months. So in March of this year, we launched uh, the White House Conference to End Hunger and Build Healthy Communities. And we did that to really galvanize the next batch of commitments. We had, as I mentioned, we had $8 billion worth of commitments come in for the conference, which was amazing and, uh, and unprecedented in many ways, but it's not enough. Ending hunger and reducing diet-related disease by 2030 is not that far away and is a huge systemic task. And so if we're really going to make a difference, we need more, and so, and we're also thinking about it from how do we reduce disparities, because we don't wanna make the, the, the world better for some while we continue to leave others behind. We know pers disparities persist in rural communities, uh, communities of color, military communities and families, veterans, and so we're really thinking about how we can, from the federal side, do as much as we can, but this is where many of you all come in as well. And so um, that's really what we're kind of focused on right now. That's why we're meeting with so many people on the outside to understand what's happening, but also to encourage you all to join us, to make a commitment um, that we hope to lift up uh, sometime in the fall, September or October, with a, a, another White House event, not another conference. <laughs> Um, but another White House events where we showcase the next batch of commitments that have come in and really highlight some of the great work um, that is going to help us reach these goals. I mean, what's clear is this can happen without collaboration. Absolutely. And that's what forums like this are about, just making that collaboration happen. I wonder if you were as worried as I am mm -hmm. how the momentum around the national strategy will continue beyond this administration. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why we from the federal side are so focused on the policy end and making sure that we plant those seeds so that they can 
last long into the future, while we're putting out rules to make school meals healthier, while we're putting out rules to reduce sodium in the, schools, or in the food supply, um, while we're, we're conducting studies and, and, and eventually proposing rules to put labels on the front of uh, food and beverage uh, packages. Um, we're trying to really plant those seeds from the policy lens, but that's also why we're asking you all for big, bold, sustainable commitments. Uh, work at the fringes, a, you know, drop in the bucket here and there, a, a donated meal here or there makes a difference, but it doesn't mean it makes a sustainable difference. And so that's really why when you hear us talk, you hear us talking about, we're th thinking of big, bold commitments that will really lead to transformative work, transformation in the food system and the healthcare system um, and in society because that will long outlast this administration. And that's the point. We don't want this to only be a thing while, while the Biden administration is going. This is very much something we consider not only bipartisan but nonpartisan because this is about the health of our communities, about our families. And I think everyone can empathize with having somebody in their family who has diet-related disease mm -hmm. or somebody in their family who has experienced hunger um, or they themselves who have experienced one or both. And so I think we're really trying to make it such that this is not an issue for, for one administration or the next, but for every administration. That is truly transforming government, healthcare, as you said, uh, and our culture, I feel like, in so yeah. many ways. And that takes a lot of effort, again, why we're all here to really get that going. Uh, I, I wonder if you can just talk for a few minutes about the huge effort it, effort it took to get all of these government agencies to work together last year and then continue those efforts. Yeah, so we had, our strategy was across 20 federal agencies and- um, 20. 20, <laughs> and some people don't even realize that there are 20 federal agencies, but there are. And so, uh, you know, because we're thinking about it, we often say a whole of government approach. And I think often people are like, what does that even mean? And it means that if we're going to solve these issues, if we're going to really make a dent in these issues, it's not just the Department of Health and Human Services. It's not just the USDA. We have to think about it from the Department of Defense. What are we offering on our military bases? How are we training our military, um, our military members? How are we, what food options are we giving military families? How are we taking care of our veterans? Um, how are we encouraging transportation to, and, and to be easier for people to access grocery stores? So that's the Department of Transportation. What are we serving in our national park systems? That's the Department of the Interior. Um, what are we, how are we educating our students? What are we, how are we making physical activity more prominent in our schools? And so we're trying to think about it from every single lever that we possibly can from the federal side. And so um, uh, when we talk about a whole of government approach and, and one one of our colleagues, Laura Carroll, who was on our team and is now back at the FDA, is here today, was instrumental in making that happen as well. Um, it is a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of um, uh, recognizing that you speak different languages and trying to figure out what the common language is, which is often kind of the common goal uh, which we are operating from, but it's a lot of, it's not easy because the federal government's pretty huge, um, but it's essential in this work because if, if we're not coordinated, if we're not all rowing in the same direction, um, we're not gonna have as much of a, an impact as, as we need to. Absolutely, so final question before I sure. let you get to meetings and, and yeah. talking to more folks. I, I'm wondering what you're looking most forward to from today. Sure, I think um, talking to many of you uh, and hopefully seeing um, some of you coming in and making commitments. I think, um, you know, when we're thinking about commitments, we're thinking about how can food companies offer healthier options? You know, we're put out the, the um, proposed rules related to making uh, school meals healthier. How can we make sure that there are plentiful options for kids to eat healthier school meals? So that includes how do we make sure that there are healthier um, uh, foods and beverages on the market for schools to purchase and, and, and offer. Um, I think how can we think about, you know, what the retailer environment looks like and, and really transforming that or trying new things. Um, because again, we recognize that it has to be good for business as well. Um, and so I think speaking to all of you and, and, and hopefully getting to to hear some of your interest in coming in and, and potentially making a commitment. Um, but we're 
absolutely eager to, to work with all of you. And for those of you who are tuning in to the live stream, if I think I'm looking at the right camera, mm -hmm. um, we're happy to chat with you as well. And so I would encourage you to go to whitehouse.gov slash hunger health conference. Again, that's whitehouse.gov slash hunger health conference and um, uh, scroll down and you'll see White House Challenge to End Hunger and uh, Build Healthy Communities and fill out an interest form. It's super non-committal. It generates a, a conversation with us and our amazing partner, the CDC Foundation, with whom we're working with on all of these um, to, to see what might be possible to, to refine and to brainstorm um, what a commitment could look like that we can potentially lift up uh, come September or October um, because we need you and, and we really, uh, are hopeful that that um, the Chicago landscape uh, can can step up and, and help us in this effort. Chicago has been stepping up. It's so <laughs> exciting. Kat, I know that this work is difficult but also inspiring, but I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you so much. Well, I so appreciate it, and, and kudos to my colleagues, Kellyanne and Will, because they're my partners in health on this and, and are right here, and you'll, hopefully you'll get to meet them as well. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's a privilege to do it, but we can't do it without all of you. So look forward to talking more, and thank you, Danny, for thank all that you. you guys are doing. Round of applause for Kat, please. Thank you, thank you. I love Kat, she inspires me. Uh, I, I wanna make sure that everyone knows that later this afternoon at 2.30, Kat and her colleagues at the White House, including Will McEntee and Kellyanne Blazik, uh, we'll be holding a special 30-minute drop-in session to answer questions that you all have about your ro role in the, the White House's national strategy and how you can support it. If you would like to speak to them, you can make your way downstairs at 2.30, and a member of the Food Tank team will, will direct you and, and help you, and, or you can find me or Bernie, and we'll, we'll be helpful. So again, that's at 2.30 p.m. Uh, I'm also now excited. I'm going to move to the podium so we can move some chairs, I think, um, to... Welcome our first panel of the afternoon uh, to discuss the food justice movement. And joining us for this conversation, we have Roger Cooley, the executive director of the Chicago Food Policy Action Council, Erica Allen, the co-founder and CEO of Strategic Development and Programs at the Urban Growers Collective, Jamal Cole, the CEO and founder of My Block, My Hood, My City, Lisa Talman, the project executive director of Community Food Navigator, and your amazing moderator, somebody I truly admire, Monica Ang, a reporter for Axos, who is a Food Tank Summit veteran. We couldn't be happier to have her. While they proceed to take the stage, I wanna play a video from US Congress member Chewy Garcia, who represents Illinois' fourth district. Hi, I'm Congressman Jesus Chewy Garcia, representing Illinois' fourth congressional district. Welcome to Chicago. I'd like to thank our event hosts, Catherine Okar and Danielle Nirenberg, for putting this event together. I am an immigrant from Durango, Mexico. I came here when I was nine years old, and I still remember the first American meal at a roadside diner in Texas, a bologna sandwich, my first American meal. I share this childhood memory because food is not only nourishment, it's also a source of strength and a connection to our cultures. Unfortunately, Latino communities are particularly at risk of food insecurity. In 2021, 17% of all Latinos in the U.S. were food insecure, more than double the rate of white households. Language barriers, immigration concerns, and food deserts in our neighborhoods are some of the main factors driving food insecurity among Latinos. One of the reasons I voted against the debt ceiling deal is because it included spending cuts to key nutrition programs that many of our constituents depend on. Republicans are continuing to impose deep cuts to food programs that our communities need most, like SNAP, WIC, or TANF. We must continue pushing back against these cuts, but also cannot lose sight of our goal to expand these vital programs. Congress needs to do its part to protect these key programs. And that's why I'm prioritizing food security in this year's Farm Bill reauthorization. I remain committed to continue working to support accessible, affordable, healthy food options for our working families. Thank you again for the work that you do and for bringing this important discussion to Chicago.
welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm Monica Ang, and we have 30 minutes to talk to these wonderful four people, so let's get this party started. Everybody, please tell me who you are and what you do super briefly. Sure. I'm Roger Cooley with the Chicago Food Policy Action Council. Uh, we focus on prioritizing, uh, bringing food equity and food opportunity across communities in Chicago and the region to bring together community partners from across the city, county, and state. Uh, to advocate for policies and then collaborate on making sure they're implemented for the full benefit of communities. Great. Thanks, Roger. Hi, I'm Erica Allen, and I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Urban Growers Collective. I'm also a partner in Green Era Sustainability and Green, Green Era Educational NFP, and we work on community food systems, um, from growing, distribution, creating access points um, in partnership with, with community and working collectively. We're also really interested in worker co-ops and food waste to energy. Thanks. How y'all doing? My name is Jamal Cole. I'm the founder, CEO of My Block, My Hood, My City. Um, we're a social impact organization in Chicago. Our mission is to take care of people no matter what. Um, if there's a heat wave in Chicago, you'll see us passing out waters and box fans to seniors. If there's a snowstorm in Chicago, we shovel snow for seniors. Um, if a meteor hit Chicago tomorrow, we'd be sweeping up meteor dust. Really, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> We're like the Red Cross for the neighborhood, so it's my block, Muhammad City. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Tallman. I am the executive director of the Community Food Navigator. Our mission is to work to expand food sovereignty in Chicago, um, helping people who produce, grow, distribute food, have control over the food system particularly in black, brown, and indigenous communities. All right, so could each of you tell me, um, you, this is not your first rodeo, you have been working in Chicago for a while. Um, let's talk progress. What are the, what's the biggest and best progress, if any at all, you've seen over the last 10 years in food justice in Chicago? You're laughing, I'm let's laughing. start with you, Erica. Well, I'm laughing because I think one of the biggest um, barriers that you actually, through some of your, um, your writing and journalism, was getting um, urban agriculture written into the code of the city of Chicago. We were at a kind of a, a crossroads where urban ag and, you know, creating spaces where people really have agency and sovereignty to grow food. Like, we're all eaters, if I have land, I should be able to grow food. And it wasn't in our code and it was becoming really restrictive and punitive and challenging to be able to grow food for everybody, for maybe when there's a pandemic, or folks don't have, you know, run out of benefits and need to, need to eat healthy food. We all need this, and it's something that, that needed to happen to be able to create this, what is now a robust, very, very um, diverse and multi-pronged approach around food systems and who's in, in, engaged and involved. When I first started, it, I was maybe one of maybe three people of color in the room. And now it's, it's really a movement that's led by people of color and frontline communities. So we've seen progress on diversity. Big in terms, time. Yeah. yeah. All right, anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the, the theme of this conference is empowering eaters. And I think of myself, you know, I'm an eater. Uh, we're all eaters. And how my own personal habits have changed in the last 10 years. And I think we've seen that in eaters about what they want from the food system and how they're empowering themselves to get it from the food system. You know, as Erica said, things have changed here in Chicago. We, we have more backyard growers, we have more community gardens. Um, Chicago public school systems has 600 community school gardens. And so eaters are empowering themselves, taking agency over the last 10 years about the food system and feeding their families and feeding their neighbors. Great. Jamal, Roger? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm still kind of in pain with seeing all these big businesses leave Chicago, you know, especially in Chatham where I live. Um, you know, it's like a trend with the Walmarts and the Targets. We get so happy when they're coming to the community because they're giving out groceries and, and veggies, right? And then suddenly they feel like the bottom line is more important than the community health. And then, um, you know, people feel abandoned right now. They feel neglected. They feel discarded. Um, there's already 15 currency exchanges in our neighborhoods and no banks. If you ask a kid, what's a job at a bank, they're like, I don't, I don't know, right? There's already no dialysis clinics, no mental health services, a lack of after school programs, and now this, the grocery store just pulls out without any warning. So I'm kind of upset about that. 
Um, so when I think there does need to be more progress made, but um, I just think that um, I'm here as a learner as well. So, but I'm still. So you're not super seeing upset. a ton of progress no. lately, and we'll <laughs> definitely community. get to that. We want to get back to that, Roger. Well, yeah, acknowledging Jamal's reflections on that, you know, that's been a constant issue over the 20 years plus that Eric and I have been doing this collaboration work together in this space, is that there has been a lot of movement in recognizing, um, and particularly. Uh, government officials from the White House to the state to the city government um, acknowledging the city creating the Food Equity Council in the last couple of years to start together community partners and uh, city officials to be able to collaborate and partner on creating new change. Uh, but really recognizing that um, if the language around food still is around um, corporate money and that's in it by their beneficence is how we get resources in these communities. We need to talk much more community and local ownership and control over the means of production, but also extending to retail. Um, there's been a lot of false promises, and um, you know, once the tax breaks have worn away or been used up, then these uh, companies have pulled out. So I think there's an incredible opportunity for the city, county, and again, in partnership with the state and federal resources to make a lot more direct investments, because it's not just um, community assets, but community wealth building in a real much stronger recognition that food, you know, the, why we have a lot of these issues is because of economic disparities, historic massive disparities in the south and west sides of Chicago. And the only way to address any of this is to also build community wealth in any of the solutions that we're proposing. Well, that segues nicely into my next question, which is what, what would you say are the biggest challenges to creating better food justice in the city? I mean, you can't really unpack food justice without addressing structural racism, historic you know, inequities, and how that's netted to this place we are now where we, we talk about food injustice, food deserts, food apartheid, but it's really a result of inequity. You know, we look at our food system and a lot of the wealth that was built in this country and globally, and it was through black and brown bodies. And until we reconcile those things, we're just gonna always be putting band-aids on. And we ultimately aren't the beneficiaries you know, um, unless we have control of those food systems, which is why community food systems, urban, peri, urban, rural, are so key because we're in control of land, we're in control of what we eat and how we trade, how we support each other with mutual aid, which we saw a lot during the pandemic, but also just in general being able to have the time to heal, to decompress from trauma. It is a lot of trauma. We deal with trauma and our gardens become safe spaces, the farms become economic engines where our young people and elders can see themselves in their own future while dodging bullets coming to and fro. Mm -hmm. These are real things that a lot of people don't live those things, right? That's why I, I embraced food deserts even though it's technically problematic because not everybody, definitely Americans, don't realize that not every community has multiple grocery stores multiple farmers markets, multiple sit-down restaurants. We don't think about it. You just grow up thinking this is everywhere and I, I know there's poor people out there, or whatever terminology, but we don't see it. So I think visibility and deep understanding and the, and, and the, the place that greed plays in. We often are in these conversations about food justice and never talk about greed. Because greed. greed is a real thing. There's, there has to be an upper line along with the bottom line. What is that level? where we continue to extract to the point where our planet is burning. So I think that all of these things converge, they're complex. We can't distill it to a couple one-liners. It is really, really hard work. It requires collectivism, cooperation, and real, real um, honesty in a way that I think that, that we haven't been conditioned in capitalism to, to lean into. Major you know, challenges? You know, I'll pig piggyback off of what Eric has said. More individuals of color, more individuals in communities that are food insecure need to be at the table making decisions. Um, their voices need to be valued and heard and seen. And they're not simply, you know, only consumers to large corporations. And 
that what we value in the food system needs to change. And those that have and control the resources need to listen to and value those that are most impacted by food insecurity because those are the ones, that, those individuals are the ones that are gonna have the most creative, innovative solutions, the most lasting solutions because they are in that environment. They are living the environment every day. So those voices need to be heard and seen. Yeah, and I would say that um, if you show kids better, they do better. A lot of kids, they never come downtown. They've never seen Lake Michigan. They've never waited for a taxi. You've They're... recently had your downtown day, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We took a 1,000 kids downtown to expose them to, thank you. It's a, a lot of kids can't afford, I mean, think about it. It costs $44 to go to the top of the Willis Tower and, you know, to be on a sky deck. It costs $18 to go to, you know, to ride the Ferris wheel or the Centennial wheel in pier. It costs $20 to get in most museums. A lot of kids don't got they just never come downtown or never leave their neighborhood. We changed that a little bit with Downtown Day, where we, we gave them $50 to explore downtown and stop at all these places. But I wanted to say, a lot of kids, they're ordering their food through bulletproof glass windows every day, like 10 miles from here. Hey, let me get the Doritos, the, the spicy knot. And then they, they, get the, they get the Doritos and they slide it out to you in a bulletproof glass drawer, like you're an inmate in solitary confinement, right? So like, when I think about you know, food injustice, that has had, imagine if you just got your salad today through a bulletproof glass window. You know what I mean? It does something, to, it is a lot of trauma, and we need to interrupt that trauma. I know me personally, um, I, the first time I ever tasted lasagna was when I broke into a house. Like, I, I remember, like, I probably was like nine or 11 or something like that, and I, I broke in and I saw the lasagna in the refrigerator. I was with my brother, and I, I took a spoon out, and I, I, take, I ate a little piece, and I was like, wow, this is what it tastes like to be rich. I said, this is what it tastes like. I wonder what the people thought when they came home. Like, dang, somebody just broke in my crib to take a piece of lasagna. No, I know that's funny, but, but no, I'm serious. We used to break into people's houses just to get apples and grapes and blueberries. Like, that was like exotic stuff to us. Like, we wasn't going for no jewelry or no TVs. It was like, let's go get this food that we've never seen before, right? It's a real thing. There are students in my program that have never had an apple before. You watch them eat, oh, this is what it tastes like. Come on, man, you ain't never had an apple before? Like it's, it's a serious thing in Chicago, so exposure is key. We gotta take these students outside their comfort zone and expose them to different cultures, different professions, different cuisines, different policies. So I'm, I'm really grateful for this, uh, for this effort. Well, I think some of the bigger challenges still is the, and um, Catherine from the White House described all the siloing across entities and agencies and not thinking about collective capability um, for being able to move forward with this work that it does because of the massive amount of issues and the years and years and years of um, trauma, disinvestment in communities, active disinvestment in communities and exploitation spaces, um, that it's gonna take a huge amount of collaboration, um, which is great to see and hear White House is helping to drive that. We've been really excited about partnerships that have taken place at the state level with the governor, um, the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Stratton, um, even the Department of Agriculture is beginning to take a lead and really highlighting the fact that it's not only white rural farmers who are doing soybeans and corn, but in Illinois there's a lot of opportunities for black, brown, Asian, Hispanic producers to be part of the mix as farm workers can transition to being supplying food for our communities and their own communities. Um, and seeing it as an economic development opportunity and leveraging all the partnerships that are happening at the city level across the different departments and agencies and as well with the county. Um, we were excited to partner with uh, Representative Garcia when he was a commissioner at Cook County to get the Good Food Purchasing Policy passed, which set standards for sustainable, fair worker, and for nutrition guidelines for the food that served at the hospital, the detention facility, but really thinking about opportunities for reinvesting in the neighborhood and community. So we have a lot of um, influential food and policy people out here that you could, and you could influence you know, what they invest in or what they pass. What would you want to tell them? If you had a very, and there are many out here, a very powerful policy person in a room, in an elevator, and you wanted to give them a pitch for something they should really be investing in that could really move the needle in Chicago, what would that be? <laughs> yeah, you go first, please. <laughs> well, I mean, in 
investment, right? So investment and thinking about investing in community, investing in the young person who catches a, you know, a, a passion for, for cuisine or, or farming or engineering or whatever it may be, and removing some of the debt going in. So a lot of us work for not-for-profits. They're actually businesses. The business community sometimes poo-poo's not-for-profits, but we actually do run our businesses. And when we start to move into wealth building, there's a need for the, there's a need for philanthropy to help make that bridge between something that is essential. Like I am not trying to make money from my community who is struggling to get good food. Like the expectation to make that monetizable is kind of insulting and kind of impossible. Is it possible to create avenues for financing and um, forgivable loans and other things that meet ROIs that really dig at these problems and also create bridges for partnership? We need to be in the rooms, we're often not, or it's, we're window dressing. Um, the, our community, you've, you've all heard this a million times, the community knows what it needs, it really does. Having the ability, the access, the bandwidth to go into green energy. I've been working on a project for 15 years. There's many people in this room that I talked to to get financing. It was impossible until it became possible. Now we have a blueprint for how to bring in investment in ways that doesn't put an additional burden on recovering communities. And I want to frame it that way, recovering communities. We're recovering from hundreds of years of, um, of trauma. We're recovering from colonialism. We're recovering from extractive economic systems that don't benefit anybody. And we're seeing it politically. So we're moving the silos between density of population, looking at ways to, to build bridges. You know, folks on this stage, that's all we really do, is we build bridges, we communicate, we create create opportunities for folks to see themselves in their own food reality, in our own environmental built reality. So I just think really strong partnerships where there's a win-win, there's transparency, there's an end to extraction or veneering, um, I think would be really beneficial. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, I, I agree, I think oppression is real. It's a structural part of our country and its history. Uh, it was created intentional, and nowadays it's been cloaked up and trumped up laws and false media, and we don't know how um, injustice is being sustained, really. Um, but I, 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 I really do remember things like my mom giving me a food stamp, my brother a food stamp, and my sister a food stamp, and telling us to spend 10 cents each at the corner store and bring her back $2.70 so she could buy some bleach because you couldn't use food stamps for basic toiletries. So, I mean, I probably would talk to the policymakers about that. I would also say that I remember... Um, you know, eating at homeless shelters growing up and being very embarrassed because my, um, my classmates would be volunteering at the shelters and they'd have the clear gloves on giving you the food. And my dad would say, hold your head up high when you get that food. Don't be embarrassed, just go get your food. But I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed of like living in a motel and eating at a shelter. But the, a lot of the Catholic charities and the shelters in Chicago, they got healthier foods in the schools. They really do, you know? So I think just maybe the policymakers, um, getting at the block level so they can see what's happening with their own eyes, and then they're smart enough to come up with some, um, some solutions. Yeah, I mean, you, what you said, Jamal, about the block level, there is an abundance here in Chicago and in, in, uh, and in other urban agriculture areas. We need to change what we value as a society when it comes around food. Food is essential for all of us, and so food should be people-driven, rather than profit driven and investing in local small scale agricultural endeavors, whether it's a, a farm, whether it's a community garden, whether it's teaching children at the school system about nutrition and farming and work, workforce development programs. There's a role that government, private corporations and philanthropy can play in investing in small-scale solutions that will have large impact. All right, Roger? Yeah, concurring, of course, with many of the things, but I think the investments, um, well, framing food access not as a privilege or as something that you get or you're gonna get what you get and you don't get upset kind of mindset, 
but more that it is a human right and that moving our mindset, even if the US government isn't quite prepared to do that at the UN level, locally we can push for that to be the perspective of how we're gonna address this process moving forward. And while we're doing that again, how are we constantly reinvesting, making community assets available, reinvesting in communities? There's been a lot of documentation that it's a 10 to one gap between commercial investments, between the north side of Chicago and the south side, that it's a $10, $10 are invested in the white communities and $1 invested. So that's gotta be, just to even get that parity, isn't gonna get over the hump of how much disinvestment there's been over the years. So there has to be a very committed, thoughtful approach to how are we gonna collectively, because that's not just gonna be government dollars, that's bank investments, that's corporate investments, that's philanthropic investments, but really making sure that, that it's not just how do we get a project here and there that we can have a ribbon cutting and we're done. How is this gonna be a long-term approach? So all of your comments seem to allude to you know, some big news stories in Chicago, which are the departure of you know, an Aldi on the west side, uh, the Whole Foods in Englewood, and then uh, recently three Walmarts. What, what would you say? And, but then people have said, OK, so then these smaller um, operations have moved in. Is it better to invest in smaller local operations or to lure back these big chains with maybe subsidies or incentives. I mean, I mean, you know, they, some of them were claiming that they were not turning a profit. Should there should there be a government subsidy that would say, "Hey, big chains, come back," or is it better to to invest in smaller local operations? I mean, it it's not it, it's it, it's not one or the other. It's both. I think that the you know a lot of the challenges that the community, especially the activist community, had with let's say the Whole Foods closing. Um, not to pick on Whole Foods, but to pick on Whole Foods. They may be um, a sponsor. <laughs> is that there is a $10 million tip that was given to the, a company that didn't need it to open up a store. And then once the tip expired, the company pulled out. So it's just from a, you can, it can be a loss leader for 10 years. But that becomes an asset in the community that is lost. Whereas the smaller bodega, mom and pop, corner store, that be, that's a local economy, that's circular dollars. And we're talking about moving into climate change and thinking about circular cause and effect. My action impacts the environment, the environment impacts me. It's the same thing with money. Can we subsidize and provide supports to community run and operated, especially co-ops, that are, that, are, that are assets in the community? I'm not gonna get into schools closing, but that was really what that was about. Those were institutions of support. You know, food, shelter, community that people felt and were in control of, had agency. And those grocery stores, those small places where people can come in and people know your name, helps to support and creates safety fabric of connection between people. And it's, it's, there's a lot of money that's exchanged and it needs to stay in our communities. Anybody else want to chime in on? Well, I was um, invited to Bentonville, Arkansas to give a presentation and I could- The, the capital, the, the Walmart uh, headquarters. Yeah. Yep, so I gave up my presentation and then after my presentation, I was having dinner and um, I was actually sitting down next to Bill Walton and Alice Walton and I didn't know it because Bill Walton had a hole in the sweater, right? And he was worth 55 <laughs> billion, right? And then Alice Walton, she was blinged out. But I was explaining to her that, um, you know, my, um, I was saying, hey, you know, um, the Walmart in Chatham, you know, I always put my cart back in the cart corral because I want to do simple things in my neighborhood to make a difference. And she was like, well, explain. I was like, yeah, everybody said, like, what are you doing? It's so cold. Why are you taking the cart all the way back? I'm like, I want to do simple things to build a muscle memory it takes to make a difference in my neighborhood. They looked at me. They were like, what's a cart corral? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. No, they didn't, they didn't do that. But I'm, the point is, I was, just, I was trying to explain to them. I was like, man. I was like, how y'all gonna pull out the neighborhood? You know, we, so we're just trying to get them to invest in nonprofits. Like every month what we've been doing since they left is we've been giving out a thousand meals, right? We partner with Top Box Foods. We want to partner with other people as well, but we give out a thousand meals on 83rd and Chatham every month to, and we feed about 5,000 people. And you know, it costs about 35 bands to do it every month. And we do it because our mission is to take care of people no matter what. But I think if you have the we do need partners in federal government. We do need partners in corporation. We do need partners in local government to help out social impact organizations that are doing the work at the black level. 
I just concur that it, I think making the investments in local enterprises owned partnerships, knowing that that's not going to be the 100% solution, but if we don't make that commitment now, it's that we're going to constantly have the same issue because the economic conditions for these global corporate entities are going to be the same over time. And the opportunity is, you know, starting today, tomorrow to move forward with that. So, Well, I want to thank you lovely people for talking to us today. I wish we could talk more. Thanks. Give it up for Roger, Erica, Jamal, and Lisa. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. You're the best. I love Eric Allen so much. I just want everyone to know. Um, <laughs> that was a fantastic panel. Three things stand out for me. Jamal's motto that we should take care of people no matter what. Round of applause for that, please. <laughs> Second, access to delicious, affordable, healthy food is a human right, and we should all recognize that. And, and third, that communities know what they want and need. What they need is investment and capital. They don't need people who look like me to come in and tell them what to do. Invest in communities, everyone, please. <laughs> now I am excited to turn to our next conversation on public sector partnerships. So please join me in welcoming uh, Food Tank's good friend, Laura Carroll, the senior advisor to the chief of staff of the United States Food and Drug Administration. Ruby Ferguson, the Senior Director of Strategic Relationships and Community Planning for the Sh Greater Chicago Food Depository. Ambassador Earthrin Cousin, oh, I love her too. The CEO and Managing Director of Food Systems for the Future. And your moderator, Brett Chase, an environmental reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times. While they're taking the stage, we have a video to play from U.S. Congress member Nikki Budzinski, who represents Illinois' 13th District. Round of applause, everyone. Hello everyone, I'm Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski and I am proud to represent Central and Southern Illinois communities in the 13th Congressional District. I wanna thank everyone here today for all of the work you do to help Illinois families have access to healthy and affordable food options. In my district and throughout Illinois, too many families struggle to access the nutritious food options they need. That's why, in May, I joined Congressman Jonathan Jackson in urging the United States Department of Agriculture to address the increasing number of food deserts in both rural and urban parts of our state. And as a member of the House Committee on Agriculture, I'll keep working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to improve food access in this year's Farm Bill. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great summit. Now? Okay, there we are. So I'm, I'm Brett Chase, I'm with the Chicago Sun-Times, and I think uh, we were introduced uh, Laura Carroll for FDA, Ruby Ferguson, the city of Chicago and the food depository, and the great Earthrin cousin. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like you just to, just real quick, just tell us who you are and what you do. Hi all, uh, so I am Laura Carroll. Uh, as was said, I'm Senior Advisor to the Chief of Staff at FDA. Uh, FDA is one of those 20 agencies that Kat was talking about earlier today that it was part of the national strategy. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. I'm Ruby Ferguson, um, and yes, my role is confusing. I am an employee of the Food Depository Detail to the Mayor's Office, and I staff Chicago's Food Equity Council. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Earthrin Cousin. I'm was referred to as Ambassador to Cousin because I served as the U.S. Ambassador for Food and Agriculture, representing the United States on all food and agriculture related issues. I also served as the Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program. When I came back home, I started an organization called Food Systems for the Future. And we were initially focused on international building international food systems through creating businesses that could provide access to more nutritious food. And I got called out by a young woman in Chicago who said, that's all good for what you're doing over there. What are you doing to bring food here home? 
to ensure that we have access to affordable, nutritious food in the United States. So we are now launching uh, a Food is Health Fund uh, here in the United States that you'll hear more about in the coming months. So we're here to talk about public-private partnership. And so Rudy, this is a perfect opportunity to tell us what you've been doing. You know, two, it was almost two years ago that you were announced as the first food equity policy lead for the city of Chicago. So, so tell us what, you, you know, what you're doing and what that means. Yeah, um, and actually it's two years today, which is really crazy to be full circle. Um, but in 2020, I think there were eyes on our food system as a country across the world in a way that there hadn't been in a while. These had been issues that had persisted for a long time, but it was an opportunity for food leaders to take a step back and think long term of how can we not continue to react and how can we start to think proactively about transforming Chicago's food system. And so they took existing plans that have already been made for Chicago. I think we've all participated in some form of community planning and then are curious what happens with it after you provide all of that feedback. Um, and walked through different pillars of the food system, which led to the development of Chicago's food equity agenda. So there are five priorities of the food equity agenda. And then two years ago today, I started um, with the bold task of taking that agenda and working with those ad hoc work group members and transforming that into a council with work groups and that are moving those um, priorities with transparency and accountability. So we have four working groups across the food system, one in nutrition programs that's really thinking about how do we connect Chicagoans to those existing federal programs, um, so that way those dollars are going into community. The second is institutional procurement, so thinking about how are we leveraging institutions' dollars that they spend already to support our food system in a way with values that we envision Chicago kind of moving towards. The third is an urban agriculture work group. Um, so that's thinking about how do we reduce barriers for growers here in the city so that way we can produce food more locally. And then the final is supporting BIPOC food businesses with a focus on access to capital. I see people frantically writing, this is all on a website. Do not worry, it's available to you. Um, and I think in the last panel, there was this kind of conversation around community-driven solutions and bringing dollars back to the community. And I think there's a few really important things to elevate, right? A lot of times people um, ask me about this work and think about it as a, like, what are you doing for diabetes? What are you doing for hypertension? Um, and this brilliant woman next to me always grounds me in this, and I'm a dietitian by training. Food is prevention. And food is a fundamental human right, and as a human being, you should have choice, right? So this is not just saying healthy foods only, it is all foods and having equitable access to all foods so you can have the liberty to choose. Um, the other piece is really making sure community is at the center of doing that work. And so an example of that um, is Roger and Erica are examples of some of the colleagues who've been really pushing for a business license for growers here in the city, I think for over 10 years. Um, which way predates me, and recently we were able to work with growers to develop what that business license would look like, and it passed through city council recently. It's a different way of working that centers community voice in that process, where things aren't happening to community, but that they are part of shaping the policy moving forward. So that, that's a little bit of what I'm doing. And, and I'm glad you brought up the community, so maybe just reflect a little bit more about how community is involved and how community was not as involved in the past. You know. Yeah, um, so anybody who has lived in Chicago for a while knows that maybe departments aren't even talking to each other, so there might be different initiatives and in different city departments that aren't working synergistically. Um, and then if you do have like the bat phone and can call someone in, in one of those departments, you can know what's going on. But if you don't have that connectivity, it can be really hard to understand when dollars are coming out the door or other things like that. Um, our working groups, there are over 80 people participating in working groups representing both city departments and sister agencies, but also community organizations. So the idea of having a seat at the table, and obviously it's not perfect, and, and there's a lot more opportunity to include community voice, but there's an opportunity for folks to be a part of shaping policy or providing feedback on things coming down the pipeline, or for me to update, hey, there's a hold up here, it's not gonna go to city council this month, it's going next month in a very transparent way, is a new way of working. Earthrun, any thoughts on what the city is doing, and then, and then take us more broadly about what you know how 
how government and, and private groups can work together. Well, of course I support mm -hmm. Ruby and what the city's doing because I sit on her committee, so uh, her committee for retail food. But I think that what the city of Chicago is doing is looking very clearly not just at the programs and projects that are necessary, but how do we build businesses? How do we build grocery stores that are sustainable and durable in our community that can provide access to nutritious food? When we talk about, you heard the term food deserts, they're not food deserts, there's a lot of food in these communities. They're grocery deserts. They don't have the access to affordable, nutritious food that they can purchase through retail grocers as every other community does. But the challenge of, of food deserts is one that is not just in inner cities, it's in urban areas, it's, on, it's on, in rural areas, it's in the, I, I was just out in North Dakota, when you talk, look at what's happening with Native Americans and their access to grocery retail. So this is a problem across our country that we need a different kind of box. The box that, the traditional retail food box that has, that we're seeing, that we're witnessing close in communities here in Chicago and other parts of, of the country are failing because the, the revenue that they make per square foot does not exceed the cost of operating that store. How do we change that model and build grocery stores that can provide affordable, nutritious food at a price that the consumer can afford, but that also can sustain the grocer and then scale it up and make it viable? But that will require us bringing capital into communities where capital historically has not flowed. And that means that things like, we, it's, and it's not just government capital. We can use government capital and philanthropic capital to catalyze private sector capital and build a capital stack that not just, we, we, I love all the programs that we have, but what if we had businesses that were thriving, that were employing people, that were building wealth in the community? And so, building those enterprises that can then not just provide that support, but also provide that income, and maybe a second store, and a third store, and a fourth store, because it's a model that works. So that's, that's part of what we are hoping to do here in Chicago and in other parts of the country, but it's not just about retail food. We talk about the entire food system. You know there's one black pork processor in the state of Georgia? One. The real money in livestock is in the cuts of beef and selling the pieces and parts, but what, what farmers are required to do because of how our processing system operates is to sell the whole cow because they have no process, no regional and local processing. What if we could automate and scale up black, brown, and women-owned processors across the country? And I've found that one black processor, and he is actually doing direct-to-delivery. And we're looking at direct-to-consumer delivery, and we're looking at how do we invest in him so he can deliver more here in the city of Chicago. So what, what you have is a grocery store in your community where you can buy, you have access to processors across the country who you can buy from. What about storage, logistics? Those companies don't exist. Do you know the food system globally is a $25 trillion a year business? We need to, to yes, we need the programs, but let's scale up the opportunity and business that builds community wealth and and, and opportunity. And those children who haven't seen the city of Chicago, let's give them the hope that they need because they have the access to not just the food, but the economic opportunity that provides for them the ability to see beyond their situation today to a more prosperous tomorrow. Just one follow up to, um you were talking about uh, food is health rather yeah. than food is medicine. Explain that. Yeah. I got carried away, y'all. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what I really wanted to talk to you about today 
is, you, you made me get carried away when you start talking about grocery stores. <laughs> My bad. Uh, you're bad. Um, but seriously, in the United States, we don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. And we're now embracing that system of sick care and, and treating disease by making food as medicine. Yes, food is medicine, that's a great way of doing it, but what about food as health? What about making a food diverse diets affordable and available and building the consumer demand that is necessary for the consumption of adequate amounts of a diverse, healthy diet to avoid the onset of disease? So food is health. And so, it, it, yes, investing in food is medicine, but investing in the pol supporting the policies that are necessary to incentivize consumer demand and to incentivize the investment of capital into the businesses that we've been discussing here that will make food affordable and available to every American wherever you live before the onset of disease. That's food as health. So if you do get a diet-related disease, diabetes or certain forms of cancer or, or uh, hypertension. Yes, food is health. But making sure every child wants and has access to an apple before the onset of diet-related disease. That's food is health. And that's what we should be working towards. That's the difference. It's a, it's a good <clears throat> Well, that's a good pivot to, to Laura and the FDA. Tell us what the FDA is doing. Yeah, happy to. And I think that was a perfect segue in talk, talking about food as health and prevention. Uh, that is certainly one of our priorities. So when people think about food and FDA, they often think about the food safety side. Uh, but we have tons of initiatives going on in the nutrition space as well with regulating over 80% of the food supply, including its labeling. And labeling can have a really big influence in terms of empowering consumers, but also encouraging shifts in the overall healthfulness of the food supply. One of the really nice examples like we like to share is when we require trans fat to be declared on the nutrition facts label in 2006, we saw a nearly 80% reduction in people's intake of trans fat. And that was the combination of industry reformulation, but also consumers shifting their choices. Um, so as you know, the, for the national strategy, FDA has a suite of things that we are doing in the labeling space. Um, and there's one in particular that we're working on with front of pack labeling. Um, I'm guessing most people here know what that is, um, but happy to go into that more. Um, it's really exploded in the use across the world, and there is research that shows that it can really help consumers with identifying healthier foods. You know, as Kat was giving the example earlier about walking down the aisle and seeing just an overwhelming number of choices that front of pack can be quick signals to provide additional context to consumers and complement the nutrition facts label to identify those healthier choices. And there is you know, some evidence that shows that it's particularly beneficial for those with lower nutrition literacy. So it's an opportunity to provide nutrition information in a more equitable way. But I do want to talk a little bit in terms of our work on sodium, which um, most of our sodium intake comes from processed, packaged, and prepared foods, not from your salt shaker. And in 2021, FDA issued voluntary sodium reduction targets to help slowly ratchet down the amount of sodium across the food supply. Again, getting to that piece about just an overall healthier options to all people. And we are working very closely with agencies across the federal government to help support implementation with, of that. USDA and their school meals, the administration of community living and their adult, senior adult nutrition programs. But this also comes back to you know, working with industry and other external partners to make sure that we are successful in those sodium targets and other initiatives that we're working on so that you know, all choices are, are healthier. So I want to return back to Chicago as an example of local government and public-private partnerships. So let's go back 10 years ago this month. Rahm Emanuel said he's going to uh, end 
grocery deserts. He used the word food deserts, but Earthrun has explained there's a difference. So he's, he's going to do this. Um, as we've talked about, the, the panel uh, before us talked about, you know, we got Whole Foods, we got Walmart, they're gone. So there's a rethinking, right? I mean, we, we have to learn from our mistakes of the past, right? Um, so any of you can just jump in and, and, and tell me what, what didn't work and why do you think the, the approach now you know, might work better? Yeah, um, I think this brilliant woman can say a lot more about what didn't work. Um, <laughs> but I think we saw a lot of things tried here in Chicago, right? So healthy corner store initiatives. We saw the example of TIF funds being used. We saw lots of things that worked and didn't work. Um, and the reason why the Food Equity Council is taking a step back to think about the whole food system is because it's not just about grocery stores. It's thinking about creating entire food ecosystems that folks can tap into. So I think when we think about communities where there is equitable food access, people have lots of options. It's restaurants, it's corner stores, it's grocery stores. It's a big chain, it's a small chain, right? Like it's all of these other things. And so you have to really step back and think about how we can shift towards that and not just maybe bringing in one grocery store and into a community and saying, check, that's done. And then I think the last thing I'll add that's important to note it, it, it is a lot of this is a byproduct of historic disinvestment. And so there, there is an economic revitalization that has to come with that too. It's not just a food issue. It's a community level issue. It's a neighborhood investment issue. And I think that goes to the piece around public, public partnerships and not only thinking about what a municipality can do, but what our private investors can do, what philanthropy can do, what local uh, ideas come up from community so that there's a buy-in there. You know, we have 41 million people in the United States who can't afford a diverse diet on a daily basis. And uh, diverse diets don't, you know, we, we, I'm all about indulgent foods. You should have indulgent foods, but not in the center of your plate. And so people should have in their community places where they can purchase diverse foods. Um, and uh, the challenge that we have is creating those places that we've talked about but also driving that consumer demand. Because building a store alone doesn't necessarily change consumer consumption patterns. The affluent in, in the United States only consume about between 20 and 25% more produce than the poor. We have a problem with what we all eat in this country. And so behavior change, consumer demand, awareness must become part of building thriving grocery stores in our communities that will ensure the access to affordable, nutritious food. But without changing behavior, we'll build a store and they'll close because people cherry pick. They buy what's on sale, they buy what they can afford, and again, we're back to those same issues. So it's a holistic answer that is required. And this is where you get in the government as well because I'm not gonna get let FDA and USDA off the hook because we must increase SNAP benefits. And we must increase, we must increase the double up bucks program. We have seen where when you incentivize the purchase of nutritious food, People consume more, surprise, surprise. And so it's a combination of that private investment, that public policy, that private, that as well as public support for a capital stack that can ensure that we move capital in places that have been historically disinvested in, and to entrepreneurs who have been historically left out of the finance picture. That's how we make a difference. Yeah, I can just add on, I mean, um, hold us accountable. <laughs> um, I think you know, we, as the federal government, obviously recognize the need for the holistic approach, and that's really where the heart of the national strategy comes from. But I think that you know, this administration is also very focused on making sure that we are doing more community member engagement. And, sorry, I think my mic is coming in and out. <laughs> we can try switching. Um, so that was one thing that the, you know, the White House did an incredible job of during the build-up to the White House conference and informing the national strategy was making sure that 
they were hearing from community members and individuals who are experiencing hunger and diet-related diseases, and that's something we are very focused on at FDA too, so that we are making sure that the policies that we are developing are going to be effective. And so that's something very much as we go through all the actions that we have in the strategy is that we are making sure that we're talking to community members to get the honest feedback in terms of what we can be doing better. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about an outcome of the White House conference when we talk about private sector engagement. One of the outcomes was, FSF, my organization, worked with S2G to create the Food, Nutrition, Hunger Investors Coalition. We were able to bring 30 investors to committing to catalyzing $3 billion in capital to invest in businesses that can support increased access to nutritious food. And we are now at 35 countries and $3.5 billion on the platform. The goal is to ensure that not only do they invest in businesses that, are, that VC would traditionally invest in, but how do we expand the portfolio of companies that can provide more nutritious access to the communities that we're talking about here today. So keep an eye out, but that would not have happened but for the White House's conference, that we were able to get these CEOs to come to the table and make this commitment. Earthen, you mentioned um, incenting people to eat healthy. Can you give me an example? I mean, how do you do that? Well, the, in, I, I alluded to this uh, one example, uh, and I'll go back to it again, and that is the, the, the Double Up Bucks program. The, um, the program that if for every, if I'm a SNAP beneficiary, for every dollar that I spend on fruits and vegetables, it's matched by another dollar. And uh, USDA did a review of this program in 2014 and found a 26% increase in the consumption of fruits and vegetables as a result of this program. But every year the program runs out of money hmm. because there's not enough money set aside in the budget to support the demand. The other piece that we need is we need to ensure that we are providing those incentives, yes, but information. Most people, and I heard the young man from My Block, My Hood say, when you know better, you do better. Too many of us don't know what a nutritious diet looks like. And so building that demand amongst community is also quite important through education. We're almost out of time. Um, Ruby, real quick, anything coming up? Um, you know, I, I think when we first talked, I asked, any wins, you know, in the, in the last two years in terms of what the city is doing? And, and, and what's, I, I think there's some funding opportunities coming up? Or, um... Yeah, um, so in the Chicago Recovery Plan, we had dollars allocated to food equity. There are two big projects for that. The first one is the Community Growers Program which I'm super excited. A lot of folks in this room have been pushing for it. Um, that's $2 million to go towards local growers here in Chicago. So existing farms and providing kind of funding for capacity building projects, and then to support at least 10 new sites on vacant lots throughout the city. Um, so the first round of awardees were announced, and I think there should be another round of applications coming out soon. And then the other piece that's really exciting and kind of goes back to this investment in community, community-driven solutions, thinking about entrepreneurs and acknowledging that a lot of times people of color have been forgotten or don't have access to capital in a meaningful way, I think we're fine, um, is that there will be an RFP release for a good food fund where we'll be identifying an administrator to um, manage this good food fund that'll support food entrepreneurs and then also identifying food incubators really focusing on early stage entrepreneurs so not accelerators but kind of I have an idea and I don't know how to get it across the finish line and so both of those should be released this month and those will find the administrators and then money should be going to community in 2024. Let me very quickly say it is so important that you have that government capital to catalyze capital stacks so that we can begin to prove that you can make a new, an investment in a business that will deliver impact, a nutrition impact, and a financial return. Then we'll begin to see capital flow. Capital flows where there's success. We need to demonstrate that success. Well, thank you to this great panel, and um, let's, let's give them a round of applause. And um, <laughs> we could go another hour, but you know. <laughs>
A bigger round of applause for these three powerful leaders, please. Thank you. Amazing, amazing panel. Okay. I want to thank all of them. I want to echo what Earthrun said, that we need communities that not only give access to food but, and, and diverse food, but access to hope. Hope is so important when we're having these conversations. I also want to say that before we continue, that food tanks work would not be possible without our grassroots members. Many of you in this room support food tank. Many of you watching online support food tank. We could not have events like these. We could not have uh, original content on foodtank.com. We could not have our podcast or anything else that we do if we did not have grassroots support. So I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart and from Bernie's heart for supporting Food Tank over the years. It does mean the world to us. Um, and as we rethink our food systems and find ways to value what we eat, I'm excited to share that we have 12 copies of the book Perfectly Good Food, a totally achievable zero waste approach to home cooking by chef sisters Irene Lee and Margaret Lee to give away. Irene is an incredible food justice warrior. She's a good friend to me and to Food Tank, and I'm so grateful for her work and so grateful that this book exists. Please give Irene, who is here today, a round of applause. And it's not just me who thinks this book is incredible. It has been called uh, the best new summer cookbook by Food & Wine magazine. That brings tears to my eyes because I'm so proud of, of what she's doing. She was featured in the Washington Post earlier this week. She had a New Yorker cartoon made about her. She is the bomb, and I, I love her. So the first 12 people here in this room and only in this room who join Food Tank as members will receive a, a copy of Perfectly Good Food. So just sign up. I'm going to give you a minute, and I'll stare at you awkwardly while you do it. Um, to take out your phones, go to foodtank.com join, where you can find a membership level, and there are many, that is right for you, and then you can get this awesome book. Um, once you become a member, hold up your phone. Uh, someone from the Food Tank team will, will come and find you and give you the book. But again, I'll just stand here awkwardly while you all do it. I'll, I'll wait until there's at least 12 of you. Please, it's a great book. Don't you need some new recipes? It's really, really good. And Irene is such a great spokesperson. She'll sign it for you. It'll be awesome. Okay, okay you can have a book. Can someone help her from uh, the Food Tank team? Keep your hand raised. Uh, again, I'll just, I can stand here forever. We'll, we can stay here until 9 p.m. Others, come on. It's a great book. I am now very, oh, there's some in the back. This is great. Thank you, everyone. Another round of applause for Irene and this awesome book. Come on, keep the energy going, everyone. Thank you. We now get to turn to part one of the conversation about creating healthier food environments to empower eaters and make it easier for them to access nutritious options. So I'm going to welcome uh, our panelists. Jenis Jessica walks first, the executive chef for Catapanin Kitchen. Luke Saunders, the founder and CEO of Farmer's Fridge, who deserves uh, another round of applause for donating today's space. So please give Luke a round of applause. <laughs> chef Rick Bayless, the owner of Frontera Restaurant Group. Jim Slama, the ma managing director of Naturally Chicago, and our moderator, Jesse Newman, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. While they're taking the stage, we're going to play a video from US Congress member Mike Quigley of Illinois' 5th Congressional District. Thank you. Hi, Mike Quigley here, US representative for Illinois' 5th District, and I want to thank Food Tank, Farmer's Fridge, the UN Global Compact, and the White House for inviting me to share some words today. I'm proud that the Biden-Harris administration has made tackling food insecurity a top priority and that so many individuals and organizations in Illinois are on the ground working every day to end hunger in our communities. Democrats in Congress are equally committed to addressing this crisis. As a member of the House Appropriations Committee, I fight to ensure that nutrition programs like SNAP and WIC are fully funded. I've been lucky to spend time at food pantries in my district and meet with restaurants that provide meals to some of the pantries. 
through my Undercover Congressman series, I've also helped prepare meals for deliveries through Meals on Wheels. These experiences have reinforced the importance of food access and food affordability of our communities. In 2021, 8% of my district was food insecure. I'm determined to bring this number to zero. Ending food insecurity can't be achieved overnight, but I'm confident that these discussions will inspire fresh ideas to make healthy food more accessible and affordable across the country. Thank you. All right, thank you all for joining us. We have about 24 minutes, <laughs> not 30, 24 minutes to cover um, how to, the private sector can be involved in making healthy and culturally relevant food more accessible and more affordable. Um, so it's a lot, a lot to cover. Let's have you each briefly, just very briefly introduce yourselves and tell us what you do. Jessica, why don't you start? Uh, my name is uh, Jessica Walksfirst. I am the executive chef and owner of Kita Pan and Kitchen. We are Chicago's only indigenous catering company, and I am Chicago's only Native American executive chef. Um, and I'm uh, Luke Saunders. I'm the founder and CEO of Farmer's Fridge. So thank you guys for joining us here today. Hi. I, I'm Rick Bayless, and I'm the co-owner of the Frontera Restaurant Group, um, but we also work a lot in terms of local agriculture. Uh, we have a, a not-for-profit, the Frontera Farmer Foundation, that has raised over three and a half million dollars to invest in uh, local farms to make them more profitable and productive, and uh, also work um, a lot with education of uh, young adults on the west side through the impact culinary program that we started. I'm Jim, I'm Jim Salama, I run Naturally Chicago, which is a network that brings together all types of leaders in the natural products industry, investors, uh, emerging brands, uh, retailers, uh, service providers, and with the goal of really making Chicago an epicenter of this booming industry. Okay, so Luke, let's start with you. Farmer's Fridge, your whole mission is to make fresh, healthy food as easily accessible as a candy bar in a vending machine. But as you and I have discussed, that is not an easy proposition. To, that's, not something, that's not easy to do while keeping prices in check and being profitable. Um, so I checked earlier today, and a 400-calorie pesto pasta bowl, I think like what you serve downstairs at the fridge at the Museum of Science and Industry, where I am a huge, uh, huge consumer, um, is about 850. So walk us through what for you are some of the biggest challenges for keeping prices you know, lower for this sort of meal? Um, yeah, so I think for us, um, scale is probably the number one thing. So when I started, not far from here, we were renting a kitchen table by the hour. Today we do have a 100,000 square foot production facility where we make all of the food. Um, but if you compare like how many salads we make to the number of uh, granola bars Kellogg's is gonna make today. It is like orders of magnitude different. Um, and so when we look at like the cost of the food is actually uh, pretty affordable. But then like getting to the market, uh, paying for the overhead, all of those things. I think my, my okay, there it goes. Um, and, and just in general too, the other thing to think through is what's the sticker price versus what's the actual price? And so a, a place like the Museum of Science and Industry where it's a more transient audience, people are kind of in an entertainment mode, they may spend a little bit more, versus if you go to a hospital in the suburbs, you might see prices that are automatically 20% lower, and then you use the app, and you actually get a 25% discount from there, and that's before you get a 10% uh, loyalty credit, um, or like expiring product discount. So we try to have the whole range where someone at the airport might be paying $12, and somebody at a hospital who's coming all the time may only pay five. And to your point about scalability, you and I were talking earlier about how if you can actually get people, get repeat customers through incentivizing them through, you know, deals on the app, then actually that drives, you know, that drives further. Yeah, that's, that's the other like critical components like scale in our ability to buy produce and manufacture all the goods 
Um, but also like at the individual fridge level, volume is really the biggest driver of profitability. So if we're able to get more throughput in the fridge, we can actually charge less. Um, and then some places, like we have a big revenue share to pay. So that's another dynamic where certain locations may ask for as much as 20% of the revenue that we collect and we have to pass that on to consumers. So we're constantly trying to work with our partners to say, hey, if you can lower that fee, we can offer lower prices and things like that. So scaling is key. I think you've got about 500 fridges across the country. We're, I think we'll be about 750 uh, as education comes back online here in September. And then we have another 300 or so uh, retail locations between Costco, Target, Hudson News. Okay, so 750. What do you need to get to 750,000? Uh, I mean, probably like, give me another 10 years. We started <laughs> with one fridge uh, 10 years ago, and, and now we have 1,000 locations. And um, when you do the math on what that looks like, if we just do the same thing we did for the last 10 years, that's about where you get. So, um, yeah, just, just buy some salad and, and tell your friends about it. I okay, guess. so let's, so 10 years, we'll check back. So, so yeah, see where, just see some where of this are. takes time, right? <laughs> we got to hire the drivers and build the machines and uh, buy the lettuce, so. Uh, okay, Jim, you work with a lot of uh, natural fruit brands, which a, des a description that I know for a lot of consumers just translates into, you know, expensive. Um, will natural food brands sort of always be for those with deep pockets, or is there, you know, uh, you know and if not, how does that change? Um, you know, first of all, I want to address the, uh, the costs of non-natural food, and it's huge, whether it be public health issues and the cost for all types of diet-related disease or the externalities associated with pollution, with bad agricultural practices, the unbelievably horrible uh, practices of animal agriculture that are just atrocious, that uh, nobody should be, in my opinion, have to eat those types of products. That's a big deal. In order to change that, we need to Luke's point, scale up natural foods that are produced in a responsible way. And in order to do that, um, we need a lot more people eating it, including people who can't afford it. So, and there's two answers to this question. One is, how do we get folks who don't have enough money to pay for it? And granted, it is more expensive, be in part because of scale and in part because of, you know, just other issues with our agricultural system. So, um, you know, there are programs to help folks who can't afford, uh, you know, more expensive food, and it's double ups, du double bucks programs at farmers markets. It's um, programs where uh, you can get a prescription for produce, which of course is much healthier, and uh, you can get produce at a reduced or uh, no cost. Uh, we just need much more of that support, both from a public sector as well as from a philanthropic sector. On um, the, uh, you know, how do we get natural food less expensive? We need to scale. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that are helping companies to scale. We just launched one called Locally Made, where we're working with emerging brands in Chicago to help them get on the shelves in a lot more supermarkets. And, you know, I'm thrilled. We got Jewel, Mariano's, 7-Eleven, uh, Fresh Time, some others that are coming on board to offer space to emerging brands. That's a big deal because if uh, we do it here in Chicago, naturally Chicago is one of 10 networks across the country. New York, LA, San Francisco, we can take this program across the country into programs and make these types of programs available across the country, but also give these entrepreneurs access to supermarkets across the country as well. And just to pick up on scaling, I think when we talked earlier, you mentioned, I'm curious, what are some of the biggest challenges to scaling that you see with the brands, the smaller brands that you work with? I think you mentioned, you know, just access to capital. Sure, access to capital is a huge one. You know, we've been, I launched the first food financing conferences, I think maybe in America in 2009, you know, Whole Foods is my partner. We've been doing that for a long time. This year we had 10 brands pitching for capital. I think 75 investors were there. And despite the really challenging environment, uh, quite a few of them are getting financed. So that's one thing. We're launching a mentoring program. In fact, I, I pried Rick Bayless's former partner, Greg Keller, off the ski slopes in Utah, who's now working with us half time. 
And he's both leading locally made, but he's also helping us develop this mentoring program. And you know, my guess is by the end of the year, we'll have 75 to 100 mentors working with emerging brands who are really looking to scale up. And you know, and for them, it's like, okay, how do I work with a co-packer? You know, which is not an easy thing. You know, Rick's lucky. He had Jean Marie Bronson, who's a genius at those kind of things, and work with the co-packer to make sure that you know they got a. Rick's recipe to the point where he would actually approve it to go on shelf. Not everybody has that kind of skill, and we're hoping to develop a broad enough network of mentors to really help these entrepreneurs scale up and be more successful. And I think you also mentioned some of the fees that come along with working with a co-manufacturer as well as with distributors and ways that you're sort of helping those small brands, you know, navigate some of those. No um, question. Well, we're fortunate. We've got, you know, the largest natural and organic distributor, Kehi. Uh, is our partner. Their uh, CEO was a co-founder of Natural Chicago. They're all in on this program. They're going to be a big help. But, you know, there's really a whole spectrum of needs that these brands have, and uh, we're going to try our best to get them as much technical assistance as possible to succeed. Okay, so Rick, you have talked a lot in the past about your goal to make restaurant work a viable career path, you know, for, for folks um, and efforts that you've made in your own restaurants to pay a fair wage, to offer benefits, and I think just recently instituted this 20% mandatory service charge on all checks, you know, with that goal in mind. So that all has an impact then on how much you have to charge patrons for, you know, for, for each of your menu items and the size ultimately of guest checks. So how do you think about the trade-offs between charging diners enough to cover those costs um, while keeping prices low enough to attract a diversity of, of, of diners? Well, it's a very interesting thing. We're hearing a lot about scaling here. And when you're talking about consumer packaged goods, then yes, scaling is an amazing thing. In restaurants, we can't really scale. If we're a busy restaurant, we can only fit so many people in the restaurant. And every single person's every dish is made for that person. So it's not like we're making really big batches of something that we're putting in jars and then selling to people on a store shelf. So um, I will say that when we're talking about restaurants, and I'm I, just in exactly the same way that we cannot put all food in the same category, I think we have to talk about the difference between basically processed food and whole foods. Okay, and if we don't make that distinction, then we're comparing apples and oranges when we need to be comparing apples and apples. So we could say, uh, in the whole food sector, it's like going to a restaurant that's making everything from scratch. Then we have to talk about the restaurants where everything is frozen and finished and you know, dehydrated and whatever. But it's basically processed food that you're getting there. We can't compare those two things. So coming out of the pandemic, we were forced to really think differently about everything. We're building a whole new model now, I would say, in the restaurant industry for how to run restaurants and what you can put on your menus, what you can't put on your menus, um, who's going to come, what their expectations are going to be. So it is a whole new world for us in the restaurant world. And I don't think probably for the next three or four years we will really understand it very because we're trying all kinds of new things all the time. So um, our goal was to come out of the pandemic and to offer, um, out, we lost so much of our staff, people that had been with us 30 years. They had to go find other jobs because they couldn't rely on the restaurant industry anymore to pay their mortgage and to pay for their children's education. And so we had to come out and figure out a way that we could create an environment where people could rely on their paychecks. And when we're talking about this, it's the people in the, the front of the house that we're talking about who basically don't work for the restaurant. They work for you, the person sitting at the table, because you're going to be paying their salary. So they have to talk to you in a certain way, deal with you in a certain way so that they can pay their mortgage, okay? And so I don't like that. I feel like that we all need to be working on the same team. And so we came out and we instituted this thing where we pay a living wage, and we're not talking $15 an hour because servers don't make $15 an hour when all is said and done, but um, a wage that they could count on 
um, for whether we're busy or we're, whether we're slow, they're always going to make the same amount of money. And that has worked out really good for us because we were rebuilding a team. And no one, we didn't know if we could promise people that we were gonna be busy. Because there were days in 2021 when we had more employees on staff than we had customers in our restaurant. And so we were trying to build something that was more equitable and that people could really rely on. And so that has been one of our focuses. But when it comes down to what do we charge? <laughs> so people come back to, came back to restaurants slowly. People had actually learned to cook stuff in their own homes. And so it was like we were trying, and a lot of them liked it, you know? A lot of them said, you know, I love baking sourdough bread. I mean, I know that's the, 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 the sort of the whipping horse there that we um, all talked about. But people decided that they, they, there were dishes that they could make, that they could make with real ingredients, and they could make them quickly, and they could enjoy that kind of thing. So they came back to restaurants slowly. But we realized that we also had, we couldn't, they couldn't come back to restaurants and the prices were just astronomical, which would make them go, oh, we won't do that again. We, we know how to cook in our house. And so we had to keep everything um, really low in, in the cost. Now, everybody has heard that all the prices on everything that we buy for restaurants went up, okay? But we didn't raise our prices. Instead, we re-engineered our, our menus. And so we had to create dishes or create variations on dishes that we could do for the old price, even though the prices for us, the, the cost of goods had really, really skyrocketed. So give us an example of that menu engineering. I'm sorry? Give us an example of that menu, menu um, engineering. Okay, well, I will say that um, there, are, there are things that you can do. Everybody loves pasta dishes, right? Um, and you're willing to pay 18 bucks for a pasta dish when it has very little ingredients really in it, but somehow that's a cool thing, and so we think that there's great value in that, and so <laughs> we do that. So uh, we looked at people, what people do for pasta dishes and said, okay, well, um, in Frontera, our pasta dish is an enchilada. And so we can do, we could do, make more enchiladas on the menu because people like them. And so we're gonna give you a little bit more of that category of dish um, because in the filling, we can put a smaller amount of protein in there. And protein just went out the roof in terms of price. So we can do that, more vegetables. We can create dishes that everybody's gonna wanna eat but we can engineer them in such a way that we can actually afford to put them on the menu. So we were spending less money on that plate of food, keeping it the same menu price, and that allowed for the offset and the incredible rise in labor um, that we were paying. So um, we're still trying to figure out what the balance, the right balance is gonna be, but that's the kind of engineering that we did on literally every single dish on our menu. And, and just because so it's a really know. big part of your cost and therefore what people are paying at a restaurant, I'll right. say, I think when we spoke, you mentioned that pre-pandemic, like your labor costs were about 30%, yeah. and now they're, up, now they're around 45. 42 to 45, okay? <laughs> so that means in, in the national average for what's on the bottom line in a restaurant is 6%. I know that those of you that have always dreamed because you love throwing dinner parties, dreamed of re having restaurants, when you read that statistic, you usually say, uh, really? No, it should be 20% at least. Um, but no, the national average is uh, 6%. And, you know, people used to say 30% for food and 30% for labor and 22% for your, for your fi uh, fixed costs. And that gives you 8% left on, the, uh, well, that went out the window completely. And so we're having to try to figure out how we can renegotiate that without losing money on the other end. And it's um, a lot of trial and error for us right now, but we're dedicated to being able to do that because we believe that, the, that there, are, is, there is great value in restaurants that cook real food that don't use processed foods. They're, processed foods, you know, they're very cheap. And there's, there's such a, right now, with the cost of goods the way it is, it's like, oh, can't we just, no. And we say, no, we gotta, we gotta buy good whole foods so that we can keep alive this tradition. 
we also have to train staff in the kitchen. And that's another thing that is a huge investment for us. Okay, so I want to come back to tipping because that does affect the cost quite We're a bit. Just um, but to stir up the pot here <laughs> because last time I spoke about this in a group, which I think you know about, um, it stirred the pot a lot. Yes, okay, so we'll come back to tipping, but I want to be sure we get to Jessica. Jessica, you run um, Key to Pan and Kitchen which serves things like bison street tacos and indigenous tamales, everything that, which sounds delicious. You've talked about how a big barrier to marketing more of this food to more consumers is just plain availability of indigenous ingredients. So tell us, you know, what exactly is the problem and what are some things that are, you know, see being done to solve it? Well, the problem is I can't go into any food suppliers and buy my ingredients. I can't even go into a local grocer and buy them. The ingredients that are, you know, true traditional ingredients, I mean, the only place you're gonna find those is in Indian country. A lot of my ingredients I have to drive 500 miles for. I have to order from like Cheyenne River across the country or blueberries from the East Coast to get those ingredients in because you know what, what I can use in stores, I call replicas. I, I refuse to use processed ingredients. They're not healthy. There's nothing, I mean, there's no value in them to me, especially you know, for us as natives, we believe that every food has a spirit. So if I want to convey the true meaning of a dish and to really you know, focus on that food, it has to have that spirit and it's not gonna be genetically modified. <laughs> so you know, for me, how do I get these ingredients? How do we make them accessible to us without incurring these heavy shipping costs or me driving 500 miles on a Saturday to pick up ingredients and then I'm exhausted when I get back to the kitchen? So we have thought this like in the long term, what is that solution? And it is to create more farming spaces, more community garden spaces, more farmers markets. You know, we have to have to deindustrialize our food ways to grow in a good way and bring healthy foods to the table. If we're growing all as communities, we can feed everybody without incurring high costs. I mean as it stands in our community, we have one native garden space, the Shy Nations has a garden space, but that can't sustain a whole community. It, it, they do a great job there, but we need more spaces like that. And, and to have those spaces, we need access to capital. And quite frankly, native, native entrepreneurs and businesses don't get the support that they need. When I launched my business, I had zero support. So I had to build and grow and figure things out on my own, but I do have a good team behind me and I do have a good support system now, but my ultimate goal is to launch a farm where we grow our traditional foods, make them accessible to our community, make them accessible to the communities that surround us, have people live on our farm in a small house village in exchange for working on the farm. That way they don't have to incur some of the cost of living. We have to be able to help each other to grow further. So it means, you know, more hands-on. It's not about, well, what is all these companies gonna do to make things better for us? It has to be about what we do. We have to be good stewards of the land. We have to take interest in growing and feeding ourselves in a happy way. We can't count on everybody to do it for us. So my long-term outlook is to start growing. And my sous chef who's standing over there, he is amazing with that stuff. And we have some really serious goals ahead of us. But they involve a great big community space here. And I hope that other organizations will join us and say, hey, this is really needed. Let's open up some more community garden plots. Let's start growing healthier foods. And I'm not talking about GMO seeds. I'm talking about true, like, there's seed banks all over the place that carry traditional native food seeds. We need to start growing those things. We need to stay away from, the creator didn't make those genetically modified foods. We need to you know, go back to the true seeds and true foods and because those are what's healthy for us. I mean, you look at diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disorders, those all come from the chemicals in our food system. And if we want a healthier next seven generations, we have to do the work now. We have to change the outlook. And that means going back to the way things were. To progress, we need to regress. So if there happened... If there happened to be any willing investors, say, in this audience, what would be on your wish list for, you know, for building more aviaries and sugarbush camps and some of the other, um, berry bush fields, some of the other things that you mentioned as so important to then building, a, you know, making your sourcing opportunities uh, more, more widely available? A farm space would be my biggest thing on the wish list uh, that we can, that has clean soil. That's my biggest. If we can get into a space and then start building, I think our community will come together and 
make it happen, but first we need a space to start that And are that there at. other promising examples where this is happening? You mentioned Cheyenne River. Are there, you know, are there others that we can look at? And well, Cheyenne Nation's it? garden on the north side of Chicago by Montrose and Pulaski, they've got a native garden. It's beautiful, and it's a youth group that's doing this. So they, they have the model right, but they, they also did it on their own with minimal support. You know, we need more spaces like that and more people to support those spaces and help us to develop them and, you know, open them up, not just to the Native community, but all the communities, because as most especially communities of color, because we seem to be the ones that suffer the most with health issues related to our food waste. And we are the ones that are often most ignored when it comes to issues like these so I think you know there's there's a lot of work to be done but again it has to we have to kind of turn back the clock on things and become homesteaders again if you will farmers gardeners agriculturalists we have to do those things in order to heal our food ways and I think that's the truly the only way that things will change here in this you know country we have to look at ways to eat healthier by growing healthier okay you have your marching orders <laughs> We will say we, we're out of time. We'll have to save tipping for another day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. What a great panel. I want to reiterate what Chef Jessica said about the way we can go forward and have the seven generations ahead of us do better is by going back and looking at some of these traditional methods and traditional seeds that are so important to Native communities and to all of us. So thank you for bringing that up. It was a beautiful point. We're now going to continue this discussion on healthier food environments with our next panel. Joining us for this conversation, we have Lynn Yu, the nutrition lead for the Kraft Heinz Company. Dondina Bradley, the Global Vice President of Health and Wellness Strategy and Innovation at Mars Wrigley. Liz Abinaw, the founder, owner, and operator for 40 Acres Fresh Market. Tanya Rodriguez, a cultural anthropologist at Hormel Foods. And our moderator, Mike Sula, a senior writer at the Chicago Reader. Before I get to turn it over to Mike, we have a video from US Congress member Jan Schakowsky of Illinois' 9th District. Thank you. This is Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, and I had the honor and pleasure of being with you in person last year, but I'm happy in any way to be able to join you and thank you for the incredible work you do in a wide variety of issues around food. One of the things I just want to tell you that's been on my mind so much is that in this richest country, in the world at the richest moment in history, it really should be considered intolerable to have so much hunger. People who can't afford to have any food, let alone the nutritious food that, that they need, shame on us. I was uh, out in the community at a couple of food banks this last week, and to, to see the, the people, even in suburban communities, who rely heavily on those food pantries in order to eat through the month. The cuts that we have seen proposed for the SNAP program, imagine, and the criteria having to put enough hours of work in order to get some food, the average SNAP benefit being about $6 a day for food. No, in the United States of America, food should and could be available to all. But I did mention to you last year that I'm also concerned about making sure that we put the F back in Food and Drug Administration. I am very concerned, as you were then, about all the additives that are put into food, most of which, up to thousands of which, have never been tested or it's been a very long time since they've been tested. There's evidence that there may be carcinogens in some of the things that are put into our food, so we have to make sure that it's not just enough food, but it's the right kind of food that we make sure that people are able to access. So I just wanna thank you so much for all the various ways that you deal with the issue of, of food, food accessibility, food 
quality, making sure that we are having fresh food and associating ourselves with those who grow that food. Count on me anytime to work with you. Bring me your issues. Let's be partners here on how we can make things better in the whole arena of life-saving food. Okay, hi. Hi, everybody. I am uh, I'm Mike Sula from the Chicago Reader. In case you're wondering, I used, when I used to review restaurants, he used to dress up like Justin Kaufman, Axios reporter, just to see if he was treated like everybody else. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see you in person. Uh, I just want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what you do first. Hello. Okay. How's this one? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Lynn Yu. So I'm a registered dietitian by training and lead the nutrition team at Kraft Heinz. Kraft Heinz is one of the largest food and beverage companies with over 200 beloved brands with the purpose of making life delicious. So I'm so pleased to be here today. Hi everyone, my name is Dundina Bradley. I lead what we call a well-being center of expertise. Um, I'm a part of uh, a lovely Mars family of brands. Some of them you may know from treats to snacks to foods to pet care and to one of the largest veterinarian care um, ecosystems. I would like to say my part of my role is about readiness. So looking at the future, really living in that 2030, 2035, how do we start to anticipate and build the infrastructure and the types of things that we're talking about here today. New models, new strategic initiatives, different kinds of partnerships. Because as we've heard, this is really quite complex. Uh, one company can't do it. How do we build the right ecosystems to do that? And my role is to start to build those bridges. Hi, okay, yeah, it's on. Hi everyone, my name is Liz Abuno. I am the founder, owner, and operator of 40 Acres Fresh Market. 40 Acres is a Chicago grocer that focuses on increasing access to affordable, fresh food in underserved communities. We operate on the west side of Chicago because it is the best side of Chicago. <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> and um, I'm on the on the very end of the supply chain uh, before the food actually gets to y in your cart, out the door, and on your tables. So I like to talk about the retail built environment for which neighborhoods get food. Hi y'all, I'm Dr. Tanya Rodriguez. I am the cultural anthropologist for Hormel. And no, it has nothing to do with dinosaurs or mummies. I promise you. Um, I am on the brand fuel team, and part of what I do is gather cultural intelligence to keep my pulse on the consumer and our customers. And so I do fun stuff like go into people's homes, cook with them, shop with them. I've lived on college campuses, and really I'm paid to be um, a diviner of the food future, but I'm also um, paid to be an advocate, and not that I don't have that as my own personal passion, for the emerging consumer that's always been around, by the way. Um, and so my, my job at Hormel is to cause trouble. <laughs> okay, everybody, uh, chime in as you see fit. Um, let's have a discussion. But I wanted to start with um, a question Tanya had uh, earlier on. Uh, and I feel like Liz probably has an interesting perspective on this one too, because I feel like both of you are probably on the ground a lot, connecting with real people about their real food needs, preferences, things like that. So, uh, Tanya, you said uh, there's often a gap between what consumers say they want and healthier food products versus what they actually do with food. Why does this exist and what does that mean? How many of us say that we're gonna start exercising on Monday, right? There's aspiration and there's reality, right? There's contemporary things, contemporary pressures. And so um, people tell me, you know, I want better food, I want higher quality food, and they see food manufacturers and retailers as uh, very important as gatekeepers. So, hey, are the farmers making great food? Are they growing great food? Are they taking care of the animals? 
Are the food manufacturers doing the right processes? And then is the retailer also helping me identify what foods are good for me? So that's what people say. And they tell us, we want less salt and less sugar. And then I go into their house. And guess what they're doing? Putting salt and sugar in stuff. That's what they're doing. And it's like, huh, why is that? And people are telling me, you know, I, it's habit, right? Uh, we talked about tradition in the last panel. It's hard to break that tradition. You're getting a lot of different types of health information or disinformation. It's hard to sort through all of that as well. And as one of our um, panelists said before, people are, um, they have been colonized in terms of their food ways and their ancestors and the things and the foods that were important to them. And so they don't have that ritual knowledge available as well. So that's why I think you see a big gap between what people say and what people do. It's complex and health is not a logical process. It is highly emotional. And I think that's the problem when we're making all these great plans and they don't come to fruition necessarily. So 100% agree. Uh, we've all heard the saying that we are creatures of habit. And so what we often hear in many communities is, we need a grocery store, or when a grocery store close, opens and then closes several years later, um, it's like, well, what happened? Well, it couldn't stay in business if it wasn't getting the patronage. So it's as simple as that. It's, it's revenue minus expenses, and the revenue has to be more than expenses. And if you're not bringing in enough revenue, you can't stay open. It's really simple. It's the story of the Whole Foods in Englewood. Um, now, that could be issues of market fit not being there, but ultimately, what people said they wanted, when they got it, they did not utilize it. But that's also because people have been trained for decades to shop outside of their communities for the goods and services they need because there's a perception that we don't have anything good in our community, so I have to leave the community. Or it can take years for even something like a farmer's market to take, get enough traction to attract farmers to actually even want to come to sell and shoppers to actually want to go and, and shop at them. Um, it is not a simply an issue of a matter of if you build it, they will come. And what often gets happened is that when efforts to bring better food into a community don't succeed, the community is blamed for why it doesn't succeed. Uh, you hear it all the time, oh, y'all people steal too much and that's why this store had to close. That's fucking bullshit. I'm gonna put that out there right now. Um, because I can tell you this, is that it if you're a profitable business, it takes a damn huge amount of theft in order for somebody to make you unprofitable. It can make a bad situation worse, but you wasn't profitable even if nobody stole a damn thing. So let's not even try to play that narrative. Um, it's like, oh, you guys say you want healthy food, but all y'all want to eat is like hot Cheetos and Sprite. Like, that blame gets placed on the community without asking the question of how did we get to where we are, what habits are ingrained, what, um, what daily movements are ingrained in people, and it takes a lot to shift that at the individual level, like you just said, like I'm gonna work out tonight, I'm really not. Um, how do you get that, how do you make a whole entire community shift and move? And we haven't, we're, we're, we're trying to figure those things out, but it's not as, it's just, it's not a simple answer of, well they just, mu they must not want it if they're not using it immediately. Uh, Liz, I want to come back to that, uh, specifically with regard to your upcoming brick and mortar. But first I want to ask Dondina and Lynn if any of this resonates in the work that you do. Sure. I mean, think about the challenges that we're facing today and think about the next five ten years as we cut the predictions around uh, deforestation and all the elements that we've got to choose and make choices relative to save the people and save the planet at the same time. So my heart's kind of taking a lot of these stories in today and it's um, kind of reminding me of a couple of things. One, when you think about the type of, let me just switch back. When you think about the, oh that's the one that doesn't work. No worries. When you think about the, just the theme here of empowering people to make choices. And when you look at empower people side and the behavioral science that goes on in that, and we're in kind of one of the most 
um, what I would say stressful eras that we've ever been in as society and mental health is on the rise. Um, all the things that we've talked about today increase uncertainty in people's lives and we're all kind of trying to figure it out on a daily basis of how we kind of address some of these things. And then on the healthy choices side, when you start to think about the better choice or the only choice or moving to the natural choice or to the whole food choice, these spectrums, I think, need to be addressed systemically and how do we break those down and be planful about them? And I think what I really appreciate about the kind of presence today of this theme with the White House and the panel is companies are showing up around front of pack label. We don't advertise to kids 13 and younger. We're all over reducing salt and sugar. We don't have a product in our portfolio that exceeds 250 calories and half of our portfolio is at 200 calories. And so what we're really trying to do is understand how to think about this whole value chain and figure out systemically how we can kind of address some of these challenges. And I, my worry right now is when we can't figure out what's going on at the local level and all the challenges that we want, and you start to think about global food companies and the systemic kind of change that we want to make, but we have to look at it at a global level. And sometimes in different national strategies, we can't even agree on what's healthy, we can't even agree on certain elements of that. I think there's a whole opportunity for what's happening in un kind of breaking all that down so that we have specs, so that we understand what we can do, how we plug in, how what we do doesn't affect the dashboard of what you do. And that's where I think my hope is in all this as we come together in more of a strategic alliance. I've never seen boots on the ground, more, and more funds being talked about in terms of food for good, health for good, and I'm just excited to see that kind of movement. But ideally, we need the blueprint so that we can really start to show the progress and how we want to move forward. Hi, Kraft Heinz. I'll just showcase a few examples of how we're making a healthier choice and easier choice. We have many commitments around reducing the sodium and sugar in our products. And one example um, that was recently launched was a sugar reduced Capri Sun. So taking a hero iconic brand and reducing sugar by 40% using um, monk fruit um, extract. And we heard earlier in the opening remarks about a focus on children's nutrition so and schools. And recently, Kraft Heinz has developed two SKUs that are compliant with the National School Lunch Program. So these Lunchables are not only reduced in sodium and saturated fat, but they also contain whole food um, groups such as whole grains and more protein. On the retail side, I don't know if you've heard the news, but yesterday we announced lunch, uh, Lunchables for the first time is going to be in the produce aisle. So with a regional test, um, testing fresh fruits, so we have grapes, we have clementines, we have pineapples and apples being tested with Lunchables um, in the southern part of the U.S. So, um, you know, with the change of a lot of our iconic brands and products, really having a large impact um, to make a better choice and ultimately a choice. Sorry, um, Liz, let's come back to you real quick. Um, I'm not sure what the status is with your brick and mortar, but you do talk a lot about uh, the need for in infrastructure. Um, what do you need in terms of in infrastructure once you get up, once you open your doors? So <clears throat> first, um, what I need in order to open my doors is a construction permit. So if anybody here is in the building department of the city of Chicago, get me my damn permit. It's um, <laughs> the first thing I need. Yeah, so um, the way I look at it, currently 40 Acres Fresh Market operates as a mobile produce vendor. It's the easiest license to get when you want to do food in the city. Um, and so we sell with delivery service uh, throughout the city of Chicago as well as um, at the Austin Town Hall City Market every Thursday, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. at 5610 West Lake Street. You should really hit it up. It's, it's a time. Anywho, so um, that's all well and good, but you don't change the food ecosystem of a neighborhood without permanence. And so my feeling is, is that if McDonald's can be there every day, if Popeyes can be there every day, then I need infrastructure that is there every day. 
I have said it before, and I have said it again, a grocery store is more than just a retail transaction. It is public health infrastructure. Um, when we look at the social determinants of health, it is not simply what happens in the doctor's office. It is the food environment, it is jobs, it is housing, it is neighborhood built environment. And healthy food commerce must be part of our community's infrastructure. And so, what you need to keep it part of the community's infrastructure is all of those things I just said around it. You need housing because you need, you need rooftops for people to shop. You need walkable streets. You need, we need a parking lot. We have a parking lot. You need people that have um, the skill set to be employed there. So you have to have a really good education system around you. You have to have people who are healthy to work. So you have to have healthcare available in, in, the, in the community. Parks, green space, and you need other retail. Retail attracts retail. You ever been on, what's that street? On Halstead, just north of uh, North Avenue, and it's like restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, and you're like, wow, they're all clustered together because like, Commerce begets more commerce. You don't want to be the, out there alone on an island. And so what's going on right now on the west side in particular is the development of the Soul City Corridor along Chicago Avenue where you have multiple different developers trying to develop an African-American identified business corridor um, on the west side of Chicago. And when we open, will probably be like the third or fourth business on this corridor, but that's not enough. You need 20, 30, you need more, but hopefully with grocery opening, grocery is an anchor that draws in more business, but also we have to do our part. Like it is not, like I said, it's not if I build it, y'all need to come, and if you don't, there's something pathologically wrong with you. As a business owner, I have to make sure I'm responsive to the needs of my consumers, I have to make sure that I'm marketing, I have to make sure that I'm running my business effectively from an operational standpoint. There is a lot that businesses need to do in order to bring you in the door. I am not entitled to anybody's business, I have to earn that. And so it's my job as a business owner to figure that out, and if I can't, that's my bad, not yours. Um, I'm reminded a little bit about what Chef Jessica said in the last panel um, about what are all these companies going to do for us. Um, it's what are we going to do. And I'm wondering, is there anything that Kraft, Heinz, Hormel, or Mars can do for you? Um, let me think about it and get back to Actually, right. <laughs> no, I'm going to, actually, yes, there is. So we talk about healthy food environments, right? And it is not simply the environment in which we live. We exist in multiple environments throughout our day. We live one place, we often work someplace else. We're in a large office space right now. One of the things that we often encourage businesses to do is if you are not already, buy fresh produce and put it in your break room. The places where people want to grab food, options is what we're talking about is those healthy options should be there. You ever been somewhere and the only thing is the vending machine with candy? And you'd, you'd eat an apple if it was there, but it's not there. And so 40 Acres services several local businesses with like a large bag of produce every single week, and that's what their staff eats off of. We're good at it, we do it better than anybody else, we do it affordably. So access is not simply about Oh, look at the poor people over there and they don't have food in their neighborhood. Like access means something to all of us because if, if one, if like, if ever, like, how do I put this? If the people that need it most have access, that means we all have access. And at some point we've all been like, damn, I really wish there was something healthier around. And so think of those environments where you can infuse more and more opportunities for people to make healthier choices throughout their day. I'd like to second that if I can, just to say in terms of a business, it has to be healthy in terms of nutritionally for the people in the business to function, but it has to also be um, healthy in terms of the spirit and the culture of the business. And part of being, you know, one way I think we can contribute to 
a local community level as a big company is by educating um, our staff. And so we offer two-year um, college to all of our employee children. We also um, pay back tuition for our employees. So that's really important you know, in terms of educating them, but also who you bring in as an employee. So that diversity of voice on your marketing teams um, who are your chefs and what are they using for the different products that you make to make sure that at the high level, at the C-suite, those voices are being heard. Hiring people like myself, that is um, someone who grew up with a single mom and grew up on SNAP, you know, hiring people with that lived experience, that's super important in changing the fabric of, um, of the C-suite and to be able to know that those ideas are at the very top. They're not something that is filtering down or filtering from the bottom. Um, and making sure that we have those chefs and everybody to reinforce and be interlocutors for the community she's talking about so that it's not us and them, but that we're really looking to the people and asking what can we do and how can we do it? And how do our products make sense to you or don't? And what do we need to change for them to do? Because I agree, we don't just deserve your business. We need to work for it. And if we don't have the right people there um, in staff, we're not healthy enough to earn your business. Uh, I see we are rapidly running out of time and there are a bunch more things I wanted to ask. But um, Dundina, you said something earlier uh, that we have a responsible marketing program that reflects our principles even though it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. We need more pull from customers and retailers who have become the regulator. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, when you think about, we put caps, calorie caps and sugar caps on our, on our products, and if we're, to your point about the healthier choice, if we're out there in our competition or the category isn't following suit, then you know, we're losing value, we'll just go to the other choice. So that's one example. Um, when you think about our chewing gum business and chew to be well and all the investment that we've done in oral hygiene and thinking differently about the behaviors throughout the day, that's something I'm really proud of as we start to think about Orbit and Extra as we know people eat those or chew those kinds of products because it's something that offers focus or calm or distraction to some of the things that we're talking about. So certainly in that element. And then with Kind. Uh, the Kind Bar is leading the way in you know, talking about being the second choice. Um, they've done a lot of push on the uh, fruits and vegetables and, and how we consume that. Um, so I would just say, you know, as we get into the built environment and we think about meeting every one of you where you are and make your food choice, how do we level set in a way so that there is that blueprint so all can bring kind of their best work and the interconnectivity that we need to maintain the kind of values that we're hearing today. Um, Lynn, in the last couple seconds we have left, um, I wanted to get a little bit deeper into this, but just quickly, how does the um, low salt, low sugar Heinz ketchup perform compared to the older stuff? So, so Sales-wise. Yeah, the, the ketchup is one of our iconic brands, and, and we have different sublines. We have our core ketchup, we have simply ketchup, we have a no added sugar, and also a, a no added salt version. Um, it's interesting because when we were talking about marketing, we recently launched a campaign that's targeted more towards um, millennials and, and making campaigns talking about the no added sugar ketchup. A, a better choice, right? So, I, you know, I think it's about talking about some of these options, putting some marketing and advertising behind it, and, and really coming down to the consumer has a choice of all these options. And I'll just say in, in the last few seconds, in terms of the development of, you know, some of these better for you, it does take time, right? So it takes time to develop, to validate, to make sure everything is you know just delicious and, and tastes and resonates with our consumers so um just just there's a lot of considerations in terms of when we're thinking about even reformulation or even innovating around products well we are down to the last few seconds um i appreciate you guys thank you so much great talk <laughs> thank you thank you thank you everyone
Uh, I just want to reiterate what Liz said about stop blaming communities and please get her her building permit now if anyone in this room has any power whatsoever. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're now going to look at the link between resilient supply chains and food security. We have another great panel with Dion Dawson, the founder and chief dreamer for Dion's Chicago Dream, Michelle French, the director of global sustainability programs at Archer Daniel Midland's company, Chef Gianni De La Cruz, the president of culinary for Levy Restaurants, and Mark Kaplan, good friend of Food Tank, the co-founder and partner at Invisible. Our moderator will be Ariel Chung, the food and travel editor for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, before we hear from them, though, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Newt Mustu, the Director of Sustainable Food Systems for the UN Global Compact Norway, who will kick things off for this, uh, for this panel and give some short remarks. Please welcome Newt to the stage. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello? Yep. <clears throat> Can I stand on this? Yeah. Um, dear friends, brothers, sisters, Chicago. Um, on the 9th of August 2021, the International Panel on Climate released its report, Code Red for Planet Earth. Add to that the roughly one billion people suffering from serious food insecurities, while at the same time, obesity has become a serious public health risk in the developed world. War in Ukraine, Sudan, the cost of living crisis, energy shortages, ocean rise and biodiversity collapse, not to mention the constant pressures from forest fires. Well, you know that well, I'm guessing, after what happened in Canada. Yeah? But who am I to tell you about forest fires. And we all know, we all know the problems too well. And if this was a movie, right now Superman would appear on the, on the horizon. Uh, maybe to save us from destruction. But this is not a movie. And Superman is not coming. So we must save ourselves. We must save ourselves and we must save each other. Because if there is one thing that is clear, it's that we are all in the same boat. Some people sit on the top deck, some people sit on the bottom. But the water temperature is going to be the same for everybody. So how can we save ourselves and how can we save each other? And how can we be heroes of a sustainable future? Before I go on, um, it's great to see so many people having turned out for such an important issue. Uh, my name is uh, Knut Mostu. Uh, as I said, I am the Director of Sustainable Food Systems uh, for UN Global Compact Norway. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, visit Chicago again. Lovely weather you have brought uh, this time. Uh, wasn't like that last time. Um, but I have truly enjoyed it and also seeing uh, parts of your wonderful city, and seeing how important food is to the city. And my hope is that the city will become even more important to food. Yeah. So I have been asked to give an introduction to today's subject, and I, I once did a course on how to do public speaking. You'll uh, see if I did well. Um, but they told me you could, should only leave people with one main idea. And that main idea I want to introduce to you today is a concept called transition thinking. Okay? Um, so what is transition thinking? It is the third step in the evolution of sustainability thinking. So it's based on the concept that we are all in this together. That we are not only in this for ourselves that we are not the culprits, but we are the responsible for turning things around. I cannot 
lift my hands and say, I didn't do it, because it is my responsibility, and it's your responsibility. The thing is that we have to engage on all levels to ensure that there is a triple bottom line. And when we look at how this started, it started with good intentions in the early 2000s, where some global investors said, we're pulling out of coal. We're not, we're divesting from coal. Um, the problem we saw was that it's not enough to not do harm. We also have to do good. So they started investing in ESG pro uh, projects. Yeah. So all this money we pulled, all the good money, to put it in a way, pulled out of coal and started investing in sustainable projects. The problem with that was that when all the good money pulled out of coal, and not all the good money, of course, coal stocks became cheap. And we have more coal today than we had in the early 2000s when the money pulled out. Because the money that did not care about ESG came in. And not only that, but there were not enough sustainable projects to absorb the divestment of capital. So then we introduced the third term. Uh, we cannot just divest. We have to take responsibility not only for ourselves, but for others. And in the business sense, this means for our supply chain. It means that we have to help, through some transition thinking, our supply chain, our suppliers, our customers, to not only set ambitious goals to deliver on sustainability targets, but actually engage with them and help them reach those goals. Be it climate accords and Paris Agreement, be it biodiversity, now with the Montreal Agreement, or be it on food waste. We cannot leave the responsibility to somebody else. It has to be me and you. So with this third step, uh, we need to create a system where we are all responsible. We have to give our providers, our customers, our suppliers the opportunity to become compliant. It does not help us if I set strict demands to my suppliers if they cannot deliver. Then they're going to go somewhere else. Hmm? But we have to actually help them with uh, those requirements. This could be giving them a contract to a company, a small company, a startup maybe, that is non-compliant today, but with the promise of the investment of helping them become compliant. And as long as they do it before delivery, it should be fine. So then we build strong and resilient supply chains, and we actually help create jobs. <clears throat> but to do this, we need a couple of things in place. First, we need um, digital systems with technological tools that can communicate through the whole supply chain. Transparency. This system must allow us to share data even between competitors without revealing trade secrets. That might sound like a lot, but that's the easy part. The hardest, but the most important part is trust. Trust that the data we share is real, is honest, transparent. And then once we have the data, it will not be misused. And trust that the people, in other words, the workers, the farmers, will get the sufficient training and tools to manage these new demands. The transition must be inclusive. Hmm? 
And it's important that these people, the farmers, the workers, also share in the benefits of this new system. These advances must benefit all. What we call a just transition. The problem with trust it's that it's hard. Well, it's easy to lose, but it's hard to build. And it is only built and strengthened through transparency and collaboration. Um, I was going to give you an example, but I see that I um, have overstayed my, my time, I think, a bit. Uh, and my lovely panel is, uh, is waiting there. But now that you're a captive audience, I will uh, read from my book. Um, no. <clears throat> but I think that if we can get back to the, to the message I'm trying to convey here. The message I'm trying to convey is that we can no longer look at divestment we can no longer look at leaving anybody behind. The future has to be sustainable and just and inclusive. And it is my responsibility and it is yours. Um, so my hope is that all of you will be the superheroes of the sustainable future. Put on a cape, preach uh, the gospel, hmm? and Continue the conversation about shared responsibility. Say, it's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. So, with that, uh, I want to invite today's heroes uh, up to the, uh, up to the, yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right, okay, good. It is on, we're ready to go. Um, hi everybody, we're gonna be talking about how resilient supply chains enable food security. And I'm just gonna start right off with Mark. Uh, what makes a supply chain resilient and how has technology played a role in that at Invisible? Sure. So what makes a supply chain resilient is the, the surety of that supply chain. So what I, you know, that, that involves a few things. One is the the conservation of the resource itself. So in, in seafood, it's making sure that it's not overfished or illegally um, caught. Um, or in the case of aquaculture, that it's not uh, environmentally abusive. Um, it's ensuring that the livelihoods along the supply chain are all equitable. So it's ensuring that the farmers are paid equitably, that the labor rights in the processing centers are all just and that the transportation of that product is done in a responsible manner, meaning the product is authentically delivered at, to the end, and that you're not compounding an environmental issue by having a destructive delivery system, for lack of a better term. Um, and the way that technology helps that, at least from an invisible standpoint, is we, we deployed a traceability system across every one of our seafood supply chains where we capture the data that reflects the events as they take place along the supply chain. So it's not just a reporting of chain of custody or what I call like a glorified FedEx number. It's actually like true visibility into the events that take place along that supply chain. And so that, that's how I define it and that's the delivery of the technology and the, the end result is that on our, because we do packaged seafood, um, so that you can go into the supermarket and pull the package out of the freezer, and if you're curious if that, you know, wild Alaskan salmon is actually wild Alaskan salmon, you can scan the QR code and it has a verified um, story of the entire supply chain and what took place. So like, what we try to avoid and, and educate our consumers on is the difference from like, Yes, it might be fished in Alaska, but that we actually, product of USA means that it's actually still processed in the US, not shipped to oftentimes China and then shipped back to the US as like a, 
a lower cost way of processing product. And that's what I mean by like a destructive delivery system where you're tripling the emissions of the, of the supply chain to save a quarter. Now, Dion, going all the way through the chain to the consumer level, you see that direct impact on a you know, weekly, daily, constant basis here in Chicago, and you see how that food insecurity affects people's lives. So how did you develop a model with Dion Chicago Dream that meets the needs at that ground level? Well, I think when we talk about the supply chain, um, we only talk about what's popular at that moment. And so what I saw, I'm sorry, my six-year-old has called me 19 times in a row. If anybody has a six-year-old, you know exactly what's going on. Um, he will not take being ignored. Um, but when we talk about the supply chain, a lot of times we look at it from what's popular at that moment. And so what we've seen with Dion Chicago Dream is how do we look at the supply chain from the consumer level and what they experience? And so what we saw was an opportunity to make sure that how the consumer is experiencing the supply chain, they're getting that quality, they're getting a lot of the reassurances, and they're getting the consistency that everyone who's committed to food insecurity work has committed themselves to. And so just making sure that the other side of it, um, we're being held accountable. And at Dion Chicago Dream, we've been able to stabilize last mile delivery, which is something everyone struggles with in every sector all throughout the country. And so what we decided was, how do we make sure that from the uh, consumer's experience, it's equitable, it's quality, it's consistent, and then work our way back. And so from there, we were able to make sure that our sourcing was consistent. We were able to make sure that our team was uh, compensated. We were able to make sure that we were really, you, we could do something and build a platform that then the next year we can grow and not just dismantle it and try to create it again. And it's grown quite a bit. Absolutely. Uh, what started with 30 households per week has grown into 48,000 um, pounds of brand new produce throughout the Chicagoland region uh, per month. Wonderful. Um, Deani, with going from a, a, you know, this scale to a scale of Levy Foods, how do you hold yourselves accountable when it comes to sustainability and supporting, I'm sorry, and supporting okay. that, supporting that resilient supply? Well, first and foremost, um, it, it is amazing to see food from so many perspectives. I'm a chef. Um, I'm also come from a very large company. We have probably 75% of the portfolio of um, sports and entertainment in the country. And I feel like uh, transparency, we were talking about that earlier, um, maybe being honest when it comes to how much we can impact uh, environment, food insecurity, food waste. I mean, it's, it's major. So for us, we started actually creating tools within our own company to actually say, we have something that is called Waste 2.0. It's actually a system that, ex that it's already in place in all of our properties. Um, and then with that, then we started kind of creating the movement itself where we actually are able to trace it now. Besides that, we work with uh, Food Rescue USAID, and then what we did is we kind of harnessed that movement of how do we donate things? How do we you know, safely go back out there? Because remember, a lot of other times, especially in our business, one of the first excuses is we can't donate something, we cannot do, you know, cook food, we cannot do this, that. So we found somebody out there uh, that actually helped us to, to create that uh, trace now too as well. So with that said, and that is just two of the things that we are actually putting in place right now and, and they're working in many, many places. Um, I love what Deanne is doing and, and I feel like everything that is happening right now from Mark, which is actually something that we are looking at, you know, the transparency of where our food is coming from. I mean, I, you know, we don't ask for 10 cases of eggs. We probably need a million eggs per year. So with that said, I mean, we are able to break or make something, break or make in a small business, uh, uh, I don't know, a farm. We are able to actually also break something, literally. If it doesn't come from the right place and I need it as a company, um, then that is going to, at the end of the run, you know, at the end of that is going to create more bad habits where Mark is working through, towards that, uh, where Dion is working towards that. So for us, I feel like it's it holding us ourselves accountable. It's actually been here today. 
is having a seat at the table and speaking of the things that we know we're able to break or make through the process of being so big in the industry. So I feel like that's, that's some of the things, but you know, looking also at, at the environment. I mean, how many pounds and pounds of food we're taking out of the landfills, you know, through food rescue, it's major. We were able to do um, about, I think we donated in four years that I've been working with this organization about seven million pounds of food. That's a lot of food that you take off the fields, that you're able to actually source back into the community somehow. And, and I feel like it's major. So I feel like for us, it's about, as a company, it's being transparent. It's actually having a seat at the table and be able to answer some of these questions where before it used to be kind of a closed door conversations of the perception of donating is that we are over, I don't know, overproducing or anything along that line. We are in a business that we're able to still donate food, we're able to save waste, and we are able to also, you know, impact the supply chain a lot. Um, and Michelle, that connection between consumers and farmers is part of what ADM facilitates. How does food security play into that relationship? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, at ADM, we're kind of the big company that nobody knows about because we don't sell to consumers. We sell ingredients to the companies that everybody knows and loves. You know, you go and you buy an Oreo. We actually process the flour that goes to the company that makes that cookie. So think of ingredients rather than final products. And then we work backwards from there. When we look at just our US supply chain, we have 60,000 direct grower connections. And when we talk with consumers, they're interested in sustainability. They wanna know where did their products come from? How were they grown? You know, what kind of methods and how does that impact everybody along the supply chain? And then those consumers speak to consumer product companies. And they come back to companies like ADM and say, we need to lower our carbon footprint. We need to have a good farmer story. We want to know about on-farm economics. What are we doing to support growers? And they come to us and say, here are the metrics we want to trace. And then what I get to do in my role is then convert that into meaningful and understandable things that we can take to a grower. So I can go to a farmer and say, you need to lower your carbon footprint by you know, two grams per bushel. And they're gonna look at me like, what? I, how do I even measure that? What are you talking about? But if I go to them and say, there's been a lot of research going on on cover crops. When you implement a cover crop between your corn and your beans, you can see that carbon is sequestered in the soil. It increases your soil organic carbon. We're starting to see that your soils become more resilient. You can weather these weather impacts. I'm sorry to use weather twice in a sentence, but you know, we, we, we're seeing things like floods, like droughts, like derechos coming through and really impacting things. So when I can sit down with a grower and say, wouldn't it be great if you can improve the resiliency of your farm operation, increase your economics by increasing your yield, all while doing this, reducing inputs, reducing the cost of those impacts the inputs themselves, what washes down into the waterways, it's a different story. And so being able to translate what consumers want, what companies want, what a lot of these different organizations and NGOs and governments are asking us to do into words that farmers understand and that make sense for their operations is really what we are getting to do. We've stood up a new regenerative agriculture program that we're very proud of because we do now have this team of two or 300 grain originators who now speak sustainability. They can actually talk to a farmer about, oh, you're interested in cover crops, we're paying people to do that. They can tell you all the important details, let me put you in contact with a specialist, but they're focusing on this. So we can have this conversation upstream and downstream. Wonderful. Um, so I think in 2023, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who says, no, I don't care about resilient food supply. I don't care about food insecurity. But even when we have that buy-in on, on that level, whether it's a micro scale or a macro scale, what are some of the challenges or the barriers to you know, solving some of these problems? And, and that can be an open question for whoever would like to touch on it. Yeah. I think Mark and I, uh, uh, we've been talking about this because of, of the challenges that, we, that we're facing right now is probably transparency. It's very hard to, 
to kind of say, uh, um, you know, I'm green, I'm, I'm impacting some farms, uh, you know, Diane as well, in, in terms of what comes in, you know, we are so used to for something just to appear in front of our eyes. We don't think about the story behind it or where it comes from. I mean, Mark and I, I think of the first conversation was about like, how do you, how do you outsource um, shrimp? And, you know, and, and Mark gave me probably two nightmare stories about shrimp and I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, I used this amount of shrimp last year. How many of those cases came from places that we don't know? And the, the story of this is that, you know, a lot of especially companies, big companies outsource from some places and, you know, all you say is, if it has a little leaf, uh, green leaf on the side, I can click and it's coming from a, from a real place. And, but we don't, we don't really know that. So I think that it's, it's the collaboration. The challenges right now is transparency. Honestly, I, I think I can say that. And I don't think I'm the only one that is, you know, right now we're just able to say it aloud. Um, but I think it's the collaboration with a lot of us is gonna kind of start, you know, getting all those uh, uh, points together when it comes to that. Um, so for that, for me as a big company or for us as a big company, I think that's what we are trying to really, really tackle is the transparency of where our food is coming from and making sure that it is from the sources that we are able to make an impact from the agriculture side of it, um, from the small business side of it, and then hopefully, you know, we find good partners and, you know, that's, that's what I was saying. Mark and I are kind of, <laughs> that's how the conversation started. Yep. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll take the next uh, step here and, and say that, you know, one of the challenges I think is accountability. Um, so, you know, us working across the whole supply chain, one of the biggest struggles we've had is the authenticity of and the accountability of the consumer facing um, entity. So like big companies have a lot of public facing commitments the supply side of the supply chain sees those commitments and makes the change. So like Newt was talking about just transition. So they make this transition, make the big investment, and then the end company ends up like not honoring their promises, right? And so then what that does is it then builds a complete mistrust from the, from the farmer standpoint or from the pr primary production standpoint and then what happens then is the domino effect of that basically erodes the sustainability of the supply chain, but I mean that in like the actuality sense, not in the buzzword sense, where the access to the resource becomes like challenged or at risk. And so that's where this like concept of a just and honest supply chain enables food security because if you've, you've got that mistrust at the source of production and the access to product breaks down, then organizations from the size of a major grocer all the way to Dion will have an increasingly difficult time accessing like food. And then you end up in like the situation where we saw it during pre-vaccine COVID where you had like empty shelves and short supply and then the price goes skyrocketing, but the no one on the other on either side is winning. It just erodes the entire supply chain. So that to us, I'd say the accountability of the consumer facing point of engagement with food is the biggest challenge. And I mean, just touching on that accountability is also responsibility. I think that the, the way that we enter into this work, even when we were talking backstage, is from a perspective of we're failing. We're not, we're, we all have great intention and we all do, do good work, but overall, we have to take responsibility for what we've created. And so getting to that next phase of a resilient you know, supply chain is making sure that even as a black man, how I see myself and where I see myself in the supply chain is equitable, but also understanding that, you know, I'm not here to get a pat on the back. We're here to figure out how we can ultimately create a food system and supply chain where what we intend to do is done at the end. And we know that there's a lot of steps in between A to D, but just making sure that that transparency um, and that accountability is there so that from step A to B, we know what happened. So if there is a fix that needs to happen, it can be made so that the ultimate end user is not affected in a negative way. 
Excellent. Michelle? I think I would go a different direction with challenges just because I've got a little bit of a different perspective. And I would say one of the biggest challenges that we see is analysis paralysis. How do we calculate this? How do we prove this? How do we get there? How do we show it? And the answer is if we sit here and figure out what the answer is, we're going to have missed the boat. We have to act now. We have an idea of different practices, of different methods, of different methodologies and measurement schemes that are directionally correct. Let's start going down that pathway. Let's start forging relationships along the supply chain. Let's start partnering together. Let's get boots on the ground and start working. And we'll figure out the minutia, the details, as we get there, as they come. Yes, 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 Amen. yes, 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 100%. I, I'm going to say this. We are all so different. We sat down in a room, and we all look at each other and said, how are we going to do, like, kind of connect on what we're doing? And at the end of the conversation, um, we all figured out that we all need each other in so many ways, from the big company to the technological part of what we're doing, from, like I was telling Michelle, you are the beginning of everything because you, you help us. Deanne and I are on the community side of it. But the most important thing is um, my CEO had a conversation with me after a couple of days ago, and he said, there's three things that I need you to understand. And then I'm thinking like, okay, he's going to go on to, and the first thing he said is, this is the right thing to do, period. That's it. I think that's, that's truth. Put on the ground. We need to actually educate ourselves, our companies, the people that is behind it. Because you'd be surprised when you talk about sustainability and you ask for the description, how many people will look at you like, what? <laughs> I, I mean, it's the truth. And it's, it's nothing wrong with that. I think education is very important. And education doesn't mean that you're going to teach somebody how to do sustainability. Education is simple. To walk into your company, to walk into your leaders, to walk anywhere and say, I have a plan of how to help. Not to teach somebody to, for that, but let's help each other. And I think that is major. So let's okay. just do this because it's the right thing to do for me. And then just kind of in our, our last few minutes, whether it's your own company or someone whose company you've seen or a business or a government entity, what's one win this year that kind of shows you that we're going in the right direction? Or what is one, one space or one area or one change that you're like, this is what we're talking about, like this is what we want to see? Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll get started. Um, you know, I, I'd say a win, and I, I like to speak from personal experience because then I actually know what I'm talking about as opposed to speculating how someone else did something. Um, you know, I'd say a win that we've had is, and I'll be like the commercial guy up here, I guess, and just go with like a way that we've designed our supply chains in a certain way. We've been able to achieve a, and I'll, I'll go with brands here because it just kind of articulates it, but we've been able to have sourcing in a way using what I described earlier by having visibility to the whole supply chain, et cetera. We've been able to deliver a product of a quality of a very like grocery chain that's known for more expensive products. Um, we've you, we have the same suppliers, but at the price point that's lower than a giant discount grocer. And so the win in that is we've proved that sustainability and delivering a transparent supply chain is actually a cost saving tool. It's not a cost increasing tool. And so it's just a matter of like delivering it truly delivering it. And so that, that's what I go with our win. A lot easier to get the money people to buy in. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's actually, it's more to get people who are doubters and think that sustainability is automatically more expensive to dispel that myth, because it's a total myth. Excellent. I'll speak up like our big win, and again, we're in a bit of a different segment. We launched our regenerative agriculture program. This thing is kind of my baby. We've been talking about sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture, through things like Field to Market and some other organizations in North America for eight or nine years now. Last year, ADM officially launched its program. We reached 1.2 million acres. That's nowhere near all the farmland in the US, but that's a pretty big chunk just to start. 
That means that there were over a thousand growers that we were going out having conversations about soil health, about resiliency, about on-farm economics, nitrogen fertilizer application, having those conversations, and then having their neighbors call us this year and say, what were they doing? Because their fields looked great. Let's, <laughs> let's have this conversation. Getting that word of mouth and that excitement at the farmer level, I would say is just a huge win that I'm so excited to see. That's great. I think for us is about, I think we created our own sustainable way to say it. we are starting from the educational side, which is we are kind of mixing the developing talent within our community and helping to the part of doing food rescue to the part of doing waste. So right now, um, it's part of our KPI as a company, and, and I think that's major. I've always said for an operator, um, if you want to really, for them to pay attention, um, kind of go back to their pockets. So I think that it's uh, one of our wins, and then the fact that we actually have a seat at the table as, uh, you know, that I can actually speak with many of our properties around the country and help them. If you don't have a food rescue, let us know. We find you a chapter, we find you somebody, and we are actually being proactive instead of, of saying, how am I gonna put all this food out on the market or you know, with uh, food rescue or et cetera, we are actually being proactive, we are planning. So this is the year that we've been planning for next year of how to take big events, waste to the right places of how can we actually save um, on waste that, as well. So uh, I feel it's, I think the proactivity of the company, it's our big win this year. Great. Definitely. Uh, really quick, because I know the team over there is like, hey, you better. I wasn't looking. I already know. Uh, but, uh, but a big win, I think, uh, just looking at it a little differently. Of course, we've tripled production. We've, we've uh, quadrupled the size of our team and hiring in the communities. But for us, I think um, it's telling that from last year attending this event uh, to this year, we've been able to really branch out in terms of interacting with uh, the supply chain. So to sit here and to know that we've worked with Erica Allen and the Urban Growers Collective, we've worked with um, Growing Home uh, and Janelle's team, we've worked with TFF and Vivery, and we've, we've done pilots to test our product and what we do, which is logistics, against the supply chain to make sure that we can connect in a way that is fitting so that if we have a world scale event again, we're not just looking around wondering what we're gonna do. So I think for us, it's really been making sure that we had partnerships where we can really test our metal and what we've created against the supply chain as a whole. Wonderful, thank you guys all for uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bigger round of applause everyone, this is a great panel. I also wanna thank Newt again for being here. Awesome, thank you so much. I want to remind you, don't get up, because we have a great afternoon ahead of us. Senator Durbin's on his way. Then there's the reception a little later on. There will be whiskey, wine, beer, mocktails, delicious food. You cannot leave, OK? So I hope everyone uh, gets to stay and enjoy. Our friends from the White House will be staying for the reception, so you'll get a chance to talk to them as well. Um, I now want to take this opportunity to thank our in-kind partners for sharing their delicious products. Big thanks to Yolele and Chef Pierre Tam, Nyman Ranch, Stumptown Coffee, Daily Crunch, Nuts for Cheese, and Simplicity Cold Juice. And I can't thank enough again Farmer's Fridge and also the UN Global Compact Local Network on Sustainable Food and Agriculture Systems. None of this would have been possible without them. So now I get to take a seat in my favorite velvet chair. Um, and, and I have a really exciting uh, conversation uh, now. I'm really thrilled to invite Jazz Brazic, Brizic, I'm sorry Jazz, Jazz Brasag to the stage for a very, very special fireside chat. Jazz is the organizing director for Workers United Upstate New York and Vermont and is a true inspiration. And I don't use this term lightly, she is a badass. And she is truly somebody who is a heroine and I, I was so honored to meet her in person last night after hearing about her for so long. So I can't thank her enough for being here. You have to give her a round of applause before we start. <laughs> So Jess, thanks again. Thank you. It's so great to have you here. You have done something truly extraordinary with a group of baristas. <laughs> um, you organized a union at one of the largest multinational food and beverage companies in the world. 
in the world, everyone. No one thought a union at Starbucks was possible. And what you and your colleagues have done is, again, it was nearly impossible, but you've done something that has led to hundreds of victories at Starbucks stores nationwide. And I want you to share with this audience what inspired you. Why do this? This was impossible to do when you did it. We didn't think it was impossible, um, maybe naively. Um, definitely naively in terms of, you know, there was a large part of us um, both individually and of our team that believed that Starbucks was actually going to respect the right to organize, to sign on to the fair election principles, a set of corporate conduct um, you know, guidelines for how companies should behave during union elections that sets a higher standard and an equal playing field. Um, and we thought Starbucks was going to do that because you know, they said they were a different kind of company. And they said that they believed in Black Lives Matter, that they were a safe space for LGBTQ people, that they were you know, different and more equitable, um, and that they didn't believe in hierarchies. <laughs> um, so maybe stepping backwards for a minute, the origins of the Starbucks campaign in some ways were in the industrial union strategy of the industrial workers of the world um, from like 100 years ago. Um, because their whole organizing model was you can't just organize one company, you have to organize all of the companies and then, you know, have the general strike, overthrow capitalism, all of that. So we were saying, okay, you know, we, we can't just organize one coffee shop, Gimme Coffee in Ithaca, New York, which organized in 2017, became the first ever baristas union in the country. Spot Coffee in Buffalo, which we organized in 2019, was the biggest restaurant chain at that time to unionize. Um, you have to build density and actually change the entire industry so that people aren't undercutting each other. So that was what led us, um, right after Spot Coffee, I met with a Starbucks worker um, about organizing their workplace. And they started trying to put together an organizing committee in December 2020, no, 2019. Um, and then Starbucks fired them, allegedly for cussing. I'm telling you, if Starbucks fired people for cussing, None of us would have ever had a job at Starbucks. <laughs> um, but that was what they did to try to prevent people from organizing. As soon as they got the smallest inkling of what was going on, they would fire people. So that was what led me to get a job at Starbucks, to try to um, you know, preempt them from being able to root it out and actually see if we could build a, bu a Buffalo coffee project. Sure. Can you explain to this audience what actually Starbucks workers are demanding and why? So when we were talking to our coworkers about why we should organize, why this was you know, a good move, everybody was like, well, why wouldn't we? Because people, Lexi Rizzo, who was recently fired, um, was a seven-year Starbucks worker who'd worked at the company since she was 17. And she was pro-union because it aligned with all of the reasons that she had wanted to work at Starbucks in the first sure. place. And her line was, we fight for what we love. And, you know, we were talking about everything from, you know, having a seat at the table. Starbucks has an empty seat at their board meetings to right. symbolize partners. And we were like, well, why has no partner ever been in that seat? Right. To demands like credit card tipping, which Starbucks never had credit card tipping in 50 years because they would have to pay a little extra percentage for each transaction, and that wasn't worth it to them. And we said, you know, with a union, we can demand things like that that don't mean that much to the company, but would mean so much to partners. And, you know, they've shown through their anti-union campaign that it was never about, you know, um, even the economic parts. It was all about power and control. I want you to sort of dive deeper into that because that's really, I think, key to why so much, many of us who thought Starbucks was this enlightened company, right? We're like, oh, it's, this, it's okay to go here because we like Howard Shapiro, <laughs> right? But what they're talking, you're, you're absolutely right. They're talking about power. They, they want to concentrate power and not allow workers literally to have a seat at the table. This is key to why you wanted to do this. Exactly. So the president of Starbucks North America, Rossian Williams, moved to Buffalo right after we announced that we were organizing 
and her entire job was fighting the union. Um, she said that she was there to support partners and um, you know, revitalize this market that clearly we were having issues or we wouldn't be wanting to unionize. She told me that she was in my store because we had a carpet in the back room of the store and like clearly that necessitated the president of Starbucks North America bringing all of these execs to rip out a carpet in the back room of one Starbucks out of 9,000 stores. <laughs> Sounds legit. But no, in the captive audience meetings that Rossian ended up leading, um, I was trying to explain to her and to my coworkers who were on the fence or being told all these things about what unions were, uh -huh. that it wasn't hostile. It wasn't, you know, an act of war. They might have made it into a war, but we weren't. Um, and that all we wanted, you know, was for this company to no longer be top down. And she was like, have you read any of Howard's books? He doesn't believe in anything being top down. And then he came to Buffalo and talk about, talked about the Holocaust to try to dissuade us from unionizing. Um, which didn't work, but time after time, he was willing to go to any length, any inappropriate length, <laughs> to sure. try to preserve his own power and talk about, you know, creating this kind of company where, you know, he was so proud of the benefits that he was giving, but if workers actually wanted a say in those benefits or, you know, to demand anything above what he thought was appropriate, suddenly that was the enemy. So these captive audience meetings, I don't think a lot of people in this room actually understand what that means. What happens? So if you're a non-union worker in a workplace, management can call you into a meeting, um, often with little or no notice. They can call you into a group meeting or a one-on-one -on -one with as many corporate people as they like and tell you all of the things that they don't want you to do about unionizing, all of the th threats that it's legal to threaten workers about unionizing. There are certain threats you can't make, but there's lots of threats that you can lawfully make. And um, it's incredibly intimidating. I mean, workers were wearing smartwatches into these meetings that were sending them heart rate notifications about, are you in a stressful situation? Your heart rate is through the roof. Um, and Starbucks would come in, make our stores feel like war zones, bring in six managers into one Starbucks to surveil everyone, be present at every hour of the day, and then tell us, vote no, because don't you want to put an end to this tension in your workplace? Mm. Um, so the disregard that they showed for workers, you know, sanity and safety at every step of the way, including weaponizing information they had about people's mental health situations, and intentionally trying to exacerbate anxiety and um, any concerns was just unprecedented. So we're talking ab about mental health and, and not having any concern for that. We're talking about sort of physical safety. That leads me to sort of um, want to know more about what happened during the pandemic because we all heard about Starbucks workers being threatened by people who didn't want to wear masks. People were placed in, in sort of unsafe scenarios very regularly. Yes, I mean, one of the Starbucks in Buffalo never closed the entirety of the pandemic. They were drive through only, but there was a line of cars two hours long down Sheridan Avenue in Buffalo because people wanted their caramel macchiatos and their sense of normality. Um, in the beginning, I would say, at least at my store, you know, we were enforcing mask mandates. Corporate's policies were different than what we were, you know, sometimes doing in the stores because we were created, we were our own pandemic isolation pods. Sure. We were looking after each other when people couldn't afford, you know, to buy groceries and pay rent. People were chipping in to help each other. All of that was happening organically because people cared about each other. Um, and when we started unionizing... And the company didn't. Oh, sorry. Yes, the company did. Um, when, we were, when we started unionizing, that became really apparent right. because corporate came in and told us, wait, you're not allowed to enforce mask mandates. We need to make sales. Um, and actually, our store was the first in the country to go on strike, which we did within a, less than a month of winning our union election because corporate wasn't letting us enforce any COVID safety protocols at all at the height of the Omicron virus. Um, and our people were passing COVID to each other in the store. No one who went on strike 
caught COVID, but almost everyone who didn't did. And I think that underscored not just to us, but to partners across the country that this was a way that people could protect their lives and, you know, also win all the other things that we were trying to fight for. Absolutely. So levels of intimidation, very high. Levels of coercion, really high. Levels of, you know, just general meanness to workers, <laughs> very, very high. Can you tell us about the effect that had on someone like you and also the friends you made, the, the, the other baristas, just this sort of the mental and physical toll that must take every day? I mean, I think in a lot of ways, unionizing brought people closer together and um, coworkers like Michelle, who'd been at Starbucks for 12 years, mm -hmm. told me that, you know, they'd never been more, Starbucks is all about connecting with people, at least that's what they say, like we're gonna connect with the customers, we're gonna connect with our partners. Um, but the union was actually truly connecting people and truly, you know, transcending kind of superficial relationships. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Starbucks weaponized everything they could. And there are partners who were fighting, you know, mental health battles and um, who were targeted by Starbucks union busting campaign. And one of our original organizing committee members in Buffalo died by suicide after months oh. of Starbucks retaliation. Was that, you know, I can't say Starbucks was responsible for that, but I, I, it was months of union busting before that happened. And I don't think that there's a separation there. Oh, um, sure. I think the psychological warfare that companies put workers through is completely unmeasured and undocumented. Um, and that's what the tension that they're creating through captive audience meetings, through um, you know, preventing workers from transferring in or out of stores that have union campaigns, through changing people's schedules to either schedule them to the max, make them close one night and come back to open their store early the next morning, um, or slashing people's hours. All of this is calculated to either force people out or push them to the point of burnout, of apathy, of can I maintain this? And many workers you know, have ended up in hospitals as a result of union busting. Gosh, I mean this, this term that you've used, weaponization, it's also used because these are folks who are not making great wages. I know Starbucks often talks about great wages, but they're not that great. <laughs> and we are at a summit around access and affordability and, and empowering consumers, but you know, I think it's very difficult for most of us to understand what it's like to be a single mom or a single parent trying to feed your kids on a Starbucks wage. And I wonder just why Starbucks doesn't think about living wage and fair wage in a way that would benefit its workers. I mean, I think companies are always going to put profit ahead of people. And unions are the only way to ensure that workers actually have a say in preventing that. Companies can always say that, you know, oh, we don't need a union, look at how great we're doing. But the bar is going to be as low as the industry sets it. And without unions, that bar has gotten lower and lower to the point that, you know, nothing is keeping pace with inflation. Um, you know, non-union competition within the restaurant industry means that margins are unlivably low. So it's not about being, you know, an individual bad actor or a good actor, although Starbucks is, of course, a bad actor. Um, but even good actors are still well below living wages because the entire industry is predicated on poverty wages. So I think that's where industrial unionism isn't a threat to the industry. It's the only way to actually make it sustainable and equitable and healthy for the public and for the workers. Because we've, we just organized a tiny cafe in Buffalo called Remedy House. And the owners there 
signed the fair election principles, recognized the union, and in bargaining, they were like, well, we're already paying better than most of the industry. Like, can you organize the competition and then you know, make them do better and then we can do better? And I think that's what a smart response from companies sure. would be. Yeah. Um, that, that makes so much sense. Now, I mean, if, if all companies could sort of follow that example, no matter what size, I think it would be so helpful. I think what's so exciting about what you and, and your, your, your colleagues have been able to do is create so much momentum in other you know, retail environments with Trader Joe's and Ben and & Jerry's. And I'm wondering if you can talk specifically about the Ben & Jerry's example, because that is an example that a lot of companies could look to. No, exactly. So um, for context, this code of conduct, the fair election principles, we've been trying to get companies to sign on to ranging from Nissan to Starbucks. Um, earlier this spring, the scoopers um, at the Ben & Jerry's scoop shop in Burlington, Vermont, their flagship retail store, reached out and they'd been dealing with um, you know, lack of training and lack of support around um, the opioid crisis in Burlington um, and like being able to engage people. No one had Narcan training. No one had you know, adequate de-escalation training. Um, management was you know, saying, oh, you can't have your tip jar on free cone day because we don't want people having to like, pull out cash. Um, and workers were like, that's our only source of you know, income on free cone day um, to supplement. And um, they organized you know, tell, saying explicitly the same things that we said at Starbucks. Like, we're doing this because we love our jobs, because we want to make Ben & Jerry's the best it can be. Um, and unlike Trader Joe's and <laughs> Starbucks, Ben & Jerry's responded by signing the fair election principles, which made them the first multinational company to do so, um, and, you know, saying, okay, we're going to bargain. Uh, we're currently in bargaining with them. And you know, they've said, okay, it's peace, love, and ice cream, that you, you can't fight a union and have peace, love, and ice cream. So I think there's hope for, you know, models that don't have yeah. to be um, wars, but... Yeah, it doesn't yes. have to be a war, and I, I think you said something very key, that baristas and scoopers and the folks who work at Trader Joe's, they love their jobs. Yes. They like working there. They like the camaraderie. They like their, their coworkers. Why make it a war zone when you could make it, you know, a, a more enjoyable place to work and to be, you know, a manager of or a corporate executive at, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, Howard Schultz has gone so far as to say that everyone who's organized a Starbucks was some kind of outside agitator because, you know, I had a union background, so therefore everyone else who was sympathetic to unions at Starbucks couldn't have just actually believed in what Starbucks claimed to have believed. They had to have been brought in from outside. Um, but I think, you know, the truth of the matter is almost every worker absent an anti-union campaign from a company would want to organize their workplace. Um, and people who don't care about their jobs aren't going to put the effort in. Right. So the people who are actually motivated to take the action to organize and to dedicate themselves to it are actually the people who care the most. Absolutely. In, in the few minutes we have left, I'm hoping you can give advice to two sets of people. One is workers who are seeing this momentum, especially in food, and, and want to make a difference. And then, so answer that first, and I'll, I'll ask my next question. So to that, I would say there's no unorganizable workplace. There's only workplaces that haven't been organized yet. If, you're, if you have a job, you need a union. <laughs> and woo, woo. I think you know, it's up to the labor movement to meet the needs of all of these workers and all of these workplaces that have been called unorganizable, too small, um, too precarious, too high turnover, whatever. They're, that's unacceptable. And I think whether it's you know, independent unions like Trader Joe's, um, you know, Team, the Chipotle Union of Teamsters had to call up a bunch of unions before they found one that would take them on. Um, but I think, you know, 
we have to build union density in this industry, and that's gonna take the entire labor movement working together both to organize and then to actually hold these companies accountable, you know? Um, Starbucks still hasn't paid any consequences. So my, my last question is, what's your advice for all of us? When I go to the airport tomorrow and my coffee choices are very <laughs> limited, do I boycott Starbucks? Do I tip the workers? What is it I should do? I think Starbucks, boycott Starbucks. Um, <laughs> there's, at some point we have to say, you know, line in the sand, you've gone too far, this isn't enough. Um, in Ithaca, New York, which was the first city in the country to have 100% union density across the Starbucks. There were three stores, all of them organized. Starbucks closed every store um, in retaliation for union organizing. And the Ithaca community, from the Cornell students to you know, the broader community, are saying if um, Starbucks is done with Ithaca, Ithaca is done with Starbucks. Um, but I think you know, broader, trying to help pe people organize. We had stores that organized because customers planted seeds in there, in people's minds about like, well, why aren't you union yet? And I think that's a good starting point. So that customer support is really, really yes. influential and empowering for both consumers and the baristas and other workers. Yes. That's great, that's great. Because it is teamwork, it needs collaboration, it needs all of us to be involved. Ja Jazz is my heroine and I can't tell you what it's like to meet somebody like her who is so young and so vibrant and doing such incredible work. So thank you so much for being here. You came a long way. Thank I'm you. Give you a hug. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. She's <laughs> great, right? <laughs> Um, it is now my honor to introduce someone I also admire, and that is U.S. Senator Dick Durbin. Please welcome him to the stage. What a pleasure. What you do? Running, I'm clumsy. Oh. <laughs> so let me introduce you briefly, Senator. Senator Durbin is the convener of Illinois' bipartisan congressional delegation and serves as the Senate Majority Whip. He also serves as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and sits on the Pro Appropriations and Agriculture Committees. Thank you so much for being here today. I am so glad that you are among us and able to share some of your thoughts with us today. Um, my first question, Senator, is I think, you know, when, when we're in Chicago, we forget that Illinois is an agricultural state. And I, I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the challenges that farmers, particularly here in Illinois, but across the country, are facing right now. Number one in soybeans, number one in pumpkins, number one, number two, sadly, in uh, corn uh, to the state of Iowa, a wonderful state. Senator Grassley reminds me of that every time I see him. <laughs> Most of our agriculture is row crops, uh, corn and soybeans which is a different world of agriculture than those who are growing specialty crops, that's for sure. The problem, of course, is risk. Are you going to have weather that's cooperative with you? Is the growing season going to be long enough? Uh, is the market going to be uh, rewarding enough to justify your investment? Uh, and what about the added cost that's coming your way by way of equipment and chemicals? So I have been engaged in this debate for a long time, uh, both as a member of the House and the Senate. And I can tell you there was a time when there were many unusual theories of agriculture, federal policy on agriculture. Parity was one of those, which mm -hmm. actually goes back to the 40s and before. Uh, there were actual apostles of parity who came making their appeal every time there was a farm bill. But what we've arrived at now is crop insurance as really the fundamental program for row crop agriculture. Now, let me quickly add that whenever you see the words federal and insurance in the same sentence, don't be misled. It is federal, but it's not necessarily insurance. Insurance, as you and I know it, is to pay on that policy for your automobile and to let the company collect enough money so if something terrible happens, they can compensate you for it the risk pool on insurance. The risk pool on federal crop insurance involves a 60% federal subsidy. So the farmer is going to pay premiums, but the premiums cover at most 40% of the cost of the insurance if he ever needs it. 
Having said that, I think it's still a sound start and has been the basis for our farm bills for a number of years and will continue to be. Uh, I could add a couple things. One of them I want to say to you quickly is, if you imagine in your mind a farmer sitting on a tractor or in one of those huge combines, get a photograph if you can. That's all changing. Go to John Deere's website and put in electrification and see what they envision for the future. Autonomous vehicles on the farm, guided by GPS and monitored by a computer in the old farmhouse where the wife, who's usually the smartest one of the bunch, not the hardest working, well, maybe the hardest working, but certainly the, the smartest one, <laughs> uh, is actually put in charge of the big technical decisions and probably is sitting at that computer managing the autonomous farm vehicles. That's in the near-term future, I think, for major agriculture. And wh what are your thoughts about that? What is your opinion? Is that the kind of agriculture you want to see? Well, I think it's inevitable. It's like saying, well, are you in favor of electric vehicles or against them? wait a minute, what, where do I get to vote and who's listening to how I vote? It's coming and it means uh, more profitability, it means major investments on the front end of it, but it's going to change the culture of farming quite a bit. Be fewer people directly involved in the operation as it moves along. Now in a way that's necessary. I'm chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee as you just heard. One of our major issues is immigration. I can't tell you how many different businesses and farms have come to me on the issue of immigration, saying they are desperate. They can't continue their operations without immigrants coming in and uh, reinforcing our workforce. For example, a woman who has a dairy farm in northwestern Illinois says to me in my office, I'm the fourth generation, my family, on this dairy farm. There will not be a fifth generation unless I have immigrant workers on this dairy farm. I've got to milk those cows twice a day, and I can't find local people to help. A woman said, well, let me add to that. I have an orchard in southern Illinois, and we grow great peaches. This is probably our last year. And don't tell me to go to the local town and hire the high school kids. I can't even get them to uh, man the air-conditioned fruit stand out by the highway. They have no interest in it. So when you look at the future of agriculture and see automation coming, it's almost inevitable because our immigration system is so broken. Senator, you mentioned youth and how they, they aren't going back to farms. Do you think this idea of having more technological advancements on farms would bring youth back to Illinois, Iowa, all over the Midwest? I hope so. Uh, but by and large, most people on the farm today are looking for the next opportunity, and most of them don't view farming as that opportunity. What used to be the, quote, family farm is now the corporate farm, much larger with many more people engaged in it. So it isn't like the old days when dad or your grandfather were leading the farming operations. It's a big corporate enterprise. I, I want to come back to sort of what you started off talking about with, you know, what, what is grown in Illinois and, and across the Midwest. But before I do that, last year President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act which designated a lot of money uh, for farmers and rural households. And I'm wondering what you think it means for farmers who are right now on the front lines of the climate crisis here in Illinois. So I had this little exercise in my office in Washington. Every year, except for the COVID years, I have a visit from the major farm organizations. The biggest one in Illinois is the Farm Bureau. Maybe represented here, I'm not sure. I hope you are. And the Farm Bureau would come in, and it usually was a meeting that was very predictable. They are the nicest people on earth, full stop. They are courteous to a fault, and they would never vote for a Democrat, well, most Democrats, <laughs> under, under any circumstance. But it was always a good meeting. And there would be a ring, an inner ring, of about a dozen farm uh, owners, men, in their suits with white shirts and ties. Seated behind them were their wives, spouses, with purses on their laps in a Sunday dress. The men would do all the talking. Thank God that has changed, because as I said earlier, the women are a major part of agriculture. And so I started as a kind of a, just an exercise, uh, maybe 10 years ago in my office saying, I have a question for all of you. How many of you believe that with all the extreme weather that we're witnessing, 
and the changes in temperature and all the things associated with it, that it has anything to do with human activity. Not a single hand went up. I thought to myself, no one here believes it has anything to do with what we're doing? No. I asked that question several years in a row and got the same response, no response. And I finally, in desperation, said to this one farmer who looked like a great fellow, I said, explain to me, all of this is happening, what's going on? Well, Senator, some years God sends me a drought, some years God sends me a flood. I take whatever he sends me. So that's where it stood for a while, and then it started changing. And it probably, I guess, seven years ago, six years ago, I get an occasional hand saying, I'm not sure. But the conversation was really being engaged, and they were starting to see the obvious around them. Things are changing. We have, on average, 54 tornadoes a year in the state of Illinois, 54. I grew up here. Getting up in the middle of the night, mom rousting you out of bed and saying, we're going to the basement to sleep on a spare bed. Anybody ever had that experience? Uh, okay, welcome back to the Midwest. That was a reality. It was kind of an adventure for a kid. We never got hit by a tornado, thank God. But it was a little scary moment there until you fell, fell asleep. So now those 54 a year tornadoes, so far this year, so far, we've had 97 tornadoes in the state of Illinois. Uh, and they are no longer confined largely to summer months. They're year round. Things are changing and you just can't avoid seeing it. So I've noticed more and more interest in conversations about uh, climate, environment, and agriculture. I would say that the farm community, by and large, is reluctant to engage in the conversation because they're always suspicious of too much government interference in their lives and costing them profitability. But they're starting to listen. This notion of precision agriculture, which some of you may be familiar with, is really trying to take the information that you've stored in your computer, linking it up with the GPS signal from the ground for the planting and chemicals that are used in farming to reduce overhead costs and to be more effective. So it's coming, and it's coming slowly. For example, most of you know the story of Franklin Roosevelt deciding to extend electricity to farms across America. It was transformative. It changed the farmer's life overnight. I grew up in politics, still talking to people who remembered the day and remembered the night, the first night that they had electricity and electric lights in the farmhouse. It was a, just a life-changing event. So FDR made it work because he created the electric cooperatives and he extended electricity into rural and small town America. Now we're dealing with a similar challenge when it comes to Wi-Fi, broadband. Right. These farms have got to have that access too. Joe Biden's bill that you mentioned earlier invested in that and will continue to. It's a good investment. And we're also in a situation here where we've got to th start thinking about the future and what it means for agriculture and the cultivation of crops and the way that they're grown. That's happening. I can see that happening. I said to this one farmer, I want to tell you a story. I said, I went into business last year in Springfield, Illinois. He said, Senator, what kind of business do you go into? I said, I generate electricity. He said, how do you do that? I said, I'm the roof of my house. I'm the first one in the neighborhood to have solar panels on the roof of my house. And I said, my electric bill has gone from $120 a month to $20 a month. And that's the amount I contribute to help others pay their bills if they can't make it. I said, this is coming. Would you ever consider it for your farm? I'd consider it, he said. I have a hog operation, and I run fans 24-7. But he says, my problem is the electric co-op isn't geared for net metering yet. So what I'm presenting to you is a challenge for all of us to think of extending the possibility of solar panels and sustainable renewable energy sources means rethinking some of the roles of basic entities like electric co-ops. There is change underway in this state. I think it's going to come. And I think the people who engage in it and show that they can be a winning hand are going to convince their neighbors to do the same. Yeah, farmers are risk adverse because they've had to be you mentioned you know, this idea of, of infrastructure that's really needed, whether it's broadband or, or getting the, the electric 
cooperatives to change, but I'm also wondering if you're hearing from the farmers that you speak with, they see what's happening with the weather. Uh, you mentioned the top crops that Illinois grows when you started talking. Are they thinking about diversification and growing more kinds of resilient crops? We're at a, at a summit about you know, helping people gain access to healthy, affordable foods. Soybeans, corn, those aren't the things that are actually nourishing people. They nourish livestock. They largely do, although there are applications for both in general uh, family consumption as well. I don't sense that there is going to be a, a move towards specialty crops. They have their own risk associated with them. My wife and I visit friends up in Leelanau Peninsula in Michigan. Some of you know that area up there. The cherry crop is beautiful to behold, but in many years it just doesn't work. When it works, it's great. So there's risk associated with that as well, and a front-end investment and a delay in the return that slows them down. Plus, the row crop has created a lifestyle. The farmers in row crop farming are busier than hell for several weeks, planting several weeks, cultivating several weeks, harvesting. But their lifestyle is not a 24-7 commitment. Dairy farms are a different story. Milk that cow twice a day, it's a 24-7 commitment. So there'd be some lifestyle choices associated with changing crops. I hope it comes. I'd like to see more diversity in fruits and vegetables. Sure. Thank you, Senator. I want to go back to the farm bill, which you mentioned earlier. And I, I'm hoping you can give me a sense of best case scenario or worst case scenario. I can speak only about the Senate. I do not understand what the hell is going on in the House. <laughs> We're in good shape in the Senate for two reasons. Deb, Debbie Stabenow and John Bozeman. Debbie Stabenow, Democratic Senator from Michigan, is good. No, she's very good. And she has successfully uh, engineered a farm bill through several years ago. Uh, there's just nobody better, and she's thrown herself heart and soul into the enterprise. And she's announced her retirement. Now, as tough as politics may be, there's a soft spot in our heart for somebody who's leaving, and we want them to leave on a high note which means with a farm bill. Lucky for her, her partner in this process is John Bozeman, conservative from Arkansas and a real gentleman who works with her to put a bill together. I have confidence sitting on that committee that we will pass a farm bill. We will get it through in the Senate. God only knows what's going to happen in the House. I just can't tell you. I hope for the best. Uh, failing to pass a farm bill would be disastrous. Any thoughts on what the Farm Bill will mean for access and affordability for consumers, especially in urban areas, but also in rural areas, which face a lot of uh, food security challenges? You remember that part of the debate over the debt ceiling was the uh, eligibility for food stamps? An agreement was reached, and I think we came out ahead on it. Uh, we agreed to some limitations in terms of food stamps, but we expanded the category of eligibility to include, for example, veterans and people with disabilities. So I think the net impact is to expand the reach of food stamps and SNAP program. And the announcement was made by the president and those who were engaged in it, for at least from the Democratic side, end of the story on SNAP. For the two years ahead of us, this is going to be done uh, according to this formula, and we're not going to renegotiate it. The Republicans wanted to restrict uh, SNAP eligibility uh, and I think, I hope they got the message that isn't going to happen. Having said that, if the Speaker of the House, his tenure as Speaker is at stake, God only knows what he's going to do. That's, that's unfortunate to hear, but we, we understand the, the difficult uh, situation in Washington right now. I, I want to go back a few years because in 2011, the Food uh, Safety Modernization Act, which you authored, was signed into law. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain why that act was so critical and how sort of the food safety landscape has changed over the last 10 plus years. So in my callow youth, working my way through college, <laughs> I worked in a slaughterhouse in East St. Louis, Illinois for 12 months. I saw firsthand what meat production looks like. It's not a pretty scene and it's not an easy job. It's hotter than hell, uh, it's loud, People get hurt, seriously hurt on the job, uh, and it's a sobering experience, some of the aspects of that. I also came to know the U.S. Department of Agriculture inspectors who were on the scene with their white coats and white helmets, standing around watching things that may have been suspect. 
I'm not going to take anything away from them. We have one of the safest food supplies in the world. But having said that, the laws involving food inspection are crazy. Crazy. For example, if you have a pizza with sausage on it, it's responsibility of the USDA. If it's a cheese pizza, FDA. Broken eggs, one agency. Whole eggs, another agency. Madness, just total madness to try to understand how you would sort that out. So part of our responsibility with this modernization was to try to move forward with something that made sense in inspection and didn't protect little bailiwicks and kingdoms that are exist existing at the federal level. My partner in this, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut. Many of you know her name. She is terrific, and she's been a great ally of mine over the years. Now, I would say the bill passed, the concepts were agreed to, but they have not been implemented at the pace that I'd hoped for. I think we can do a lot better. We can have better food inspection. And the FDA is now assuming a role about in the area of food, which goes on, goes way beyond basic inspection. We hope this is a portent of good things to come because food illnesses are still a serious problem. Rosa herself almost died as a child because of food contamination. So she tells that story very effectively when we're in negotiation. Thank you. Thanks for the update. I think it's important that people understand that FDA is trying to reform its human foods program and really make those changes that are necessary so that we can all eat better and healthier and, and more safely. Um, in, in our last few minutes here, um, I, I heard from your staff last week that something uh, that is close to my heart is also close to your heart, and that's reducing food waste. And I'm wondering what strategies you've seen and what sort of recommendations you have for the private sector, many of whom are in the room today, about reducing food waste. Because for, for a lot of us, it's, it's not just a moral challenge, it's also an environmental challenge. I want to get into answering that directly, but starting at a different uh, spot, if you will. One of my other passions has been the school lunch program. I don't know how many of you remember it or are familiar with it, but you ought to go to a school cafeteria and watch what's happening at lunchtime. I can remember a few years ago going to a brand new high school here in Chicago, Westinghouse College Prep. They couldn't wait to show off the computer lab, and they couldn't wait to show off, and, it, and rightfully proud they were of what they achieved. As we were leaving, I said, I'd like to walk through the cafeteria. I could tell the principal was a little uneasy with my decision. And she said, why? I said, I want to see what's for lunch today. The entrees for lunch were corn dogs and pizza slices. The vegetable, the vegetable, thank goodness there was a vegetable, tater tots. <laughs> I said to her, how is this chosen? Well, that's what the kids want. Maybe true. As parents and grandparents, we know that the kids will gravitate, gravitate towards junk food unless they learn differently and are conditioned to think about food differently. If you watched in most of these school cafeterias, even the bad lunches, most of which uh, were served, were thrown away in the trash can, more than half the food. I'd look at that and think, my God, it's not only bad to start with, they're throwing it away as part of it, so it's food waste. And the obvious question for us is, is there an alternative? Luke, where are you? Luke Saunders, are you here? He's here somewhere. He's here somewhere. <laughs> Luke Saunders runs a company named Farmer's Fridge, you probably know. And I was just asking him about what they do with the returns from Farmer's Fridge. I wish he could tell the story because he'd be more effective at it. But it turns out that the returns are first still fresh and usable for some applications, like through the Chicago Food Depository, one of the best. Kate Mayer, is she here? Well, Kate's, Kate's my buddy. She's one of the best, too but they reduce, they're consciously reducing the waste that comes with it. I think we don't have an alternative. I live in a condo here in a big old house in Springfield. In the condo here, there's a trash chute. What do you put in the trash chute? Whatever you have. Food waste, something that isn't quite recyclable. And we're just throwing away organic entities which are becoming part of landfills and creating problems in years to come. Uh, we've got to be more thoughtful about it. I went to one community where they had a compost collection uh, unit. Uh, any of you live in communities with that? Where are you from? 
Oak Park? In Evanston. In Evanston. As an aside, I once said that if the entire state of Illinois consisted of Oak Park and Evanston, I could go to bed election night at 7.05 and sleep like a baby. <laughs> Thank you for what you did. <laughs> we need more of it. I don't know what you, your ultimate process is, but we've got to be thoughtful about this as well. Thank you, Senator Durbin. I think that's a great point to end on. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, and thank you for your service to this country at a very difficult time. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, Senator. Yes, hope you feel better. Thank you. Right now, if my mom, Joyce Nierberg, is watching, she's very proud that I got to talk to Senator Urban. So um, we are now going to turn to our next conversation on food access and affordability. But before we do that, I want to play two videos from U.S. Congressmember Brad Schneider, who represents Illinois' 10th district, and U.S. Congressmember Sean Kasten, who represents the state's 6th congressional dif district. Sorry. While those play, I'd like to invite our panelists to join us on stage. Please welcome Sam Acho, an ESPN sports analyst, NFL veteran, and author. My husband's really jealous that I'm the one meeting him again today. Uh, Haven Leeming, the senior program officer at Builders Vision. Liz Moran Stelk, the executive director for the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Dr. David Nyack, a farmer at Nyack Farms. And our moderator, who you saw earlier today, Monica Ang from Axios. Hello and welcome to the Empowering Eaters Summit in Chicago. I'm Congressman Brad Schneider and I represent the northern suburbs of Chicago from Willette north to the Wisconsin border and from the Lake Michigan Lakefront in Waukegan to the rolling hills and farmland in McHenry. It's my great honor to be with you, even if only virtually. First, a special thank you to Food Tank, to the Biden Harris White House, Farmer's Fridge and the UN Global Compact Midwest USA for holding this summit to talk about one of the most critical issues facing Illinois and our nation, hunger and food insecurity. In the richest nation in the world, maybe in history, it is unconscionable how many American families suffer from hunger. We need to meet the White House goal to end food insecurity in America by 2030. It's critical that we address the hurdles in providing affordable and healthy food options and empower consumers to make healthy food choices. I'm proud to be working on this in Congress and at home. And I will continue to do all that I can in Congress to make sure that no one in America goes hungry. Together, we can make the goal of a hunger-free America a reality. We're counting on you. Thank you and have a great conference. Hey, Sean Kasten here, uh, Congressman Sean Kasten from the 6th District, and thank you so much for having me, but more importantly, thank you for having this conference. Um, this, has been, um, this has been so long coming, and frankly, we still have so much more work to do. Now, I'm, I'm remembering long before I ever thought about getting into Congress, I was in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs Emerging Leader Program and had the privilege to get to know Kate Mayer, who at the time, I think still is the president of the Chicago Food Depository. We were all sort of teaching each other about what we did, and I remember Kate sort of trying to explain to all of us how much the food bank system is, it finds it so difficult to provide complete and nutritional food because the when you depend on charity, you get the food that people are willing to give, not necessarily the food you need. Um, fast forward a few years, uh, as my wife and I were taking our daughters to go work at local food pantries, we would try to teach them and say, as you go around, as you help people shop for food here, try to, try to see what's not in this food bank that we get at the grocery store all the time. And invariably, it was fresh produce and staples that were so hard to get. I realize I'm preaching to the choir in this room, but these are such long-lasting, durable problems. And I tell you that story only because when COVID hit, all of us, not just me, not just the folks at the food banks, were keenly aware that we were going to have a huge surge in need, that we had these difficulties providing nutritious meals for people who had that need. And also, I mean, let's not memory hold this stuff. Remember there were those stories about massive waste on the farms, pork farms that had to slaughter huge numbers of their pigs because they got too big to go through the processing facilities. Dairies that were geared up to provide school lunches that all of a sudden were providing the wrong portion size as schools had to shut down and go remote, dumping huge millions of gallons of milk. That was all a real thing, right? 
And so we set up the TFAP program, we in Congress set up the TFAP program, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, to provide fully complete nutritional assistance direct from farmers to, to families in need. And it made such a huge difference was going during COVID, I remember working a shift up at the, the Northern Illinois Food uh, Bank up in, out in Aurora, and we're packing these boxes and saying, everything that I remember was over. We were actually had produce, we had all the staples, we had this whole complete meal. It made such a huge difference. And that program expired, um, as all our COVID programs expired. And last June, when my wife and I were volunteering over at the, the People's Resource Center in Westmont, I was expecting to see such a difference, and yet, and sadly, there's still a lot of need, but there was still a complete meal, and the reason that happened was because Illinois, the state of Illinois, continued that program. So Illinois is now continuing these programs, made it permanent, um, which is great in Illinois, but not everybody lives in Illinois. And so we still have the work left to do. Um, we are pushing now um, with Kim Schreier from Washington, to, to get her Eat Healthy Act um, through. There's an acronym, but don't ask me to remember what it stands for, but would basically take that good work we did during COVID, the good work that was then emulated by the state of Illinois, and make that a permanent part of our food system to help make sure that farmers have access to markets, that local farmers get to local markets, and that, that families in need, which all of us are one, you know, one bad letter, one unfortunate injury away from, from having that be us, right? but to make sure that those families and needs are helped as well. So thank you again for, for elevating these issues, for fighting for them, and know that you've always got a champion in our office. All right, thanks, Sean Caston. Hi, I'm Monica Ang, filling in for Natalie Moore. Thank you guys for all being so patient. I know this has been a long day, but we've got a really exciting panel following other exciting panels with folks who are working on affordability and accessibility in food, such important issues. I'd ask you all to please introduce yourselves and tell us a, a short bit about you so we know who you are. Let's start down the line with Sam. So my name is Sam Macho. I'm a, a nine-year NFL veteran, uh, ESPN analyst, author, speaker, and I got a chance to um, spend some time in Chicago with the Bears and partner with some young entrepreneurs on the west side of Chicago to build a food mart in a food desert. So that's kind of why I'm here. Uh, but also the cool part about that opportunity is that the thing that was before, like my previous career, my NFL career, uh, my job title, my resume, opened up the door for my real impact. And so that's what brought me to the stage. Great. Haven? Hi, everyone. I am Haven Leaving. I am a senior program officer at Builders Vision. That's an impact office located here in Chicago. We use investing and philanthropy and advocacy to realize a more healthy and humane planet. And I lead all of our food grant making. That's been hyper-local here in Chicago, so I work to use my grant dollars to increase access to and consumption of healthy food. Um, a nice connection is that the program Sam knows about is something that I have funded and worked with before. Nice, Liz. Uh, hello, I'm Liz Moran Stelka. I serve as the executive director of the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. We are an alliance of farmers and eaters who use our voices and our choices to shape a more just and regenerative food system. Uh, we have to organize to build the power to hold decision makers accountable at every level to change the food system. David. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Dave Nyack. I'm a physician uh, and also of Nyack Farms in Gardner, Illinois. Uh, we are a small family farm, but we're, no, we're one of the largest growers of sweet corn. Raise your hand if you guys like sweet corn. Yay. Okay, so what I realized is that those who are food insecure also love sweet corn too. And access to fresh produce like sweet corn and other specialty crops is a big passion of mine, and we're one of the largest donors of sweet corn to the hungry in the state of Illinois in the Midwest. All right, and all of you have like unique stories about how you personally affect food affordability and accessibility. Let's start at this end, Dr. Nyack. Great, so we at Nyack Farms are committed to providing fresh specialty produce to those who are hungry, and our produce is very good. I am a firm believer that those who are most in need really deserve the best, and so I am very grateful to have partnered uh, under the White House, uh, we were one of the first people to commit last year uh, for feeding Illinois and the Midwest a million people 
uh, over the next few years of our delicious sweet corn and our green beans. And so we've been using our semi-trucks and our wonderful people who work on our farm to deliver and work with the Illinois food banks, the food pantries, as well as community gardens and churches to deliver throughout the state. So even today, uh, our farm delivered 22 tons of corn down in Carbondale, Illinois, and in Champaign, Illinois. Wow, and we're at the height of sweet corn season right now? We are, we've been very blessed that uh, the drought were, did not affect us. We got that huge batch of rain about four weeks ago, and we are literally swimming in corn. Coming out of your ears, but on bum All right, um, Liz, tell us about your work. Yeah. Um, so we all raised our hand that we love sweet corn because we do, of course, but sweet corn isn't everything that's grown here in Illinois. There's lots of corn and beans that um, are, are not the kind that we love to eat on a summer in fact, evening. Less than 1% is sweet corn. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so what we're interested in at the Stewardship Alliance is a just transition from uh, an industrial food system with a sea of corn and beans to one that is a vibrant, local, regenerative food system where Illinois farmers can feed Illinois, and we have huge opportunity to be able to do that. We have Chicago, a major metropolitan area, that, and yet in Illinois, we grow 23 million acres of uh, agricultural production, but we can't feed ourselves. We import 90 to 95% of all the food that we eat here. And um, so what we're interested in is figuring out how do we break down the barriers to build a vibrant local food system? And many of those barriers are policy barriers and toward affordability and access. We're interested in, in um, the adv advocating for the kinds of policies that make sure that this local food system that we're all excited about, farmers markets and um, food co-ops, that, that they are affordable and not just uh, food for the haves and that um, we have SNAP, Match, and other initiatives to make local food more affordable. And SNAP, Match, uh, it's, as I understand it, is um, it's also called Link Up Illinois in Illinois, where there are private and USDA dollars that will match dollar for dollar um, your money at farmers markets um, if you're a SNAP user. Wonderful, wonderful program that really like feeds into um, supporting local farmers and also getting fresh produce on people's plates. Haven. And that's a really good transition going from the grower side of things to the actual eater side of things. So most of my philanthropy and grant making is around once the food is grown, how does it actually get to people? And how does it get to people who are low income and people who have traditionally very low access to food? Um, so my work is to go into those neighborhoods and honestly find the leaders who are speaking with you today and ask them, how can I get you dollars to realize your impact? So Erica, we had Dion, we had Liz. These are all folks who are working on food access programs in their neighborhoods and saying, we need the dollars, we need the investment to be able to serve our communities. Um, so my goal and, and where philanthropy can fit in is to do the listening and then to get the dollars where they need to go. Um, the other thing when we think about um, uh, food access and affordability is you do have to think about what do we do to make that food affordable. So I do also fund Link Up Illinois. It's one way to make sure that healthy food that our Illinois farmers grow can get to market and be cheaper and more affordable for folks. Yeah, and to Haven's point about uh, the listening, we were talking off stage. I didn't realize that um, Haven and I were connected. And sometimes I don't think we realize that until we actually start doing work, right? I, so I started a nonprofit called Athletes for Justice, essentially uniting everyday athletes, collegiate athletes, professional athletes, weekend warriors around causes in their communities. And a few years ago during COVID, the height of COVID, height of um, George Floyd was killed and Ahmaud Arbery was killed and the world stood still. Some athletes in Chicago got together and said, what if we could do something? And obviously we have, you know, physical capital, right? Like we can go and push something over or throw a football, right? But it was like, what if we, we talked to a nonprofit leader, they said, what if you just listened to the kids in our communities? We all have these great ideas, but no one's listening to us. And so this group of people with influence all got together and listened. Then after we listened, we took a step. We actually took a tour of one of the communities in Chicago, Austin, on the west side. And we discovered a food desert. And the long and short of it is, and I talk about this in, in my book, which actually is, is down front after we're done. What's um, it called? It's called Change Starts With You, Following Your Fire to Heal a Broken World. 
And the cool part about it is that we had this fire of like, what if we could do something? I don't, I don't know food outside of loving to eat it um, and using it as like fuel for my body. But we said, what if we could actually turn one of these liquor stores that we saw in this food desert into a food mart? And the cool part, of it, part, of, part about it is that we did. We followed these young entrepreneurs and we did that. But what's even cooler is that Haven and I were sitting backstage. She said, hey, I funded that. <laughs> And so my point, yeah, you can do a round of applause, yeah, for, yeah. The applause should go to the kids. <laughs> yeah, but like the, the, the point is, a lot of us here in this room have dreams, or we've been working towards something, we haven't seen the final output. Well, you may be sitting next to the person who is the final output. And so like my encouragement would be to keep on dreaming, uh, keep on believing, keep on conversing, keep on listening, but as we all kind of need to transform a little bit, go from listening, like Haven did, to actioning. That'd be my, that'd be my input. All right. Um, and so all of you have sort of, you're looking at this issue from different points of view. And from that point of view, what, what is the biggest challenge, uh, like the number one challenge we need to tackle to make food more, ex good food, more accessible and affordable? Well, I could chime in here. I think that from our perspective uh, as a farmer, what we're doing is not easy. Input costs are high. Inflationary headwinds have remained to where the farmer's uh, balance sheet is very difficult to become profitable. But I do know this. Farmers are one of the most generous people on the planet. And that if they have that incentivization from the financial side to take a small portion of their yield and give back to those who are most in need, they're absolutely going to do it. And that's what we're doing at Nyack Farms. We are trying to be that leader in the community to say, look, we can grow a specialty crop that's not really grown that much, right? We're can we tell people, does everybody know what a specialty crop is? It's a crop you can eat. Okay. So in Illinois, we're, as Senator Durbin said, we're known for corn and beans, but the commercial corn... But not yet, not, a, not edible ones. Right, right, exactly right. We can't eat that type of corn that's gone really more to fuel, fuel and feed for animals, uh, and the soybeans as well. So specialty crops are, are crops that we can eat and that you see in the grocery store. And so it's not easy to harvest these crops too. So for example, on our farm, we have a specialty corn picker. It's not like those eight row combines that you see. It goes down a single row and it's pulled by a large tractor and then we put it in a bin. From the bin we get it to the pallets and then we load it in our semi trucks and then we need the truck drivers to get it to the food banks and to the food pantries. That costs quite a bit of money, logistics as well as labor and then the materials too. So what we do need to create is incentive to the farmers to give back because they will do that if they have the right incentives. And are you going to tell us a little later about the incentive that may be in Springfield soon? I'm, I'm excited to, to touch on our okay. policy that we're very passionate Stay about. Stay tuned, because you're going to hear about it. Um, other, other big uh, uh, challenges to making food, you know, I, you know and, and paying the farmer, you know, what the food costs to actually grow, and not cheating the farmer or cheating the animal. How do you do that? What are the big, what are the big challenges? So we've certainly grown an incredibly efficient and effective um, infrastructure in Illinois to move the corn and beans that David was describing. But what has happened over the last couple of decades is a real hollowing out of the infrastructure that it's going to take to move specialty crops and to process grain and to process livestock so that people can eat it. And so if we want to have a thriving, vibrant local food system here in Illinois and in Chicago, we are going to have to rebuild all of that infrastructure. And one of the things I'm really excited about. Can I, can I pause for it? So when you say infrastructure, you mean slaughterhouses, you mean cooling facilities, you mean um, transportation facilities that have all, with the big corporatization, kind of vanished for the smaller farmers. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly like that. Um, and for a variety of reasons, whether it's and economies mills. of scale, but also, you know, corporate consolidation in food, which has been massive and which the Biden administration has been trying to take efforts. And they've been stopped along the way trying to, t you know, take on antitrust and consolidation in the market. But it, that stuff is so essential at the same time as we're rebuilding that infrastructure that it's going to take. One of the, and, you know, to specialty crops, right? You can't just there's a lot of specialty crops that in order to move them, they're gonna to have to be basically processed. 
you know, not necessarily made into a new food item, like say tomatoes into salsa, but tomatoes into say frozen or something that can be moved more sustainably, right? And that's gonna last a little bit longer. And um, so one of the things I'm so excited about is that you know, Illinois, just this year, the, the General Assembly passed um, a $2 million budget um, investment in local food infrastructure to actually move food, you know, start to rebuild that infrastructure. And that comes at the perfect time because USDA and the state of Illinois and many other states joined into a cooperative agreement to purchase $28 million in the next two years of local food from underserved farmers, so farmers of color, and getting that food to communities in need. And so um, there really is a moment where folks have realized that we, it's essential that we rebuild the local, the real food security that we need here in Illinois and around the country. Yeah, and I think people are seeing that need to rebuild, but we still are seeing around for the growers and then also in getting the food to eaters is a market failure at this point. We have a food system that's artificially inflated by the farm bill at this point. It is not necessarily going to our specialty crop growers. Um, and we also see a market in which grocery stores are abandoning low access, often black and brown neighborhoods. This is really a failure of, of the markets. And so where I come in, I think about philanthropy. Philanthropy can't actually fix that market right now, but what we can do is we can, do, we can use our power and leverage all the philanthropy we can to try and change those policies, to try and make sure that the, US, the assembly can have that two million to give to, to Illinois growers. Um, we can try and bring other um, private investments into the system as much as we can. Um, we can support Ruby um, and the Chicago Equity Council as they try and get dollars out to those entrepreneurs. Um, but that big challenge is that market failure. And I would say the biggest challenge or, or problem, at least that I see, is this idea of like disintegration. So like, it's almost like we all have these great ideas and dreams and goals, and we're all trying to do them alone. And there's a proverb that says like, anyone who isolates himself um, it rages against sound judgment. Right? It's not wise to try and just do it alone. You need a team, a group of people. And so when I think of problems, I think about disintegration. I think about solutions. I think about alignment. And I think about integrity. I think about, man, Haven, what do you need for your team to help them win? We were talking backstage about, hey, can I connect you with someone I know who's a grower and wants to? And she's like, man, I do this work and I'd love to. Like, I think that's what wins. And that's what works, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what field you're in, no matter what title you have or hold, uh, selfishness kind of sometimes tears us apart. And I think when you get back to being like a person of integrity, a person who's hold, right, this integer, this whole number, um, I think that's when change really happens. It's like someone working as a hotshot athlete who wants to uh, show off versus working as a team. Well, it's to that point, Monica. So I, 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 I retired two years ago, right? So I, I'm, I know I'm look young, right? You don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> Uh, but, but I went to my first training camp practice since I finished playing. And it was, it was almost like a death in so many ways, guys. Like I, 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 this thing that I used to do when I used to love in this group, I couldn't do it anymore. And yes, it was sad for me. And it was also sad, right? A friend of mine, former player had passed away, right? He was struggling with some things and uh, some of our teammates felt like we weren't there for him, right? So that was sad. But also there was some hope. And the hope was seeing this team, this group of people different backgrounds, different races, different faiths, different everything coming together for a common goal. And I missed that. Like I got a chance to do that at the highest level, right? Professional athlete, and it was like everything else goes aside besides this one goal. And our goal was to win a Super Bowl or go to the playoffs or whatever, right? The, the paychecks are great, but that goal is better. And so one thing I wonder is like, what is our common goal? Like, what would that look like? Because I'm craving that. Like, if you've never experienced that idea of being on an actual team, there's nothing better. Like, when I saw Austin Harvest open up, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, when Austin Harvest opened up that food mart that used to be a, 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 a liquor store, like, that was one of the best days of my entire life. And I've played national championship football games before. And I think that's why these kinds of conferences are so important, because we can make these connections, say, oh, this guy can help you. Oh, I've done this before, let me help you. Tell me something you're excited about, something positive that you're excited about. Let's start with Dr. Nyack. Great. Uh, I'm excited about a lot of things, one of which is being here today. Uh, but 
I am, I, I'm really passionate that food is medicine. I'm qualified as a physician to say something like this because I run a free clinic and many, if not all of my patients reside in food apartheid. And no matter what I do, without access to fresh food, these diet-related diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol are not gonna go away. And I also have a unique perspective of being a farmer too. So what am I excited about? I'm excited about motivating other farmers to do what I'm doing. And the only way that we can really do that is to incentivize them. So I wrote the Illinois Farmers Who Fight Hunger Act. What it's gonna do is create a tax credit system of up to $2,000 for other farmers who donate directly to the food banks. The food banks are wonderful institutions that can leverage a meal for 10 cents. One meal for 10 cents. And as you know, Illinois has a ton of farmers. And if only 10% of these farmers in our wonderful state give back to the food banks up to $2,000, we can create 100 million new meals annually. Just wrap your heads around that. 100 million new meals annually. And it won't cost our state much money at all. And so these are the types of policies that I'm creating to incentivize and leveraging what our wonderful state has to offer is farming. And so I hope to lead by example and that we can encourage other farmers and that we can get this bill passed through the Illinois legislature next season. All right, Liz. Um, well, I am excited about the potential that public procurement could have in shifting the food system. Um, so in Chicago, Chicago passed the good food purchasing policy. It has the potential to shift $300 million a year in food spending toward uh, five key values, healthy, local, sustainable, humane, and fair. That is so exciting. And yeah. And so um, in the Farm Bill, there are proposals to have the federal dollars do that same values-based procurement. And there's uh, resources now for schools to do the same kind of values-based procurement because although uh, public procurement is not a silver bullet, like it's not gonna change the, the whole food system, it is a bridge to the future kind of just and local and vibrant and sustainable and regenerative food system that we need. All right, thanks, Haven. Uh, I does deserve an applause. Um, I'm excited of all of the work that's here in Chicago. We are here today, some of you traveled in, but a lot of you are from Chicago. Um, I am continually excited by all of the good work that is happening here and the people who you heard speak today. So I'm excited by Erica. Go down to UGC, go and see the farm. I'm excited at Growing Home down in Englewood. Go and see how they're growing, go and see their workforce development program. And while you're at it, drive a few blocks and go grab food at the Go Green Racine um, Fresh Market, which is a market that the Englewood community built um, and is now one of the only fresh food providers in Englewood after Whole Foods had left. Go shop there. Um, go and see Experimental Station and talk about what Link Up is doing in Illinois to make our dollars go yeah, farther. Um, these are all awesome projects happening right here in Chicago. Um, and while you're at it, um, let's try and get them as much money as they can. So, <laughs> <laughs> Talk to your philanthropy friends. Sam? I'm excited about Danielle. And the reason why I say that and you'll hear in a, in a second, you saw right before this is, um, I got a chance to chat with someone who, who knew Danielle way back when. Dude named Scott, Scott, if you mind standing up for a second. Scott's like, hey, I'm a nobody, um, which you're somebody now, right? I'm kidding, um, you've always been a somebody. Um, but Scott said, I said, man, he's like, how'd you get connected with Danielle? I was like, dude, I need to find out how to get more connected with her. He's like, I, was like, I said, tell me about her. You can sit down, Scott, you don't have to, I don't want your legs to get tired. Um, <laughs> He said, she's been doing this her entire life. It's like, I've known her, I don't think it was since college, maybe it was before, after, I don't know, but he's like, she's been, this is who she is. And so like this event has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and like senators are showing up, because of her. And so what I get excited about is like, who can be the next Danielle for their community? Whose dreams are like right there, like on the precipice of giving like birth, coming to fruition, that it just takes like one person 
to make it happen. So you ask me what I get most excited about, it's the fact that like, I was here last year and look how much it's grown. Who knows what's gonna be next year? And then even better, who knows what's gonna happen when someone in this room takes that dream that's been put in their heart and actually like takes a step of faith. Because then when that happens, people start showing up and people who felt like they were nobodies become somebody. So that's what I, I get super, super excited about. All right, my, my bosses at Axios said that end every presentation with, if you took one thing from this presentation, it should be. So in the next 30 seconds, everybody, if you take one thing from this presentation, what do you want them to take from it? Uh, for me, I, I always have this saying, you know, if, if I can't do great things, I can do small things in great ways. And continue to believe that what you're doing, even on a small community level, it is making a difference. Great. Uh, at the Alliance, we use our voices and our choices. So buy local, sustainable, healthy, uh, as much as you can, whenever you can. But also, you've got to use your voice. So get connected to an organization that is organizing to change policy, like Illinois Stewardship Alliance, ilstewards.org. All right. <laughs> nice. Uh, for me, uh, it's that the community is doing this work. And they've been doing this work for a very long time. Go learn about them. Go fund them. And for me, it would be um, the fact that, and I'm going to steal this from you, Haven. I don't want to like, go into detail, but we are one. Period. So you see someone struggling on the street or lack of food access, we are one. It could Amen be your sister, that. your brother, we're one. So that would be my, that'd be my note. Thank you so much, Sam, Haven, Liz, David. Give it up. I can't get through any food tank summit without crying, so here it is. Um, thank you to that panel. Thank you to Monica. Um, Sam Acho is an extraordinary human being, but he's a little bit wrong because I stand on the shoulders of giants. There are so many, especially women, in this movement who have come before me who have taught me so much. So I, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and I hope that anyone who comes after us realizes that those people came before. So I'm just here standing in for all of the heroines and heroes that I have been able to know and meet throughout my life. But I also want to make sure everyone knows, and, and my good friend Scott Hubbard, who is an extraordinary human being, held up Sam Macho's book. It's called Change Starts With You, Following Your Fire to Heal a Broken World. It's a great book about becoming a leader to inspire others and healing your own community, which is why I think we're all here today. You can find Sam in this room and buy a copy from him. He is an amazing human, and I'm so glad he was able to be here today. So another round of applause for that panel, please. <laughs> While I get myself together. <laughs> We're now going to show two videos uh, shared with us by U.S. Congress member Robin Kelly, who serves the con 2nd Congressional District of Illinois, and Milwaukee Mayor Cavalier Johnson. And while those videos play, I'd like to invite the speakers for our final panel conversation. It's a final panel, but you're not going anywhere. There's a reception, there's breakout rooms, you, you have to stay. Um, but this is a great panel, so I want um, us to welcome after the videos Samia Hamden, the Midwest Child Nutrition Director at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Claire Marcy, the Interim Executive Director for the Healthy Schools Campaign, Caitlin Ahrens, the Food Education Fellowship Director at Pilot Light, and John Greendeer, the President of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and we have our moderator, Megan Marshall, the, pu the publisher and editor-in-chief editor of Edible Chicago. Enjoy the videos. Hello, my name is Congresswoman Robin Kelly. And I have been proud to serve the second congressional district of Illinois for over 10 years. I am delighted to be a part of this summit to empower our communities with access, affordability, and healthy choices. I am grateful to the Biden-Harris administration, Food Tank, Farmer's Fridge, and the UN Global Compact, USA, for hosting this important conversation. Access to nutritious food not only impacts our individual health, but also the well-being of our entire community. 
In my district, like many others across the nation, we are working diligently to ensure that every person can eat nutritious and affordable food in school and at home. As CBC Health Brain Trust Chair, I am specifically working to reduce racial disparities in nutrition access. I want to ensure that everyone can eat good, healthy meals, no matter who they are or where they come from. Thank you once again for your dedication to this critical cause. I look forward to speaking Hi everyone, I'm Milwaukee again. Mayor Cavalier Johnson. Uh, I'd like to take the time to thank the hosts of this event, uh, Food Tank, uh, the Biden-Harris administration, Farmers Fridge, and the UN Global Compact USA for allowing me to speak uh, here today. Uh, I certainly wish that I could join you there today, but uh, I'm glad that I was able to join you so we could talk about some of the food access initiatives uh, that are taking place right here in Milwaukee. Investment in uh, healthy food access initiatives, uh, direct services in these initiatives, and education on healthy foods are essential uh, for all individuals and families in Milwaukee and beyond. Uh, summer meals for kids are a key part of my vision that not only to eradicate hunger uh, in Milwaukee, but also to make sure that our city is safe and healthy uh, and has high opportunity uh, for all of our residents to live, to work, and to play. Uh, in partnership with the Hunger Task Force, our summer meals program allows families to save money on food, ensure children have access to healthy meals, and encourages participation in recreational as well as uh, educational activities uh, on the ground in our city. Beyond addressing this issue uh, in the summer months, the City of Milwaukee's Fresh Food Access Fund uh, provides grants to support healthy food initiatives in underserved neighborhoods throughout Milwaukee. In 2023, the Fresh Food Access Fund leveraged $100,000 of investment of city funds to support seven different applicant agencies with award amounts ranging from $1,500 to $25,000. Among the awardees were the Dominican Center for Women, which is proposing an ambitious project to create a, a, a micro farm program uh, that will produce uh, fresh vegetables and uh, for the community to help instill uh, entrepreneurship skills for youth in Milwaukee's Amani neighborhood. Honeybee Sage uh, and Wellness, which is a minority owned business in Milwaukee, was also awarded funds to help assist with the installation of an indoor hydroponic garden for growing herbs uh, and other fresh ingredients too. Uh, the Fondi Food Center, was awarded funds to purchase refrigerated storage containers, which uh, are expected to dramatically reduce food waste by lengthening the shelf life of produce that the local growers aren't able to immediately sell at the nearby farmers markets. So many of the initiatives uh, in the city take a comprehensive approach to combating hunger with the goal that uh, uh, promotes a healthy and nutritious food availability uh, and access for everybody across Milwaukee. Empowering families of Milwaukee uses an evidence-based models that uh, partners with the community to provide frequent as well as long-term home visits to pregnant women and their children. The DAD project, the uh, uh, Birth Outcomes Made Better or BOM doula program, uh, those were created to support healthy pregnancies and nurture healthy babies in the city of Milwaukee. All provide comprehensive health education, individual case planning, and referrals to WIC as well as CHAP. Uh, beyond this, the uh, Milwaukee Health Department coordinates entry into services to automatically ensure that families have everything that they're eligible for under our community health hub. All these initiatives are part of the reason why I joined the Mayor's Alliance in Hunger. Uh, there's so much good happening in Milwaukee to address healthy food access as well as food insecurity. And I can't wait to expand upon these initiatives so that every resident in our city uh, has an opportunity to be healthy through access as well as education. So thank you, uh, in short, for allowing me to be with you all uh, today virtually. I want you all to have a great event. Thanks a lot. Okay, it's our time. Um, what a privilege to be here amidst all the great conversations today. Uh, to kick things off, I'd love to just have each of you introduce yourselves and share a brief note about um, what it is that you do here. Should I start? Okay. Please. Uh, uh, Caitlin Aaron, she, her pronouns. Um, I am the Food Education Fellowship Director at Pilot Light. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone for having me. Um, my role at Pilot Light is focused on working with teachers. We're an organization that invests and partners with teachers to use food as a teaching tool in classrooms. We were started in Chicago. Uh, we are now nationwide, which is really exciting through a lot of support from the USDA. So shout out to fellow panelists here. 
Um, and uh, yeah, just grateful to be here. I'll pass it along. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Marcy. I'm Interim Executive Director at Healthy Schools Campaign. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization. We're based in Chicago, but we work at the national and state levels, and we're dedicated to making schools healthier places. So from the food that kids eat at school, to their opportunities to be physically active and play, to their connection to nature, to crucial health services, um, and we do that through an advocacy model that also includes parent organizing and incorporating student voices into the school meal program. Hello everyone, my name is Samia Hamden. I am from the USDA Food and Nutrition Service Agency. We administer now 16 food assistance programs and uh, my role is a child nutrition programs director so I oversee and work with um, all the child nutrition programs including the National School Lunch Program. And we're actually based here in Chicago. We work with seven state agencies um, and 23 tribal organizations to support the administration implementation um, of our programs. And we serve as kind of in a training, technical assistance and oversight role, but we're also in ears on the ground. So we bring back cha um, challenges, best practices and issues for our policymakers in DC. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Greendeer. I am the president of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I work a lot with uh, the uh, Feeding Wisconsin and the Hunger Relief Federation. We oversee um, a lot of school districts as well uh, with a lot of our, our tribal members there. Uh, we also uh, work with uh, a lot of our local businesses and counties. We have roughly 8,000 tribal members, about uh, Roughly about 6,500 uh, within, uh, I'm sorry, about 6,000 within the state of Wisconsin, uh, many of those outside of the state as well. Thank you so much. Uh, so many of our conversations today have centered around the future of food and of our food systems. At the core of that, I think we could all agree, are our children. Uh, but right now, research suggests one in nine are um, experiencing hunger at, you know, that's showing some marginal improvement even over the last years coming out of the pandemic. So I'd like to start with just a little bit of a level set from each of your perspectives of what are the challenges that each of your organizations are facing right now um, as it relates to feeding our kids and particularly in schools. Claire, I'll start with you. I mean, I think this, the challenge is huge and it's been around for a while and it's getting more serious and more attention, especially during the pandemic, we started to f focus in on this issue with a different lens. Um, you know, we work in Chicago and Chicago serves 46 million school meals a year. There's a huge opportunity to provide healthy meals to students, especially students from under-resourced communities and families with low incomes. Um, and there's a huge opportunity to move the needle on healthier food and to teach lifelong lessons about eating healthy. I feel like our schools are prepped to teach all these life lessons to kids and the school meal program needs to be like in sync with that and fully incorporated in that. I think that there are challenges built into the system that force school districts to really focus on participation rates and maybe make choices that are not the best choice for the long term as a result of that. I, Chicago Public Schools has done a great job of moving to more scratch cooking, to um, free universal school meals, to breakfast after the bell, has done a lot of work in that area and I'm really proud to be partnering with the district. Um, but there are challenges inherent to the system that make it challenging and make short term solutions um, more palatable because of the financial concerns around school food. So I think that that's a, that's a paradox that we have to wrap our heads around if we want, really wanna make a big difference. Of course. How about you, Samia? So I think one of the major challenges that really came to light um, for, uh, for school food, schools, um, we work obviously very closely with schools, are the supply chain um, challenges, especially during the pandemic and learning about how many um, contracts were, were canceled, especially for small food service directors who are not necessarily a large customer. The cost of supplies, the cost of labor, um, the turnover in labor, so a lot of challenges for um, the school food service community. Um, I would say there's lots of opportunity here. I think we've a lot of lessons learned. One of the, the uh, best practices that we heard about on the ground are um, just very small school districts getting together and becoming a large uh, cooperative 
buying group so that they can become more attractive to large manufacturers and, and be able to, um, to have that buying power and, and source the, the goods that they need. Also, resorting to local um, food systems was huge. Um, that was a, a, a game changer for many of our schools that could not source from you know, larger vendors or larger suppliers. At the USDA, uh, we were able to release $2.5 billion in three rounds um, in supply chain assistance funds um, through existing authority that we have. And those funds were um, able to be used to uh, support the, the sourcing of domestic products. So a lot of school districts were able to purchase milk, which is very expensive. And that helped shift some of the other existing funds they have in their accounts um, to cover the cost of you know, supplies and labor and things like that. So that was a huge um, issue and it remains that, that way. And actually we will be issuing another round of um, funding, I believe 1.5 billion. Um, and then also access, I would just be remiss if I didn't say we're in the midst of summer. During the school year, we have 32 million children every day that participate in the National School Lunch Program, and that number drops significantly over the summer months. I think we have about one in six children that are eligible to participate in, this, in the summer programs that actually do. Um, so I'm also excited to, to share uh, that through the, the omnibus bill that was passed in December, we, uh, Congress gave us the authority to um, allow for non-congregate feeding in rural sites, meaning that in the sites, in the rural communities where there are no summer food service programs, there can be sites set up simply to be able to, to feed kids so that their families can pick up those meals and take them home. So that's, a, that's huge. That should be able to increase the number of children who have access to summer meals by 8 million. And then I also wanted to share, we're really, really excited to be able to launch our summer EBT program next summer. Um, so we're working with our states very closely to try to get this implemented and off the ground, which would um, basically provide children who are eligible for uh, free and reduced price meals to receive $40 a month for the three summer months to add on to the summer meals that they would also be able to have access to. So that really just helps ensure that nutritious meals are provided to children. But access is also an issue. That's right, thank you. Um, John, curious to hear from your perspective when we think about school procurement and providing equitable access to healthy food for kids. Um, what are you seeing? What are the opportunities that you've been trying to take advantage of here? Well, absolutely, and thank you. Uh, mine might be a little bit different than my co-panelists here. <laughs> my experience is uh, I was one of the free lunch recipients uh, in the school line. So uh, for those of you in that generation, you may have had a different color ticket. Um, not the reduced, those were the richer people that had the reduced lunch. Uh, the, the access started a long time ago, and today it is a little bit different among uh, indigenous communities. For us, food is, looks a little bit different than it did um, in pre-colonial times. So for us, um, you know, when we talk about our children, I don't think anyone from my community is going to, any children from my community is going to be really excited that we passed a farm bill or that we received an allocation or someone got authority to do anything. I think what our kids are excited is about a story of our past and how we used to access what we believe is food. Uh, food, telling them how we uh, harvested deer or how we changed corn in, into uh, hominy and how we uh, harvested some of the wood to make some of the medicines that we, that we use in our community. Those things through colonization are behind us. And one of the ways that one of the advantages that we have right now is are still uh, a number, a handful of people that have the wisdom to bring us back to our old cultural diets, to actually go back in time to go forward in our health and nutrition. It is no surprise that when we take a look at these foods in our economically deprived communities that we're talking about tribal communities, which is a little bit more than just not reaching the economic filters of, of income it's also education, it's also health. If you take a look at our history and just some of the things that you've learned about colonization, uh, it is no wonder why our children have the highest obesity rates, the most likely um, chances that they're going to uh, be diagnosed with diabetes even in their teens. Uh, the highest mortality rates, the, um, the, the lowest economic, or I'm sorry, uh, academic achievement rates. So these things are all affected by uh, our access to the, the basics of life, uh, food, water, and shelter. These are some of the very simple things that we learned at a very 
early age in school. And now our most sophisticated species on the planet is still, regardless of all of the wonderful things that is happening in DC and some of the local uh, multinational uh, food redistribution efforts, we are still struggling uh, economically and statistically with a lot of these areas. So one of the things that the Ho-Chunk Nation has done is prioritize uh, reteaching or finding um, access to the knowledge and wisdom, which I believe is the fourth element of survival, to learn how to harvest fish, to grow corn, to um, understand the, the three sisters and the seventh generation teachings. So this is a little bit unique from all the uh, wonderful advancements of, of food redistribution. We are very much a part of it. As a matter of fact, the Ho-Chunk Nation is probably one of the largest redistributors of food. We are now reaching about 3.5 million pounds of food that we have redistributed to not only tribal communities, but also communities that have been looking for food during the pandemic. One of the nicest things that have, has derived from the pandemic, and we all have to agree that there are some initiatives that derive from um, this essential social tragedy that we had, is, is the idea that we can come together to help out. Now this redistribution meant common folks like myself went out and got their CDLs. Um, that volunteers um, had showed up in, in 12 different locations. So we were removing two and a half semis of food every week. And our employees who were allowed to um, participate, our community volunteers who were happy to help, we were out there sometimes donning full uh, PPE in order to serve our, our people. We're able to um, not only feed our families, but also provide education through uh, at least five of our dietitians that are on staff to teach us how to make food so it's healthy and so it's sustainable. So we cannot teach our children to eat healthy if they don't have food to begin with. And so one of the wonderful things that we've been able to do is learn a little bit about indigenous foods, uh, working with our indigenous chefs who are now taking over America with the, some of their culinary um, uh, expertise and, and teaching us that we can still um, tap into some of these old pre-colonial uh, food so systems and still have a, a, a wonderful dining experience um, at, at the table and now we see them um, like wildfire across the world. So uh, things have been happening really well and I, I know that the index of our indigenous youth are starting to improve with a lot of the organizations like the Nota Begay Foundation uh, down in the southwest who has been um, very active in making sure that we have programming for our indigenous youth. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I know that nods beautifully to something said earlier today about how to really pro show progress. We actually really need to look backwards and kind of return to our roots. And I think um, so much of seven generations and three sisters principles will teach so much um, across, across our nation's food programs. Um, and the narrative for childhood education and how they eat and what they learn to eat, I think nods so beautifully to the work that Pilot Light does. Um, so I'd love to hear um, from your perspective, you know, what, what impact can these collaborative programs between teachers, farmers, and nonprofits have to engage students in their own education about what nutritious food is? Yeah, of course. Well, first of all, thank you to my like, panelists, I think. Um, you did a beautiful job of like leading into this question, John, and thank you to Chef Jessica um, walks first, who I hope is still in the audience, um, a close friend of ours too. Um, we could not do this work uh, without all of you. It's collective work to understand the stories and the histories and the opinions of the people who are the original stewards of this land. I just want to take a moment to name that really honestly. Um, and also that um, so much of the work that we do is stewarded by teachers. There's actually a new bill that's hopefully coming to Pritzker's desk that's going to speak to this and is going to invest in the importance of indigenous foodways in Illinois. So um, something that we do at Pilot Light is, again, invest in teachers. Uh, teachers know their students best. Uh, in fact, we have a teacher from our uh, original classroom with us today. Um, so give her a round of applause. <laughs> uh, I think it's really, really important to believe in that work. It's really hard work. Um, it's similar to the work of food professionals. Um, I myself have a background more in that space, but I think uh, the, the dedication to service and the dedication to doing that sometimes, you know, when you're not paid necessarily what you want to be or when you're not protected in the way that you want to be is really important. Um, and something that Pilot Light does is we work in partnership. We bridge silos across departments within schools, which can often seem like a small impact, but is often a really large impact at a uh, school level to build capacity within teachers, to develop partnerships within their schools, and also outside of their schools with community organizations, farmers, 
uh, local advocates, policy people, hopefully. Um, and we've done this, you know, as I mentioned before, with a lot of the support from USDA Farm to School programs over the years. Uh, teachers in our fellowship program, which is what I run, all conduct a student-led advocacy project that they work on in the beginning of the year uh, with our team to identify what is a food issue that the students care about within their communities and how to, can we build capacity and build partnerships with them as an organization or just as a layer of inquiry and curiosity, which is often a point of uh, connection for teachers in the beginning of the year to develop um, you know, the capacity within the students then to be advocates in their own worlds and communities. So um, it's really about uh, meeting the teachers where they're at and what their needs are. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, Claire, I would love to hear um, your builds on that and thinking about really when we look at all the stakeholders that have a seat at the table in feeding kids um, healthy and nutritious food, what role, even many of the people in this audience, what can we do to be advocates and what, um, what does your organization encourage from that perspective? I mean, I think that there are so many different relationships and partnerships that have to come into play. I mean, one of the things that we do is organize parents um, and find out what kind of issues that they're concerned about and then help them build power in the schools and in the school district. And when we survey parents, school food is one of the number one issues. And so we've brought parents in to understand how the food system works, to share their thoughts and opinions about how the school food program is being implemented at their local schools, but also what kind of menus they they like to see and, and what kind of culturally responsive menu planning they would hope to have. We also work with partners like Open Lands um, to bring green schoolyards to Chicago schools, and all of those green schoolyards have edible gardens. And so, having kids experience the growing food and getting nutrition education is a big way of sort of opening minds and getting kids to try new foods. So there's the big, high, the high level stuff that we do around policy change and advocacy, and then there's the literally like getting your hands dirty work that we do to create those connections and to create those community connections. And also to build um, oversight. You know, every, insti every public institution is better if there's daylight and transparency, and so we work to make sure that policies are published and that parents and community members and caregivers are, feel like they can be account there's an accountability system there and that they can have their voices heard. So I think there are a lot of different ways for people to get involved. Um, talk to a local school, um, get involved with a community-based organization, but let, the, let, the, let those organizations tell you what they need and show you the way, because a lot of people have opinions about things like school food, and that's great, but there are a lot of local people who've done a lot of important work that deserve to be heard and have a lot of expertise. And to that end, I would love to, we're, we're moving so quickly today, I'd love with our last remaining time to just have each of you share, um, use this platform for your organization and share a little bit of that knowledge or what your most important next steps are for this group and for those watching. Um, yeah, what a hard question to lead into, but I will say, um, I think something that's really important, we've been talking a lot about food access, and food access by definition needs to include food education. Food access cannot exclusively just be putting something somewhere and not necessarily supporting the community's existing knowledge to understand uh, what to do with that item or what to do with those processes, those materials, those ingredients, um, again, equipment, uh, and that's a lot of what BioLite does. Um, we have a number of different programs. Seriously, come hang out. A lot of my team is here and like meet us, get to know what might be a good fit for you and your community. Um, we work with the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program to specifically pair teachers with a a resource, a resource of lessons that will connect fresh fruit and vegetables that are delivered already to classrooms in order for teachers to kind of expose students and draw curiosity between teachers and peers within a school building. We also do work in the ag and an advocacy space. I don't know if David is still here, but i um, grateful for all the farmers that did a lot of the work with that on us. And um, again, uh, the fellowship, just uh, encourage your teachers to uh, learn and explore our standards in our work. I would just say, get involved with the local organization, support organizations that are doing this important work, um, and get to understand your food systems. And it's complex, and it's multi-layered, and understand how hard people in these districts are working to try to create change. Um, so, you know, say hi to your to people in your school, <laughs> and, and roll your sleeves up and help out. Thank you. So we have quite a few priorities at USDA. We talked a little bit about the mm -hmm. summer programs. Um, 
we're also talking about access to nutritious foods. So one of the things that we are working on, um, we will be publishing a, a new regulation next year to improve the nutrition standards in school meals and really building on a lot of the progress that schools have made since the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was implemented um, in 2010. So we'll be looking at added sugars, whole grains, sodium, and really um, setting those standards in a way that's nutritious, but also practical for schools to implement and manufacturers to, to work with. So that's going to be a, a big, big lift for us. Um, and then, of course, promoting our farm to school grants. Um, we've, we do a round of grants every year, just again, to help build that local supply chain resiliency. And lastly, I'll just share, there's, um, I might have heard, there's a large momentum um, around the country right now around promoting free meals for all children. Um, again, we learned some, <laughs> some, I'm hearing some applause. <laughs> we learned some great things during the pandemic and we were able through congressional authority to make free meals available during the pandemic um, to be able to provide those safe and nutritious meals. But that authority has since ended. So state agency or state governments have taken it upon themselves to pass legislation. And here in the Midwest region, I am really excited to share that um, uh, Minnesota has passed a permanent program that has, is being implemented right now. Michigan has passed a program that's being implemented right now. Ohio has provided funding to eliminate the reduced price meals. Illinois has also passed legislation. Um, I don't believe funding has been authorized this year for it. So at USDA, we are strong supporters of that and we will continue to, to support that, to work with our states to provide technical assistance. Um, there's a program called the Community Eligibility Provision which helps support free meals where there's a certain number of children that qualify for um, free uh, federal assistance programs. We also published uh, a rule and we're gonna be finalizing that rule that will lower the threshold for schools to be able to participate to 25% um, ISP. So we're really excited, we're gonna be very busy, but those are just some of the priorities we're working on at USDA. Thank you. Well, finally, um, <clears throat> I, I wanted, um, prematurely announce a new market out there, and these are our indigenous growers that have uh, risen up from the pandemic, and uh, you know, as we went out and made the initiative to make sure food was available for all the communities, regardless of color or income, to uh, subside the, the effects of the pandemic, we also noticed that the food itself started to change, and pretty soon the priorities were not just to get food out to communities, but to start to be specific about locally grown foods, uh, e even within the state, uh, locally, uh, local businesses that have, have been emerging as a result of that. And then, as well, they were looking for a lot of tribal growers, to which there were not as many, or that grew at the capacity to serve a larger market. So now uh, it looks like many of these growers had uh, become incorporated, have instituted their own agricultural resource management plans, and are starting to build a, a, a legion uh, and a and confederacy of uh, indigenous growers. Uh, that market is not only just a market I would recommend uh, as a local market resource, but also per perhaps as a partner because the tribes that are located and situated around nearly 600 of them receive federal recognition and have uh, direct and unique exclusive access to federal governments, federal grants and uh, abilities to actually grow that. So if you find yourself in the ability to uh, attach yourself as a partner with some of these indigenous growers or, or producers, I believe that's a market that uh, is, is yet to be tapped, but I believe the first people to do that are going to find themselves quite successful in the food mm -hmm. distribution and redistribution business. Amazing, well, we are at time, so let's get a big round of applause for this tremendous panel. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Keep the round of applause going. It was a great way to end this, this, the discussions for today. I wanna thank these panelists, of course, but all of our panelists and moderators for today who've done a really, really extraordinary job. Another round of applause. Keep the energy going, we're not done yet. Um, this has been an incredible day. Uh, I'm going to be delighted to welcome back to the stage uh, Kat Okar, the Special Assistant to the President for Community Public Health and Disparities at the White House. Please stay with us after this conversation. We will split up into our breakout sessions where you have the chance to reflect on the day's discussions and help put together a report that will be submitted to the White House. Um, we'll come back for a reception featuring a delic delicious menu created Curated, sorry, Ooh, it's been a day. Curated by Jewel Events, beer from Goose Island, spirits from Whistlepig, and wine from Bonterra Organic Estates. 
and music from a live DJ, DJ Rex, and he's disappeared, so I can't point him out. Um, so you won't want to miss it. It will be a lot of fun. But now um, I get to welcome my friend Kat back to the stage. Round of applause. <laughs> this woman has been in meetings all day with many of you, so <laughs> I'm sure she can you guys hear me? Oh, there there you go. Go. I'm sure you're hoarse from talking to everyone. Oh all my day. gosh, it's like the best way to spend a day. It's great, like, right? Every, people are amazing in this room. Like, it's so inspiring. I feel the same way. I feel very inspired. So, I think for folks, especially watching online, but also folks in this room, how do people get involved with the national strategy in a way that is meaningful and will be helpful for years to come past, you know, past this administration and the administration after it? Sure. So as I, I'm sure people are sick of hearing me talk about it, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we put out this White House challenge in March, uh, and we are actively uh, looking for folks to make commitments. And so um, what we finally call it is the White House challenge to end hunger and build healthy communities. And this is the way that folks can, we've put out our national strategy, we're implementing it, we're working on the policies across the 20 federal agencies. And so the challenge is basically our ask to all of you to think about what you all can do, what more you can do to, to make a difference and to change communities. And so um, we're looking for commitments uh, by around August 18th, um, but uh, that means we're, we're looking to work with you, to jump on the phone with you, to think about what that could look like. And it can be um, a lot of things to a lot of people. It's, there's not one size fits all, uh, but I would, the, the most basic thing you can do is go to whitehouse.gov slash hunger health conference Again, whitehouse.gov slash hunger health conference. And scroll down, you'll see White House, the White House challenge to build healthy communities, um, or to end hunger and build healthy communities. And you'll see an interest form there. And that's really what um, I would encourage you all to, to fill out if you're interested in making a commitment. And it's super non-committal. It does not commit you to anything. It just triggers a conversation with us and the CDC Foundation, which is really our partner in all of right. this work. Um, and they are amazing. And so if you see an email from them instead of us, it doesn't mean it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, we're on the phone with them and anytime they, they set up a call. And so I'd really encourage you to think about you know, how you can expand some of the programs you're doing, how you can have some of those unique partnerships. I was just hearing um, uh, two, two folks talk about culinary medicine and thinking about how we expand that, which is a super exciting um, work stream. And there's another company, um, the, the Botanic Garden, uh, was telling me about all the cool work that they're doing to, to be in the community and to have some of those unique partnerships. And so thinking about kind of how you can leverage your expertise um, and, and what, your, you know, what you bring to bear with some of those other partners is, is really um, one of the things that we're looking for. And it's so exciting because that's what we've heard all day, the power of partnering and collaborating. And Chicago is such a unique and special place for that on food and agriculture and all of the things you mentioned. So yeah. thank you. I'm wondering what you are most looking forward to as this process, which is very real, as you've outlined, yeah. continues and, and the strategy becomes even more sort of fulfilled and alive in communities all over the country? I think I'm most excited about seeing transformation. So seeing places where some of the panelists are even are making it already happen, seeing retailers that have more healthy options than less healthy options, seeing hospitals that bake in culinary medicine into the training of their residents or medical schools and nursing schools training their students in, in just nutrition counseling and education, seeing food companies really lean into creating healthier products, seeing investors really think about, um, and companies really think about their ESG standards and building nutrition into them so that we're thinking about this from a holistic societal approach and really thinking about what the world can look like um, if we all kind of come together and, and really capitalize on some of the successes that we've already seen in this room. I mean, we know it can happen. It's not, it's almost, um, we don't have to imagine it anymore. So many of you are doing this and I think we just have to, um, work to make it a reality for everyone. Yeah, the solutions are out there. We just yeah. have, to, they need capital, they need investment, they need support and attention. I want to thank Kat 
for all of your incredible work. I want to thank Kellyanne Blazik, Will McEntee, your colleagues and, and partners yes. in crime and health. Partners in health. <laughs> partners in health. And Emma no pa criminal activity happening. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Potter as well. And all of your other colleagues who have worked so hard to improve f food access and affordability and empower eaters. And you know, what they're ultimately trying to do is end hunger in America, and it inspires me. So thank you, Kat. Thank you so much. We've had such a wonderful day. I want to thank everyone again for joining us in person and online. I want to give another huge thank you to Farmers Fridge and our partners at the UN Global Compact Local Network Initiative on Sustainable Food and Agriculture Systems. A big thanks to Mode for our yeah. producing today's program. They are amazing. Round of applause for Mode Ooh. real quick. A big thank you to my co-founder, Bernard Pollack. This was his vision to have uh, the, the, these summits that have focused on the White House's national strategy. So he deserves a huge round of applause for making this happen. Yeah. And, and all of my Food Tank colleagues who are extraordinary young people who I learn from every day. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to stay in the room, please, uh, just for a couple of more minutes so we can instruct you on where you need to go for your breakout uh, session. And again, this is a chance to respond to what you've heard from the White House, what you've heard from the panelists, and, and give that feedback so that we can share it with the White House so it, it can influence the, the next phases of the national strategy. Okay. So on your name tag, you'll find a pink, orange, or green sticker. If you have a pink sticker, you can stay right here. Uh, for uh, the session on community.